Uh, your name is uh, Catherine Pollard Griggs. Yes. You are the wife of Colonel George Griggs. Yes. 11 years of marriage. Yes. It's true that your husband is uh, and has been the head of special operations under Admiral Kelso, NATO. Yes. And it's true that you were the uh, head of the hospitality committee. Yes. You were the ex a member of the executive board of NATO's Wives Club. Absolutely. And uh, also that your husband's background includes uh, NATO Defense College in Rome. Yes. Princeton class of uh, 1959. Yes. His intelligence career, his spy career began in Vietnam. Yes. And uh, it's also true that it continues under this day. Absolutely under uh, General Wilhelm. And that your uh, husband was the liaison between the White House and President Jamal of Beirut, Lebanon at the time of the bombing of the Marine barracks in uh, Lebanon? Yes. And in fact, your husband was an alcoholic. Absolutely. And probably Credible. is to this day. Absolutely. And uh, during these drunken stupors, uh, he would, so to speak, blab on and tell you everything he knew about the everything. intelligence community. Everything. Nothing was hid. No. It was like he wanted to relieve himself and bur unburden his heart. Yes. And so he told you everything that you now know about yes. the intelligence community. Yes and that you are talking about. And in fact, he told you that they knew the bombing was coming down in yes. Beirut before it occurred. Absolutely. And right. also, he, uh, by your association with him, you have come to understand and know, uh, this, as shocking as this may sound yeah. to the people who are viewing this, that the United States military is literally run by sexual deviants heavy on the homosexual side. Tr truly. Um, and that the United, in the United States military People like Jeffrey Dahmer and Kaczynski and McVeigh yes. and Oswald and a host of other people who have a sexual deviant background, uh, primarily homosexual, these individuals are actually sought out by people within the military. The Army. For, uh, the Army for advancement yes. into intelligence type yes. work yes. because they are so easy to control. Yes. And uh, they actually become mind slaves and that the U.S. Yes. military, yes. literally, as, yes. as outrageous as it sounds, is a mind control operation? Yes, totally now, totally now. They've, okay. they've gotten rid of the good folks, like MacArthur, got rid of them one by one. Good. Totally take over. All right. Um, let's talk about the individual who uh, told you that we've never uh, actually been an enemy of the Soviet Union, that somehow that's yeah. all just been a scam. Who was well, that individual? Well, my husband. Um, when we, w the first three years we were married, um, he was drinking three or four straight gins, vodkas a night, a bottle of wine, and a beer machine beside his desk. Um, I only knew him two months before he asked me to marry him. He'd been married before, and his first wife was a, a total alcoholic. Now, someone would ask, why would you marry a man as after knowing him <laughs> only two months? I, I'm a, a strong Protestant Christian, and I, we, I have a lot of... Um, predestination, I was Scottish grandmother, and uh, I was working as assistant director of the Chamber of Commerce. I had a brand new, relatively new Saab, my first car. It was an 83 Saab. I bought it secondhand from somebody who's 84. And my husband was driving an 83 Saab. Mine was a turbo, his was not. He um, rented part of my house. It was, um, I had a young doctor and his wife and two children who were renting the house. They were leaving before the end of the lease time, and they put the ad in the paper and told me about all these people, and I said, no, 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 no. Um, and I was, um, had been engaged to someone else. You know, I, I was just renting my house out. And they said that there was this man who had a dog and a mother-in-law and a son and was a widower and uh, a marine colonel. Well, I and it had a dog, and I said, no, absolutely not. So the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, he was someone I was not really, I didn't cotton to. He, he sort of acted like a robot. He was very clipped, and I didn't want to like him. But when I heard he was a, a Princeton graduate, I always thought that was kind of great. Uh, when I heard he spoke fluent French, and I speak fluent French, when I found out that he drove a Saab, I drove a Saab, and when I found out that he went to the same school, high school, that my uncle had gone to, 
was in the same eating club at Princeton that my Uncle Ben had gone to. He was on scholarship and uh, went to Princeton. Everything the same as my uncle, who was also in intelligence. But I didn't think about that then. I was just thinking, you know, this is God. This is uh, too much, too, too many similar things. And so it overwhelmed me. And he's very, very good looking. At that time, he was very good looking. Now he's aged and he's, he really is haggard. Had a rough life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it, I was overwhelmed by him. Plus, my job at the chamber was very demanding. I was doing a great job. But um, he, he said that he, he wanted me to retire because he wanted to make general. And the man who could make him general was General Louis Buell, because it was just a matter of having somebody who would make you general, to be general. It wasn't what you did. Mm -hmm. Louis Jewell, you needed I mean, somebody Louis, above uh, to, just to pull you on up. Yeah, Louis just happened to die, and we went to his funeral, and George didn't make it, because Louis, Louis died. Mm. But his first wife had been, I, I'm sure, battered to death. Uh, I was battered, and, um, you know, but I thought it was just Vietnam and all this kind of thing. And I was trying to get him to stop drinking because I, I couldn't imagine how the Marine Corps would allow someone to be a total alcoholic who couldn't even carry on a normal conversation dry. I mean, he, he can't even carry on a normal conversation with anyone unless he's drinking. Hmm. He never smiled unless he had a, a, a glass in his hand. He drank solidly. I have a letter in his own hand that tells, and this is the truth, he drank solidly this amount that I just said for 30 years. His booze bill, and they never entertained, he and his first wife, was $250 a month. And this is from the naval store. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. He was totally snockered, just his whole brain, and yet he's working. He is head of running the, half the world's Marine Corps under General Al Gray. A, a man who is <sighs> mentally incapacitated. Totally. Unless he's inebriated, and then when he's, when he's drunk, I mean, he's in a different altered state of mind. He can't s discern anything. He, he can, can follow orders. Oh, and that's all he does. And he told me when, I mean, one of our many conversations, uh, try, he was trying to, he thought I was, you know, because my family were all naval officers and I was out in the world with the chamber, you know, that I just sort of went along with this kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was just incredible to me that... How many, how many wives of high up military people are there, like yourself, that are speaking out? Uh, none. <laughs> I mean, they're all 30-year Marine wives. They're, they're Stepford wives. They are petrified. I have had conversations before I went public, before I went to live with Sarah McClendon, who saved my life. And Sarah I McClendon is the... The senior White House correspondent. Is she that little old lady we see on TV asking yes. the president those pointed, jabbing questions yes, all the time? the little red-headed, feisty yeah. Texan who broke the Billy Saul Estes thing. She's, she doesn't go along with the clone group of, of, of reporters mm -hmm. who are all, most of them, intelligence officers. I think she was in intelligence because she was in the Army during World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's a, just a remarkable mind. And I lived with her for, for five, six months. Uh, and what's interesting is she called my home after I had called her or seen her on C-SPAN, she couldn't get through to my house. I was living there by myself. Every time she called my home, this is 1996 from uh, March until she finally got hold of me, she had to go to another phone in Maryland to get me on the phone. Every time she called me from her house, she was told, this is a military base and the Griggses don't live here anymore. Now, I have, that was my phone number long before I met George Griggs. Mm -hmm. It's my granddaddy's farm, the, the house that I well, own. So your phone was being diverted. Absolutely diverted. It's electronic warfare. Mm -hmm. It's part of their deception. Uh, they have many levels, but it's all under a big operation. 
They uh, have an operation <clears throat> now to totally ruin me. His first wife was murdered. Now, you know, s some of the things you talk about here, this big operation, you've come to understand about the, the largeness of it, the intricities of yeah. it, through a diary that you have. Is yeah. that right? Uh, yeah. could, you, could you hold that diary up so we can uh, yeah. get, a, get a look at that? And um, the thing that I found, uh, this is the actual diary. Uh, just hold it up kind of like a uh, chest tie. Okay. There you go. And uh, these are the actual handwritten notes of your husband. Absolutely. And they reveal an awful lot. In fact, the, uh, does the military or those in the intelligence community, do they realize you have a copy of this? They do now. Yeah. You know, I had a phone conversation with General Jim Joy. How long ago was this? It was in February of 96. I tried to ask the colonels. They knew I was, I was on the uh, move trying to find information. Uh -huh. And um, okay, my like husband had mentioned General Jim Joy. Yeah, it's hitting the microphone right there. Just oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just, that's all right. All right. And I called General. I had to call a General Miller in Jacksonville, uh -huh. who was in my husband's address book, uh -huh. and told him I was looking for Christmas card list, and you know, I, I needed General Joy's telephone number because um, one of the colonels whom I trusted, uh, Colonel Ken Millis, lied to me. Uh, Captain uh, Phil Hallwager lied to me. Uh -huh. And um, so I, I got this General Jim Joy who was the one who was in the Operation uh, Just Cause. Was it Just Cause, the one in Panama? Mm -hmm. He was in charge okay. of all the psychological operations, the booming music that they hit Noriega with, the chasing him around, the well, The same stuff clothes. they did at Waco, too. Of course. We'll get to that oh, in a minute. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's General Jim Joy who mm -hmm. was behind Waco. Oh, I see. And General Carl Steiner, the snake, okay. who tried to steal Desert Storm away. Schwarzkopf. Okay, so but you were trying to get uh, uh, some addresses, and they were giving you the complete runaround. Oh, don't even know him. Don't even know him. Don't even know him, and I knew him because my husband told me, you know, that he worked with with General Joy and General Steiner. They were the 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 triumvirate. Uh huh. But they had different names. They were, you know, in plain clothes. They were had different passports. So I got him on the phone. I was given the number by this General Miller, and I said... So in the movies, when they say they shall disavow any knowledge, that's not just, a little, that's not just a little thing for movies. That's the yeah. truth. They disavow yes. knowledge of totally all these people. Totally lie. Yeah. But you nailed him down. Yes. I said, uh, General Joy, I'm Kay Pollard Griggs. Uh, my husband, George Griggs, was um, in the Marine Corps, and he is... Um, He's battered me badly, and we're looking for him because, you know, this has been going on too long and uh, blah, blah, blah. And I was recording this conversation, you see. Mm -hmm. I was sitting on my bed with the diary right out in front of me. And he didn't know that I had the diary. He didn't know anything. It was cold call, like they do cold murders mm -hmm. after they, when they graduate from SEAL school. Cold, cold murders. I was doing a cold telephone call. And he said, no, I don't believe, and these were his exact words, <clears throat> no, I don't believe I know your husband. This is someone my husband, I have a card that General Joy sent my husband after the, the murder, of the death of his first wife, saying, call me anytime, you know, this man, here I was, traumatized, battered, beaten, and he lies to me. Mm -hmm. So I said, I said, well, General Joy, that's funny, because um, I'm looking at my husband's diary when he was in Beirut, and you're meeting with him almost every day. I said, you know, first, before that, I said, you know, he was the chief of staff for General Al Gray, you know, he's one of Gray's boys. You, you know, Chief of Staff of Fleet Marine Force Atlantic, runs half the world, all of the Middle East, NATO Defense College. You don't know my husband. You're a general. You live outside of Quantico. Don't know my husband. I made it very clear. Uh -huh. No. No. Can't say as I do. 
So then I, I told him about the diary. And, and these are all immature adolescent males. These are men who don't know how to deal properly with adult adults. They lie. They, they're deceptive. They, they hide behind trees. But when you nailed him on the diary, when the diary, he realized... He said, <laughs> he said, his exact words were, Oh, that George Griggs. Uh-huh. Oh, that George Griggs. And, and that's just the beginning of the kind of run-around deception that you've found with these people. Absolutely. And no doubt, that's why they, they would like very much to have this diary. Yeah. Uh, this one page I found particularly interesting. What you, uh, and you're probably more familiar with their husband's handwriting. Instead of me reading it, uh, read these notes that he had recorded there. Um, these might help. Okay, or, or. I've, got, I've got these. All righty. Um, a number of the Marines told me uh, a little bit about Dale Dorman. Um, Dale Dorman's not a ha happy camper. Okay. Dale Dorman, um, because <coughs> of some mistakes my husband made, was shot. This was at 7.15 to 7.30. Dorman exited Riviera. That was a, you know, a, a place, sort of a hiding place or whatever. Uh, gray and tan Mercedes. Um, up to five shots were fired. He raised his left arm. One, ran, one round penetrated his arm. One struck his chest. Walked back into Riviera to the desk and called post one. Security vehicle went to pick him up returned to uh, Dora found 15 to 18 meters away and treated. Medvac called 750. Medvac um, wheels down at, at 0810 in a H-Bird helicopter. Riviera Hotel, approximately one, ni one ninth of a mile west of the embassy. Dorman has been there uh, since arrival, except um, you know, briefly during a period of siege. He was not wearing protection. Uh, saw three men in the vehicle. One leaned out back with a shortened rifle or automatic weapon. Sentry at B1 uh, saw and heard nothing. It's just one page of the diary. Sentry saw and heard nothing. Right. In other words, the sentry... Don't talk. Doesn't talk. Right. right. Yeah. And <clears throat> there's just a whole world of these kind of assassinations and murders yes. and directed. In fact, at one point, your, your husband actually just discussed people being eliminated. Yeah, yeah. He, like you're shooting ducks. Yeah. Something. Oh, we had, we had innumerable discussions over dinner. He'd already had his, his four gins. Ah. Now, he'll talk to any woman or anybody who drinks with him. He'll talk. This man, what is he doing in security? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. at, when he was at NATO, I'll get right back to that, but when he was at NATO and he was the head of special operations, in fact, I've got copies of his secret uh, check-in-and-out papers at NATO. He had them at home. I Somehow, you know, I hope, I hope I still have those, but anyway, the point is um, I could get in and out of the NATO headquarters just walking in, and there were all these shady-looking garbage man, and George would leave his office door wide open at lunchtime. He was flirting with a secretary who was a, a chief <coughs> who knew everything. You know, the point is, what lacks security? And I had to say, George, look, um, you have got to do something about the security here at NATO because I can walk in and out. He said, oh, just forget it. Forget it. Don't do anything. And I'm a very demonstrative person when it comes to security and honor and integrity and your word is your bond. My culture, my father, my people believe in, you know, in this nation, in, in, in my state, Virginia, my people, my culture, my God. You know, this is, mm -hmm. this is important. You don't just treat uh, that kind of thing lightly. So I said to him, if you don't do something, I'm going to Landis Kelso. I was in the wives' club. She was the, the head. And Landis Kelso is the, the wife, wife of, of, the of Admiral Frank Kelso, who's a wonderful man, honorable man, wonderful woman. And I had, a, I had great rapport with her. I sort of stopped an international incident with the French and the English and the British who were ganging up against the French. And they were over, you know, something that was really minor, but it was huge. And she helped me 
I, I determined that it was a problem, called her up, and she helped me, and we, we diverted and averted a major thing. So I, he knew what I would do, and I said, look, if you don't write a report and do something about this, then I'm just going to go to Landis and say what's happening. Point is that the man would, when he was in Beirut, he was sleeping with a spy and double agent Mary Clark Yost Lab, whose husband was a double agent, an Arab at the American University of Beirut. He leaves his, his briefcase wide open. He was with her for five weeks in a hotel. This is a married woman with two children and who followed him all around the United States, is still seeing him met him in London, lived in Virginia Beach, was working in international programs at ODU you while say, he was married. Would you say your husband is fairly typical of these powerful oh, men? Oh, absolutely typical. Um, when, when I was single uh, working at the Virginia Center for World Trade, um, four of us old friends that I went to school with, Molly Holt and you know, a few others, we would go all together to a place called Poppy's. Um, at that time, he was Captain Jerry Unruh. Now, he's Admiral Three Stars Jerry Unruh. This man, again, was married. He was running around with, with, the, with the tail hook crowd. I, I did not know he was married. I knew he was a, a Navy captain. I was told by him that he would be uh, taking command of the carrier Saratoga. Mm -hmm. Um, he followed me everywhere, even, even went to, up to uh, Wintergreen. Now, he sent me pictures, private, separate pictures of the Israeli guys waving to him. He was a, uh, a tailhook pilot, you know, these, the airplanes, mm -hmm. the jets. And he was a Mustang, um, but totally immoral totally and knew that he would never get caught. In fact, he was in tailhook. They had a big uh, party down at the beach and um, they were doing, I mean, I didn't go uh, by that time because I, I, I learned that he was married. And um, the, the point is that um, he and this whole group, I've, I've found out about Al Gray, you know, Oh, General Agri. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, what is this, uh, this consistent thread of the sexual degeneracy and the homosexuality and just the raw base nature that seems to be so prevalent? Have you ever determined what it is? I mean, why? Well, it's, it's a way to handle them, <clears throat> to control them. I mean, years ago, you thought of people like General Eisenhower as, as an upright Man, uh, I don't know. I, was, know. I, I don't. I, I know some things about him. How far I, back can we go to, to where you find people that are decent, moral, and upright? Right. Where you had real people who defended the Constitution, who had a feeling. Robert E. Lee was. <laughs> national. There were nationalists and and America first. You got to go back a good ways, probably. Oh, oh, a absolutely. Um, you see, growing up in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, my whole family have been naval officers and also working. In other words, um, they would, would enter the, the service uh, during a time of, of war, of need, and uh, then they go back to, their, to being fathers and being husbands. I had a wonderful father, wonderful grandparents, wonderful family who put their family first. Well, they put their God first, Christ, and then their wives, and their sons, and their, their children. This, this is the way America was, was built. Now, these generals in the Marine Corps and Army, they don't look at it that way, according to my husband. A court, they, are, they are ordered, and my husband being chief of staff, told his men it was like this. It's the Marine Corps first, the Brotherhood, the, the, the Cherry Marine, you know, the bonding, that goes on. Mm -hmm. The Marine Corps comes before God, before Jesus Christ, before the country, and then, and then it's the uh, it's 
whatever the, you know, the, the religion they have. I don't know, because my husband is not a Christian. He's an existentialist. Um, and most of these guys are. Uh, certainly Al Gray is. Um, Krulak. I, I think his wife goes to church. But um, the... But their, 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 their God is this brotherhood. The brotherhood. And it's very German. It's very... Um, Does it have Masonic leanings? Oh, absolutely Masonic leanings. In fact, the, the, the uh, admiral who was the last admiral whose car my husband bought was very impressed with this Norwegian admiral. Mm. They're all Masons now. Mm -hmm. Not all Masons, but this brotherhood, Opus Dei, uh, if they're, um, or the mob. I mean, the, the one thing I've been able to determine about the, the current Marine Corps, the Marine Corps that my husband came in with, Gray, Reap, uh, Sheehan, they're all mob. No, when you say mob, you're talking mafia type New mob? Jersey mafia, right. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a... Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New Jersey. Okay, is the mob and this, this military bunch, they're this one the, the, the same? The Marine Corps guys are the hitmen, and they, they are mercenaries. They'll work for anybody. You think the Marine Corps is under the Navy? No way. They can just as easily be under an Army colonel, and if the Army colonel meets a Marine Corps colonel, the Army colonel is superior. They'll switch hats just like that. My husband said it's just, you know, no big a deal. Uh, I'll go work for the State Department. I don't really. The Marine Corps is just a, it's like a, a smoke and mirrors thing. And they're run out of New Orleans. Fourth Marine, Oswald. I mean, they are not, on his level, he said, we've never been an enemy of the Soviet Union. They work with these communists. The, the man who started the whole, this whole intelligence operation, the OSS, he was recruiting known communists who were involved in the, uh, in the uh, Spanish subverting Spain. You know, what? there's no more. They're not Americans. They're not Christians. They're, they're uh, German existentialists. Now, what are they doing running our nation? I just, uh, it's, it's kind of, they have more affinity for the, the state of Israel right now than they do our nation. They don't care about American citizens. Um, the judges now in the courts are, are military officers following chain of command orders. They're not independent judges. So all this spills over then into the political areas like the uh, judgeships. Sure. Uh, They're all Marines. Senators, officers, congressmen. Sure. Who is John Warner? A Marine. Who is Chuck Robb? A Marine. They control the powerful committees. Dick Davis, Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. A Marine. His wife was, I hate to say it, well, everybody knows, a Norfolk a prostitute. You know, Martha was a wonderful woman, I'm sure, to him, but they were involved in organized crime. Uh, now, I don't know, I know that our present governor in Virginia is an Army officer. He takes orders. Uh, so the question that all of us wives are asking now is, well, who gives the orders? If they're told that we, the wives, are enemies, uh, how are the sons going to grow up? If the mothers who are teaching them truth mm -hmm. are lied to and the husbands are told, ordered by the likes of Al Gray, major homosexual, when he was in, in the... I shouldn't say this, but it's true. Mm -hmm. When he was in, in, the, uh, in Marseille, uh, the boys are called Gray's boys. He never married. Okay, the boys referring to everybody Lavender under boys, him. Everybody under Al Gray. And he had a separate organization while he was commandant that was a contract organization, getting information on, on people having them, if they weren't corrupted, corrupting them, farming people, so that he would have something on them, so that 
they would use that later to control and manipulate them. It's like what happened to Newt Gingrich. All of these guys, like Newt Gingrich, Bill Clinton, who've gone through the sweats, like Cohen, what, what happens is they get a little tiny thing that, to prove their power, how much power they have. They use guys like Michael Isikoff in Newsweek, or their little clones, you know, like Woodward, 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 Woodward and um, Bernstein, who are, mm -hmm. are operatives. Okay, they're former military, too. They're, well, oh my goodness. They were, uh, I believe it was Bob Wood Woodward, uh, it's either Woodward or the other one. Bernstein. See, I knew some British intelligence people, and I was told the whole story about how he was running around with Peter Jay's wife, who was the ambassador to Great Britain. And this man was sleeping with Peter Jay's wife, and there was a movie, uh, I think Jack Nicholson was this guy, and sh this was her story about what she went through while her husband, the, the columnist, was sleeping with the ambassador's wife to get information on what was going on in Great Britain. Now this is, this is the team that, that broke Watergate. So what were the motives? Uh, of course, Watergate was horrible. And Nixon had something like 60 military JAGs alone working for him, doing dirty tricks. One of those JAGs was Ernest Frank Reynolds. Changed his name to Ern Reynolds. He came to me. I was farmed. Tim Hunter, a, an intelligence army operative, came to me with this story about, oh, you know, hard luck, you know, Saudi Arabia, and I was in the army, and I have this friend who can help you out with your legal case. He's a really good guy, you know, Ern Reynolds. And uh, if you meet him, I know he'll do some free legal work for you. So I was staying with Sarah, and I, I didn't have any money, and I, I was, but I took the little, you know, the, the, the train into uh, where he, Fairfax. He met me in his Volvo station wagon with his jacket on. I didn't know what the big four meant on his leather jacket. And uh, he took me to his... Uh, and what did it mean? Fourth Marine. Oh, okay. Yeah operative. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he had the most fantastic uh, apartment. See, I'm a big book person, and I, I love, you know, reading history and everything, and I'm impressed by people who read, who are intelligent, who are wise. You have a master's yourself in? Scottish history, an Scottish. undergraduate in uh, Virginia history. Okay. I, um, I worked on the Dunmore Papers. I, uh, studied with people like um, Ian Cowan and Jeffrey Barrow and Tom Devine. These are scholars in Great Britain who are experts on the Reformation. And, and my interest was Mary Queen of Scots at the uh, Reformation and also Lord Dunmore, who was the last royal governor of Virginia, and I was working on the Dunmore Papers, too. I see. So, so you had an interest in... I mean, this guy's layout impressed you. Yeah. He's yeah. a real intellectual. Yeah, and he was divorced, you know, uh, a sad story and everything. Mm -hmm. Worked for the Justice Department, mm -hmm. was supposedly a whistleblower, mm -hmm. supposedly a Christian. So this guy's really going to help you out? Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy, did I buy into that. <laughs> it's like the old story, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Oh, yeah. So I caught him sneaking around my house at 2 o'clock one morning. <laughs> Two in the morning? Yeah. And, of course, I'm most gullible in school, you know. So I, and I'm trusting, I'm a Christian, and I always look to the good side of somebody. I see the good little part. It took me about three times. The guy had my original documents that had just been in my briefcase under his car seat. He invites me to a cybernetics conference in, in Champaign, Illinois, I leave Martha Roundtree's apartment, and it's arranged so that all of my things are in his safe little car, and we're going to his parents' house in Roanoke. And, of course, you know, you can't take all your things to the cybernetics conference, because mm -hmm. I was going home. Mm -hmm. But this is a smooth psychological operations guy. I mean, he is doing psychological operations on a woman in Champaign, Illinois, who is 
the lover of a, of a German spy uh, who he's been writing letters to her and he's, he's showing me these letters. The guy's perverted. I mean, he's writing Susan Parenti these letters, you know, like invading her mind and, you know, why are you... And Susan's written him two letters or three letters. She's very beautiful and he's got pictures. But he's sharing these letters with a group of men, seven men, one of whom is head of intelligence, is head of computers and the intelligence for the army, Ron Jarmuth. Now, Ron Jarmuth comes right out and says, I'm an anarchist. You know, I mean, his family are at New York, old uh, Zionist Jews. He, he met his wife in, I think, a, in a uh, kibbutz. You know, I mean, he's a nice, personable guy, but when you say to, to somebody like me, I'm an anarchist, just so blithely, and you, you know, and, and he's always over at Ern's house, and Ern's got a picture by his bedstead drawn by a man who's a known homosexual whom he met when he was at the University of Virginia, who was the chaplain at Holland's College, who my best friend was there. And she said, he's a well-known homosexual. And I'm thinking, what is a picture of Ern Reynolds doing being painted when he's young by this known homosexual? And then I find out that the man who enlisted him in the Republican Party, he was doing dirty tricks for seven years for the Republican National Committee. I mean, dirty tricks. As a underneath this man from West Virginia who was a homosexual and left all of his money to earn son and took his son on a trip. Now, uh, and Earn is, is a, a lobbyist for homosexuals. He's just, you know, working in the uh, Episcopal Church. He's, he's got a group of women that he meets with at the seminary. He's, he's I'm sure that my case my profile, he's probably got charge of it now. He's the expert on Catherine Pollard Griggs, but he's not. The guy is absolutely not grown up. But he's a thief. Uh, and so he your, your case, dad. your case just got stonewalled, just got sucked into a memory hole by a guy who was acting under orders to sure. you get you get Kathleen Griggs under your control, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's that. Sabotage her. Sabotage, yeah. Sure. And he stole your documents. Sure, and sure. Sabotage me. Turned on me right in the middle of the commissioner's hearing. Hmm. Laughed at me when I cried. You know, this is a guy who hates women. And uh, the interesting thing is I went to his family home, and he had a wonderful mother. Um, and he told me that his father battered his mother. Hmm. Uh, his father was in the Marine Corps. And there was a picture of Chesty Puller in the basement. Well, that fits the profile, though, though yeah. doesn't it? I mean, if his father battered the mother, mm -hmm. which he grew up in this dysfunctional environment. Totally dysfunctional. So when he hit the military or he was noticed in college or ROTC or whatever, uh, so here's a guy who is susceptible to mind control. Sure, he's, he's to got... To be developed. Yeah. I think he used the term for budding. He, he was recognized as a potential bud. Yes. And he's moving up the ranks. His roommate was from New York, was a Zionist. Uh, and he was an outcast at the University of Virginia. An outcast? Yeah. Why would he be an outcast? He felt he was an outcast. So he had this roommate. And I don't know this man who was uh, the homosexual from West Virginia. Uh -huh. And we had to go by through his town, and, you know, the guy died. But uh, this homosexual was a friend of the homosexual at Hollins, who was a chaplain there at Hollins College, whom I met. We had lunch with him one day. Um, the father had the picture of Chesty Puller and so forth. Well, Ern... Um, I knew he was, was um, trying to sabotage me and so forth because I had already had Alexander Robinson come down from Princeton every other weekend, my husband's teacher, um, who was also a Marine, whose family brought over the Saudi royals, who was 
one of my husband's teachers, and um, I caught him walking around my house at 2 o'clock in the morning. I overheard him talking to my best friend's mother saying, now we just, you know, undercutting me. You know, we just don't know. Kay is just under so much stress, you know. Oh, and he's a very handsome, very dignified guy, you know. Went to Columbia University, was uh, in um, Algeria, that area with the Marine Corps. Then went into the boys' school, the Hun school. Um, he's an intelligence, without a doubt. His uh, brother-in-law was uh, Bill Eddy, Colonel Bill Eddy, who was the, I believe it's the brother-in-law, I've got to get, his name is Eddy and uh, it's Bill Eddy, but he was the translator um, for the Saudi royals during the Roosevelt administration. And the Roosevelt, the, the New York crowd, was trying to steal all of those countries away from Great Britain. The Balfour Declaration had sort of come in, and there was a guy named Moose, not the present Moose, who has the Africa desk at the State Department, who's an African-American, but this was a guy named Moose who uh, helped the State Department steal Saudi Arabia away from Britain. Because Britain was allowing the Saudis to be Saudis, you know, to keep their religion, mm -hmm. to keep their culture. Right. They were not trying to kill people right off the bat, you know. So George is, is part of that OSS crowd. And <clears throat> their stock and trade is just murder, assassination, Absolutely. Uh, creating uh, conflicts, phony yeah. baloney wars, yes. conflicts, yes. for the purpose of uh, making Selling money. Selling weapons, money, drugs, drugs, controlling the drug flow. Now, let's, let's talk about the drug flow in the United States. Yeah. Uh, based on your conversations with your husband. Mm -hmm. uh, I met drug lords through him. Such as? I met the head guy. See, George was telling me everything. First three years of marriage, it was just like, you know, you're with me, gal, because he was so used to talking to Mary Halab and Anne Bouchou. Yeah. You know, the group partnerships with sex and all this stuff. And, and you know, I, I'm a pretty loving woman, and I'm fun. I was then. I was but you're not into swinging. No, I'm not and, into and swinging. And swapping husbands and no, wives. No, and George was into swinging. He and Sue and, and Nancy and Jim Earl, you know, I mean, this was, and I heard about that from colonels mm -hmm. and one Navy captain. But then your husband also would tell you that this is just life the way it is. Oh, yeah. In our crowd. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is all it. these generals, admirals, colonels, oh, yeah. all these people. Yeah. Uh, Men, too. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but he was, he was just um, I'm trying to remember what we were on, something that was, um, that, that I was going to say, and I remember. Um, well, right. you know, I. Anyway, <laughs> I can't uh, remember. Oh, he's talking about the, the fact that uh, they're into making money, and yeah, this, this yeah. is the drug business. Oh, yeah. So you met, all, you met all these drug yes. lords. I met Fahim. Um, As if they were just business partners. Oh, yeah. Well, he told me what they did. Mm -hmm. he, you know, Fahim was a colonel. He's, he's in the diary, too. Um, but they... George said they, what they do is they nurture, they cultivate the, the sons of prominent families in all, the State Department finds them. Mm -hmm. They're called rising stars. Yeah. And they turn, that's the word they use, George mm -hmm. used, they turn them, they, um, they, they bring them in, they, they rope them in. If they're alcoholics, give them more booze than anybody. If they want women, you know, they find the women, they turn them, and, uh, and then let them know, if, you know, if they ever get in any trouble, come on over here. We'll take care of you. Well, Fahim w had come on over here. Things were getting hot in Beirut. He was a Catholic. He was a um, very prominent family, and he was going in hiding up in Maine. I remember I had his number, uh, and I, I talked to his sister. But they, they just called a lot of the stuff out of the house. Um, 
the, the very first time when George kind of disappeared and, you know, uh, and then I found out about what happened with Sue, mm -hmm. his first wife, yes, well. and, and all of that. Well, now, did they, um, <coughs> did you come to learn how drugs actually come into the country? Yeah. Uh, I saw a, a news piece one time where a yeah. pilot who was in prison uh, alleged that they actually landed on military bases with oh. huge planes loaded oh. with dope. Th this is how they, they all brought them in, the Norwegians, the, the Brits. Um, the, the drugs, you see, they would come down through uh, Burma, Turkey. They, they'd come through the Bekaa Valley. The banks were in, in Beirut. Uh, they were in uh, Panama, Mexico. In uh, St. Thomas, after, you know, the laundering of cash. You see, mm -hmm. cash, that's why some of the banks in New York, you can very easily find out who the drug lords are. Barry McCaffrey, I saw him two weeks ago, and he said something very, he let it slip out. He's an Army general, you know. He said, We're, we haven't done any more or any less in the last five years. Now, <laughs> in terms of the war on drugs. Yeah, no, they're just holding it. The word uh -huh. he used, I think, was holding it. It was a word that he, you could tell they'd used in briefings. In, uh, they were, the, war, the, the guys who were doing the drugs are military officers. In fact... Doing the drugs meaning controlling, controlling the, them. the flow. Oh, yeah. In fact, one of George's best friends, Colonel Ray Moore, I suspect that Ray Moore... Ray Moore was from the gang, the ghetto area in California. His wife is a very, was a very good friend of mine, Charlotte. She's dead? No, oh. he is. Oh, he is. But he, when George would sort of disappear. Your husband? Yeah. All of a sudden, they would appear and be in the house. You know, calm me down, take me over, exercise, you know, do all this mystical stuff. And it was really funny because they came back from Mexico and it was, George just happened to disappear and they were right there, you know. Well, Ray Moore, all this stuff, I knew about his background and I started thinking, what's going on in Mexico? Why the heck is Ray going down to Lake Chapala? And he would talk about his day. His day would be going out with the men, playing golf going to this uh, spa with the men, you know. They were doing deals, going to Guadalajara. And there would be Tom Reap, another former chief of staff for Gray, going to Mexico. There would be uh, Ken Millis, another temporary chief of staff when, when George's wife's funeral took place. There was, there was uh, Ken Millis. Um, now, these are, these are guys who are part of what we call the Brotherhood. Uh, and they're all going down to Mexico. So what, what's going on in Mexico? Ray's one of these guys who wants to sit and go sit in the sun. He doesn't want to go down there to Mexico and do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But he did. And he got cancer all of a sudden. And another guy got cancer all of a sudden, right after he got out of the Marine Corps. No. Not to, uh, not to diverge uh, from what we're talking about right now, but um, did your husband ever tell you anything about any disease warfare, like giving people mm -hmm. sicknesses? And, yeah, and, um, yeah, that's part of, they call it, he called it uh, ABC, NBC, was something like nuclear, biological, chemical, um, ABC, atomic, biological, chemical, uh, they call it biologicals, uh, and in fact, his, I'm not going to mention his name because this is a guy who's really a good guy who scared the word they use is shitless, mm -hmm. excuse me, mm -hmm. but that's the word. Mm -hmm. This guy is petrified. Because? Because he's doing that work. The, the chemical? And biological work. The marine... You mean the laboratory work or the uh, implementation? Dealing. Subterfuge, deception in okay. the Middle East. Okay, and they use uh, he's a Marine Corps disease causing drugs? Absolutely. Uh, and then how do they administrate them? With 
and, and missiles and, and uh, I mean, these, this, is, this is an elaborate big business. <sighs> like Peter Kawaja, mm -hmm. Marine Corps guy, who's working in plain clothes at one of the, the plants in Florida. This is, this is why George is in Florida. This is why they're all down in Florida, because all of this stuff is, is being... We manufactured the chemicals and biologicals that were in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't believe me, you don't believe Peter Kawaja, a Marine Corps colonel, who's, he says they killed his wife, I believe him. He worked in one of these factories. It was supposedly a candy factory where they were manufacturing deadly, deadly killer things. The Marine Corps, Al Gray, Krulak, Carl Mundy, he's in the CFR. He was in Ken Millis' class, who was the chief of staff, the one who controlled me. You know, I went to his mother's house in Seven Mile, Ohio. Flo, his father was a German Nazi. I'm not saying that, you know, being a German Nazi is bad, but he's part of this group. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe Peter Kawaja about the, the drugs, you can, I mean, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's, everybody knows. There's a guy named Randy Abair, lieutenant colonel, hero, American patriot. This is a guy who should be the commandant of the Marine Corps, Krulak. I'm talking to you, I'm talking to Al Gray, I'm talking to you, Carl Mundy. You all are adolescent, immature, I call you twerps. You're liars, you cheat, you steal, you kill, you're beneath the contempt of any of your wives. They are scared to death. Why do you do this to your wives, guys? Look at that tape of Randy A. Bear. I knew Chesty Puller, and this is a strong, wonderful guy. I knew his wife, Virginia Mack. I knew a real Marine. You can't say that you knew them because you didn't. I did. Randy A. Bear stood, sat. He could hardly talk. He was leading a platoon into Iraq. His wife was sitting to his left. His wonderful father was sitting to his right. And he said that his, his colonel, he's a lieutenant colonel at that time. I believe he was a lieutenant colonel. He said, my colonel ordered me. He said, our, all of our registers were saying, this is danger. There are chemicals, biologicals everywhere. I was told, and I was, you know, followed orders. And he was having a hard time talking. His wife was, this is a young guy. His wife was having to interpret for him. Mm. He was crying. He'd been turned on by you guys. He said, on those canisters, on those boxes were American. American flags. Those were American biological biologicals agents. that we were walking into that killed me, that you, Gray, and you, Scrocoff, and you, McFarlane, and you guys knew, you, Ed Wilson, best friend of my husband, you all sold to. Saddam Hussein. And not only that, I talked to the man who trained the woman who was sent over from Iraq to learn how to build the biologicals and chemicals, the, 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 the plants. She was trained here in the United States, and you all know that. And Randy A. Bear's testimony says everything that I could say a million times better because this is a man who's a real man, unlike the generals, unlike the colonels. This is a real hero. Now, is Randy Evers, is he still alive? I don't know, and I hope and I pray to God that he is. Because this is the man who should take over our Marine Corps, or his wife. Some, that's why they don't have any women in special operations. Because that's why they don't have any, any African Americans. They're too honest. They're too strongly Christian. Now, the only uh, guy I know who is 
um, who is involved is, is a homosexual. Who, and his buddy is, a, is an Israeli agent. Hmm. And they are lovers. They're a pair. But well, now, as he's the, now a colonel, and he is under the guidance of Ken Millis. Okay, now as these, these generals, over the period of years, this is consolidated mm -hmm. to where they're all part of this club. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something that's been going on for years and years and years. Members of the firm. Okay, the so as the heard. firm grows, mm -hmm. even as the, guy, the old guys, the gray heads, get old, die off, retire, whatever, they already set in motion a system that, that culls out these young, budding, rising yes. stars, and they move their way yeah. up. Yeah. Well, then, in time, it consolidates to where no one, no one. is in this unless they're in the club. Absolutely. So is, it, is your conclusion, based on what you know from your husband's revelations, reading his diaries, mm -hmm. this sort of thing, mm -hmm. is there anybody in the U.S. military, the Army and Marines, anybody in the, in the, the level of, you know, your generals and your, your colonels, and the, is there anybody who would not be in this club? There's nobody who doesn't know. In special operations, I would say, and I would, I would put money in the bank on this, not one of them is not a party to this. It's not a, once they get that bird, Colonel, that bird, they mm -hmm. go through an initiation <coughs> ceremony. This is not a, and my husband told me about that too. What's the, the, what's the initiation ceremony like? They get them drunk. Uh -huh. Dining in, shell back. Uh, he, he told me. Oh, dining it's, in. This is a term that they use. Oh, yeah. A code yeah. word. Oh, yeah. Shell yeah. back? Shell back. They, uh, what's that mean? Anal sex. But, but they get them really drunk. The, the guys who are that way do it. It's a group situation thing. And I was told by two colonels who said, you know, it's normal, Kay. This is just what we do in battle, you know. This is just good old boys. This is just what we do, Kay. They get drunk and they They have get drunk and they ejaculate. They beat each other off. You know, it's, it's awful. Now, uh, I'm not God and I'm not going to judge them and their souls. Um, this is a well-oiled system. Uh -huh. And when you've got the commandant well-known as a cherry marine, cherry marine, cherry marine. Which means? Bottom. They're the bottom. The Navy guys are on the top. It, think about this, because Walter Chrysler in Norfolk, they, each port has a hierarchy. Uh -huh. Wealthy at the top. Walter Chrysler and Phil Hornthal. Everybody in Norfolk knows that. Where'd they meet? In the Navy. I was engaged to Jack Mace when I was at the Virginia Center for World Trade. He ran the Maritime Association, the Shipping Association. Always dealt with the labor union guys. Always all male banquets. All, and I, I, I couldn't understand why, you know, I was engaged and I couldn't even go to the thousand man banquet. You know, mm. had a big argument about that. Uh, you, Rock Hudson, where did he meet his guy? Navy. Jim Neighbors, Navy. All of these guys, Navy. So they're tapped for whatever it is, acting, singing, you know. The point is, Liberace, you know. Was um, he Navy? I, I believe he was. I, I know that um, he was, uh, someone told me that he was a friend of one of the guys in Norfolk, there was a ring, a VMI ring of men um, in Norfolk, and I knew they met once a month, and some of them were married, some of them weren't, but they were all Navy. They were Army, Navy. In other words, it was kind of a group of men in Norfolk. And then I found out that the organizations, like um, right now, the uh, Al-Anon is run by homosexuals. The... Um, uh, Better Business Bureau, the Community Fund, which is the, uh, I forget what it's called now, I'm, I'm so old, I'm 55, it used to be called the Community Fund, that guy, They're Jack Mace, you know, and I'm, I'm wondering which one isn't, you know, <laughs> I mean, they all are, and the guys know it, so what's going on here? You know, they know it, 
think, oh, Old Dominion University, the lot, uh, Clyburn, um, intelligence family. He was well known. Two reporters on the Virginian Pilot who do the very important columns and so forth. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, so I'm saying, who's making the decisions to do this? They're military. What is the reason behind it? Why do they keep the wives out of the loop? Mm -hmm. uh, so when people suggest that the United States of America is becoming a modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah, Absolutely, without this a... This really is, is not just a broad generalization. No. That this club as it's grown over the years and then placing and promoting the key people in every strata of life. Right. Banking. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the whole thing, not only the military is run by yeah. degenerates yeah. and top heavy with yeah. degenerates, yeah. people who are moral can't possibly move their way mm -hmm. up because no, they, they don't kill qualify. Them. They kill them, they get rid of them. They can't be controlled. No. Uh, one example, I was, I was the executive secretary for the well, the Virginia Center for World Trade had a board of the most important, supposedly the most important leaders who were picked out by Jerome Weiner, Jerry Weiner. Mm -hmm. I was a shill for that. Uh, I had, you know, done a lot of great things at Old Dominion. They wondered why I did it because I'm, they don't understand Christians. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knew I was a worker, so they hired me to go over to the World Trade Center, the Virginia uh, Port Authority. I had an office in there. And Jerome Weiner, what's interesting is Mary Clark Collab worked for him. Okay. The girl who had my job, who was a normal woman like me, because there were a few who were not so normal, uh, like Bobby Bray. Not the Bobby Bray who ran the Port Authority, but another Bobby Bray. He was very nice, but he was a known homosexual. Um, who worked with Weiner. But his secretary was pushed out of a window. Now, it was all hushed up. Of course, she committed suicide. Yeah, this was a young mother who had a baby who knew too much about his money laundering. I reported the, the money laundering that Book and Weiner, now this is a professor, head of international programs at Old Dominion University, Jerry Weiner, whose father was very high up in this Zionist group. Mm -hmm. Jerry Weiner was doing intelligence work in Algeria, in Morocco in particular. Uh, he organized this board that I was the secretary for. He was a very sick, mean guy. I mean, you talk about <clears throat> really <coughs> water. Um, but Jack, Mace was on the board, um, and there was a banker on the board. We can take a break. And <laughs> take a break. Yeah, don't, uh, did you stop it yet? No. No, don't stop it. We'll just leave these synchronized. And uh, is your wife getting a, a cup? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, oh. it's, uh, I was thinking I could use a little bit. But drink. Gustavo. Do you need to use was, the restroom or anything? Yeah, no, I'm fine. I just, I'm thirsty. Yeah, but Gustavo, wine. Gustavo, I love the guy. He was from Columbia. Mm -hmm. He was, in Virginia, in Virginia National Bank, which is now Nation's Bank. And, you know, I didn't put him, because I had studied Latin American history under a wonderful Dr. Blossom. I knew a lot of stuff about Latin America and Nariño and how Panama became a part of uh, our country. And, you know, now, I mean, I understand it was drugs and running things through and everything, but Gustavo was in charge of all the, uh, the laundering that was going on in Virginia National Bank in the port. And where did he go after that? He went to Florida. <laughs> and he introduced me to Anna Maria Quintero, whose brother was one of the big mobsters. I mean, the big, you know, Colombian. <laughs> you know, I, I met Anna Maria Quintero. See, I don't forget some things like this. It's, 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 that's why they don't like me, uh, because I imprint on f wonderful foreign people. I want to know them. I want to send Christmas cards. And um, 
And it's not very good to have, um, have somebody like a little magnet. I'm, I'm sort of like a Monica, <laughs> you know, seek, she's seeking out uh, sex with important guys. I'm wanting to uh, meet people like that from different cultures because I want to learn about them because that's what Christ said. You go out and you minister to the people who are foreigners. You don't just spend your time necessarily with uh, the, the, the home people. You need your home people as a base. But you need to go out and, and find out truth and spread goodness everywhere. Truth is goodness. Truth is light. And that's what, what Christ is all about. You, you're not afraid to learn truth. You're not... Thank you. You know, all these cathedrals and things that were built in his honor. Why? He was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Why was he wonderful? Not because he, he hung around a little group but because he was out trying to. It, he told the big guys, look, stop being bullies and cowards. Let the poor people into your church. Everybody, God gives us all a unique spirit. Mm -hmm. it, our, our, our timing is different. Everybody's fingerprints are different. Eyes are, we have the right to read the Gospels. Yeah. They shouldn't keep the Bible from us. That's right. The church is not a political organization where you've got a few little guys up here telling all the mothers what to do. Mm -hmm. who, were, who were the ones with Jesus Christ at the, you know, when at, on the third day? There was not one disciple there with him. It was the three women. So why are we leaving women out? Women, in Scotland at least, my culture, are... We're partners with our men. We, we need the authority of a husband. We want a strong, moral husband. But what is that uh, passage, uh, you know, about the, uh, the good wife? You know, I can't remember. It's in... Uh, in Proverbs? I mean, the virtuous Proverbs. woman? And, yes, yeah. yes. Right. I mean, she's buying, selling property. Yeah, right. she's, she's doing everything. She's certainly not a no-brainer. So why keep, yeah. her, why keep her at home barefoot and pregnant? Mm -hmm and not being able to read and speak three languages and, and welcome all the foreigners and, you know, to come in. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's what Jesus Christ would be doing. If he were right here, he would be here right with me saying, go for it, little woman. <laughs> you know, I'm giving you the strength to, to tell the daggone truth. And if you get killed tomorrow, you're going up there. You're going to live forever. That's anyway. right. Well, now these... Uh you have to, when you get to be a bird colonel, then they have this initiation that involves all the sexual debauchery. Yeah. Now, would Drinking first. Get them good and drunk. Oh, big time drunk. Because there would be some of these who, uh, if they were sober, they wouldn't go through couldn't with it. Couldn't go through with it. Right. They'd have to be blasted. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And now, do you suppose, I don't know, your husband maybe told you, when they go through this, this, all the stuff that they do, are there people there gathering information? Of course. Intelligence on them? Of course. The chaplains are intelligence. You know, in, the, in Nazi Germany, that you had to tell on your parents, or in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, they, they encourage you to tell on your parents. Uh -huh. Phil Holwager, uh, the guys who go to Yale, who become chaplains, the chaplain corps is tell all the tales on everybody. They have collections agencies. They, these Marines are ordered to go and collect so-and-so at so-and-so. If a Marine tells truth, if he's a whistleblower, if the wife is too much trouble, they collect them, they throw them in, they fill them full of chemicals, they'll do, they'll implant little things in them. I, I believe that my husband has an implant. Well, now, McVeigh said he had a chip implant. I believe George did. Now, now ask yourself, all right, George, I know George has a, a male, had a male friend. Oh. You know, he has had male friends. Your, your husband is bisexual. Yes, he's bisexual. 
Uh, and I was told that by colonels and a captain, uh, by a, a psychiatrist. Um, uh, what percentage do you think of these higher-up people are bisexual? Oh, all of them. If they're, if they're in special operations, if they're Marines, they're, they're all bisexual. They've all had to do it. In order to get to be a bird colonel, mm -hmm. special oper the SEALs, it's kind of like the fast road to the top. Uh, the now. So a guy could not be a seal without having. Oh, I don't. I don't. This. I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't met one that I don't believe would have done it. And judging from what a couple of colonels told me, it's just that's the norm. It's just you women. You know, y'all are so sissy. Y'all are just. You know, you don't. You don't understand how it is. We're under so much pressure. And when Valerie Wilhelm told me that about Charlie, I just could not believe. What Charlie she was Wilhelm saying. would be a he's, a... he's a... he's a general now, down in Miami. And she was just saying, oh, well, you know, he's run around. He has to, she said. He's under so much pressure. And, and I just... and, and she was saying um, that, of course, I had met Charlie in Norway. Um, and Charlie is sort of someone my husband <coughs> just idolizes. And um, he uh, and Michael O'Boyle is another one. Uh, Michael is my husband's special friend. And when my husband retired, uh, we went to Al Gray's office. This was a traumatic thing for me. It was a really weird day. Um, we drove up with his son Douglas and my son Garland. We went to the Commandant's office they had, you know, something to nibble on and eat and, you know, just a, a little something. And his wife, Jan, came over from 8th and I Street, the Commandant's house, with her dogs. She sleeps with stuffed animals and dogs. I don't think there's any lovemaking that goes on with, with Al Gray and his wife, quite honestly, and neither do the colonels. Um, she is a wonderful, sweet person, scared to death. She worked for his intelligence organization. And then she supposedly took care of his mother. And then they married, you know, because you, he, he would not have made it. Everybody knew he was, he was a homosexual, not a bisexual. This is a homosexual commandant. Uh -huh. I um, talked to people who actually, one woman who went to one of the parties, she was French, and she married a naval officer. And it was when George and I were first married, and I told George about what she said about General Gray. She said, you cannot believe this man is totally debauched. This man is, is, does these group sex orgies in, outside of Marseille, France. He's just horrible. You know. She said, now I have to admit, I was party girl, you know, went to these parties and um, so forth. But... Uh, she, what, what would happen is, and I met a, a guy in the laundromat who was very, very, um, he was enlisted and he was involved in, in Beirut and he knew my husband. He was uh, going back and forth from Gaeta to the uh, uh, New Jersey, the ship, and then, you know, into Beirut on the beach and everything, and he worked for an, an admiral. Now, this is a, this is a big admiral. And the Admiral would, they would go to these parties at this big mansion outside of Marseille. What they did was they invited the, the wild girls, the secretaries, because this went on in, in Indonesia. My husband had a secretary. Anne Bouchou's husband, Hank, was sleeping with the secretary. My husband was sleeping with the secretary and Anne Bouchou. They were doing, because my husband's wife wasn't there, so they had their little menage à quatre. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, my husband was sleeping with Anne Bouchou, who's now, he says, a, a, a lesbian, you know, but he was sleeping with her and, you know, r called her right after his wife died the night, you know. And I found the telephone numbers and, you know, her address and her birthday and all these letters he was writing. Isn't there a disease that runs rampant with oh, these people? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, but Al Gray, uh, this guy, uh, would guard the parties. Now, how does that make a young guy 
Phil, who's got a child, he's guarding an orgy with Israelis. There were Israelis at these parties. Intelligence people. Intelligence? There's not intelligence there. There's perversion. There's, there's psychological, uh, you know. They're, these guys are abnormal. They're adolescent. They're not full, complete people. They're, they can't have normal. Anyway. So he's guarding the parties, and he says, the secretary, the girls come in, they stay till about 11. They're all nude, all nudists. The Earls, Jim and Nancy Earl, my husband, Ty Kroll, most of the uh, 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 chiefs, nudists. Um, makes it easier, you know, to see the little, you know, <laughs> it's terrible. They're, they're nudists in the sense that? Yeah, they're, they're nudists. Okay, so they have whatever. Freedom. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Freedom. Um, it's really kind of religious, isn't it? Yeah. With them. Yeah, yeah. But the girls, the women leave at about 11 o'clock. This is what he said. I mean, I knew the girls were there because I'd already talked to, the, talked to the French girl. And he said, well, you know, <laughs> what they do is the women leave at about 11 o'clock, maybe 1 o'clock, and the guys all stay around there. And, and it's just the ritual. Mm -hmm. This is what they do. So... And then I, then I found out... Um, and these are the guys that send our boys to war. Yeah. These are the, guy, the big guys. Then I found out, because my husband would mention this guy and that guy, you know, that he went to school with. Bob Edwards is involved with this stuff. But the guy who recruited him, Charles Caddock, who was a well-known homosexual, who was the, quote, head teacher but the bodyguard for the Saudi boys, See, the Saudi boys were encouraged to do this, to corrupt them. <coughs> they were corrupting Muslims who would not have done this ordinarily. Mm -hmm. The parties at Aramco, they would give the young boys, get them really drunk, and encourage Muslim sons to do this kind of stuff. Muslim sons who would have a strong tendency toward uh, morality. Yes. Yes. And to abhor this kind of conduct. That's right. But if they could get them drunk and loaded enough that they would do yes. this one time. Yes. Then they would gain a controlling edge on these guys. And who do you think did it? Charles Caddock and Borland. These guys. Alexander Robinson. Cheeseborough. Who was the headmaster. The Saudis bought Russell House at the Hun School in Princeton. They brought over Mohammed Faisal and, you know, Saud, Khalid Saud. They didn't really go to classes mm -hmm. or whatever. And who was the young man who was partying with them? My husband, George Griggs. Who was in the group with them? Einstein. I mean, I, ha my husband was partying with Albert Einstein. I said, well... You know, I didn't... And, I just, and when would this have been? At what age in 52, 53, 54, okay. 55. Um, I believe he said that Mohammed came over in 54. It was right after the murder, <coughs> the poisoning of the one who was really good. Okay. The, so your husband would have been a young guy, 18, 19 years old? Oh, he was, he was only... When they first got to him, he was in high school. So he was, he was ninth grade. And he would be there? He was at the school with these homosexuals. They sent his parents to California, got him a little Boy Scout job, his father. He didn't see his parents for eight solid years. And this is amazing. I see. So then the transference is these people become your parents. Oh, they're the ones you look up to. Yeah, but they're doing things to you. Sure. Oh, they're sodomizing you. Of course. And Albert Einstein was actually... Was in that homosexual group, bisexual group. Absolutely. Camus, Camus. Sartre. Camus. Now, Camus did not, I don't believe my husband actually met Camus, but Camus was a lover of his French teacher at Princeton. Not Todeve, not the one who helped him with his paper whom he had an affair with. And I was told that by normal roommates whom he had later on and by another roommate. Um, they knew George was doing this stuff. George was, um, he was a cheerleader. Um, he was a French major. He, 
Were there were there any other young teenagers from that particular setting yes. that was that were also being Bob cultivated? Edwards. Bob Edwards, who's a Marine Corps Colonel, was part oh. of that group. And my husband met with in Bob high Edwards in high school. Uh -huh. Bob Edwards went on to Fort Benning. He was in psychological warfare. In fact, he was involved with the subterfuge in when I, after I was injured and, and my husband socked me in the breast and I had to have surgery um, because he'd already broken a leg and I was starting to document the violence. But I'm such an upfront person and I wanted him, all I wanted him to say was, I'm sorry, Kay, I did this. But I was trying to do, like they said Rosie Greer did, you put a mirror, if, if you're battering your wife, you put a mirror up in front of yourself or a photograph mm -hmm. and you try to imprint the lower brain because I wanted to save his soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy had murdered his first wife, battered her to death. I mean, he dragged her body back. I mean, it was just, Sue had a cerebral hemorrhage. It, that's too much for me to get into. But he was doing that to me, and I stopped him from drinking, thinking this would stop the battering. But I started taking notes, taping things, you know, while he'd go in these rages, because I wanted somebody to know. Mm -hmm. I wanted somebody to help me so I wouldn't die. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd had surgery. I'd had broken bones. And I was trying to reach out for some help. And so I was trying to get him to realize what he was doing to me. And I told him, I said, George, I know you did this to Sue. Do you really want me, Dad? You know, this is... So, but he started getting scared, and he was cool. Did he ever admit he, to you that he, that he was responsible for his first wife's death? He, uh, yeah, he, he, he came, he said... Um, he admitted that they didn't get along. He admitted that he didn't love her. That he battered her. He admitted that he, he'd hurt her. He admitted that he dragged her body back uh, after she supposedly collapsed at dinner. Now, this is a 200-pound woman. You know, she's huge because she's not happy. She's sleeping with her dog. <laughs> she doesn't sleep with her husband because he's too busy sleeping with other people. Mm -hmm. He doesn't find her attractive. He's sleeping with Nancy Earl, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's just the most crazy. And she's tr she loves him because, you know, he's handsome, and what is she going to do? She's never worked a day in her life. Her mother loves him. Mm -hmm. It's like me. No, who would believe you that a handsome, wonderful guy, you know, oh, but George is so nice. So, and this is what the wives go through. They know that it'll be hard. So... The, and the guys just, what, what George did was, he had clout in the State Department, and they knew that, that I just loved showing people around. So he would plan something that I just had to do. I would be hooked, mm -hmm. like, like a hook and a fish. And he had some dignitaries who came over from, where did they come from? They were parliamentarians from, uh, I think these were from, one of the Latin American countries, Panama. And of course, we had to go to Richmond. So I had to stay overnight with them, and George didn't want to go with me. And it just so happened that Bob Edwards, his army colonel friend, invited him to come up and meet with some of the guys you know, mm -hmm. at New Hope, Pennsylvania, or Bucks County, or wherever it was. Well, he had already been talking to Phil Holwager about the abuse because I had gone in for surgery uh, and I thought it was very unusual that Phil Holwager was there during the surgery kind of holding George's hand it wasn't for me mm -hmm. it was to make sure George didn't fall apart to make sure that the doctor I didn't say anything when I was under sodium pentothal you know covering George's ass mm -hmm. excuse my French but he was the chaplain at Fleet Marine Force Atlantic and, and was the chaplain for Sue's funeral. He knew what George had done. And he runs around on his wife, you know, he's playing golf all the time. I, he and George were playing golf with this single woman and I found out and I said, what are you all, you know, he's the so-called so chaplain and he went to school with Gary Hart. 
He was a classmate of Gary Hart's at Yale, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, a colleague of Pat Robertson's. That's why he, you know, not the saying that Pat Robertson does that kind of thing. I don't think he does. I'm sure he doesn't. But they went to Yale, mm -hmm. and so forth. But uh, so George um, was uh, a violent man, and he started. Um, knowing that I was sort of going to do something. So he started doing certain things. And, um, you know, it, uh, it now looking back, um, mm -hmm. I, I can see why. Because of the, the violence, he wouldn't have been able to use his 45 anymore if he'd been um, convicted of. Yeah. Battering, yeah. yeah, he would not have been able to use his pistol anymore, carry it. So they wanted to make sure that he was protected. So the wife has got to go. The wife is way down the totem pole. Um, it doesn't matter what wife, and that's the reason the wives are so afraid, the Marine wives. And they all talk cryptically, and, you know, they, they even talk outside the house. Talk cryptic. There's a there's code words and double meaning words and. Yeah. Uh, what's yeah. 10 p.m. Saturday TV? Your satellite. Remember, doesn't you've only got to switch at 10? Hmm. Not on Saturdays. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just thought it reminded me. I okay. You used something earlier. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I think this pretty well sums up uh, okay. this segment. Unless there is, is there anything you you can think of. I can see where we'll do this again sometime um, as this develops on. Tomorrow, let's see, tomorrow's Sunday. Uh, Monday, what we'll do, um, is there always, if we make a copy of this, so there's yeah. two of these? Yeah, sure. Something happens Absolutely. To you and yours. Sure. Okay, we'll make copies of this stuff sure. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, don't lose that. No, thing. no. <laughs> but this, this is interesting. It talks about sabotage, subterfuge. This is the standard army book, teaching men to lie, cheat, steal, uh, be peeping toms on women. Now, if they don't allow women in there and they can peeping tom all the wives they want, they don't need movies, oh. pornography. They, they, you know, it's, and they go on all the TADs they want. TAD is a... Just take off, just tell their wife they're going. And they, they can lie, because it's all secret. We don't have to tell our wives anything. And it's, yeah, it's intelligence. It's work. Oh, it's intelligence. Yeah, sure, it's <laughs> intelligence. It's, that's interesting. But this is, this is really, I mean, you know, I mean, what, this is full of, full of, and this is just a mild seal commando t-shirt. Can you hold it up to the camera? Yeah. That's a, that's a t-shirt that a seal would, would wear. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Leave it up. This, uh, this, I uh, played Nancy Drew, Miss Marple, and uh, I infiltrated, if that's the word you could use, the SEAL reunion this year. Um, they spent a lot of money showing off, you know, jumping out of helicopters, and, you know, probably $100,000 would spend, I don't know how much, but I mean, the military was providing the funds for this little game on the beach at Fort Story. Yeah. And then there was, each one of the teams has t-shirts, which all sexual. Yeah. You know, all about, I mean, think about the, every the weapon. The driving motivation is sexual. of all this stuff is... is uh, Go for it. Yeah. So I went to the party. I took my life in my hands. I called a couple of friends and said, if I don't, if I don't come back, I'm at the SEAL party, and I'm going to pretend that I'm a SEAL wife. And I'm going to go to this drunken party. And, of course, I have an eagle on my car. Little old, they, they try to get me to get rid of it. So you can get access. So I, I went in there. Um, and do you know that 90% of the people there were men? They, they didn't have wives, this party. And the women that were there were probably... Yeah, a, a, a few wives, but feeling very uncomfortable. So I sort of got in with some of the older SEALs. Did Johnson ever mention the name of Lieutenant Colonel Bo Greitz? No. 
but I, I know who he is. Mm -hmm. um, and, but he has a lot of Army friends, not that he doesn't know Bogreitz. I'm right. sure that Bogreitz is, is well known to, to some of these guys. Mm -hmm. I, I believe he's Army. Could be. I, I'm sure he's not a Marine. I know he's not a Marine. Huh. I, I don't believe he's a Marine. Okay. But he's a, he's a guerrilla. He's a commando. Yeah. But his, his name didn't come up as anything in intelligence. So. No, my husband was way above Bo Greitz's level. My husband mentioned uh, people like um, McFarlane and uh, Crow. Crow was his tennis buddy, I think, you know. Uh, Hag, Alexander Kissinger, Hague. the uh, Victor Krulak. Uh, see, Gray is is the control guy. Gray and and Joy. Mm -hmm. Joy's big guy because and but Joy lost his job at Morale Welfare and Recreation, I believe, because I told somebody that it, maybe that he I didn't think he wasn't because of me that he lost his job, but they made him move on somewhere else. Uh -huh. Because he was at Morale Welfare Recreation, which is uh, kind of a, a money laundering thing. They run all the officers' clubs, all the um, recreation. It's not a private, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's all run by the military, even though it's supposedly not military. Mm -hmm. And they give the good old boys these these jobs, I mean, he was probably earning $200,000. Their retirement for a colonel, my husband, just the, the retirement salary was fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. Then they give them these other jobs, so their income is two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. Now, that is not right. But it would certainly purchase loyalty. Oh, definitely. They all get swimming pools behind their house. Who's, who's ever going to bite the hand that feeds that good? No, nobody. Dirty business, you know, but all of the captains and all of the admirals know this and wink. And it's, it's sick, it's sick. <laughs> it's just really, really, really bad. And these are, this is taxpayer money. Hard working people who are just wondering where the money is going to come from to, to pay their taxes. Mothers of children who are having to work two jobs to feed their three children. And they're spending $10 million on phallic-shaped weapons. I went to the Army show just, just last week. I was up there. They had a hearing on Okinawan... Uh, rapes a day, you know, they call it a, a murder rape a day or whatever, you know, crime a day by Marines in, in Okinawa. And I went up there, John Conyers had a hearing, and, and they also had the Army show, which I had gone to a couple of years before. And in the basement of the, uh, this big hotel, they have these 200 or more vendors of weapons. Israel is, is in, has a joint venture, IAI, has a joint venture with, is it TRW, TWR, that does all the uh, credit reports yeah. on Americans. Whoa. Now, they have the computers together. The Israelis stole the whole INSLAW system and sold it back to the Justice Department. And there were murders over that. Mike Fuller knows all. Mike Fuller was a former assassin who's talking. And they are after him. Believe me, I met him through Sarah. <coughs> he and oh, um, is that, what about this Victor Marchenko? Um, you're you're pictured with him. What's yeah? What's that about? Well, he is a typical example of the mercenary who is brought over from Czechoslovakia, Poland, uh, Romania, mm -hmm. the Eastern Bloc countries who were actually KGB, double agents. Oh, Marchenko is... Okay. The family, yeah, his family were... Yeah, he, his family came over. They weren't even citizens. In other words, they bring over the young men. Right. They work for five years, and then they become citizens. Now, I'm not saying... I mean, 
if you, I've, I've read his books. I, I wanted to meet the guy. He knows George. He knows who George is. Uh, I read two of his books just to see, cause, to see if it's what George said, you know, to kind of mm -hmm. balance mm -hmm. and what these other guys. If you read Marshenko's book, you'll see what my husband, the arrogance. Well, sure, we're going to go into this embassy. You know, we're going to go, we're going to put a whore with this person and we're going to spy on them and what they're doing and, you know, we're going to just uh, steal that statue just for the hell of it, you know. I mean, they, now when you multiply every one of the teams, all the graduates, and think, think in terms of 100 men applying, and maybe 90 go through most of the training, but they don't quite make it. And then they've got, you know, 400, 600 men who, are, who make it, how many don't make it, and then you multiply that over time, and then the ones who are, I mean, this banquet, I mean, this uh, gathering of seals that I went to, there were probably a thousand guys there. Now they break, they, they have to do a cold kill. You know, cold kill? Kill somebody, murder somebody, just to prove they can do it, like ducks. Wait a minute, the seals? Yeah, seals. So like all thousands of these guys have killed They've somebody. They've done a cold kill, yeah. Now a cold kill would be a killing under orders? It's uh, a graduation exercise kind of thing. You know, it's... it's. Uh, I mean, would... They, uh, who well, would they kill? Oh, it's just, just somebody, just anybody. Just, just, just go into a hotel and whack off somebody. You know, uh, for, I was told that for graduation exercises, the greatest thing they could do was to break into a general or an admiral's wife's house and steal some things, you know, personal items. And, um, to prove that you were good enough to get in oh, yeah. and out. Oh, yeah. And I, all of my underwear disappeared, my lingerie, my teddies. And the funny thing is that I don't know whether it was Michael O'Boyle doing it uh, because he, he, see, he was, from 1991 to 1993, Michael O'Boyle was three miles away from my husband. He was at his graduation exercise. He was very close to my husband. And, um, and yet he was just down the road, and I started questioning my husband about, you know, what is this about you and Michael? You know, what's going on? Well, Michael was there, and, they, my, and my husband never told me he was there, and he saw him all the time. And, that, and, and I'm looking back at when my teddies disappeared, but all this time, now Michael had... He and his first wife had, had divorced, that's okay, but the, he had an affair with a woman and a child, a secretary. So he was having an affair with a woman. I mean, he's not, Michael is both ways, you know what I mean. But mm -hmm. in order to get into the system, he sort of did it with my husband. He was my husband's friend, younger friend. Uh -huh. And that started when he was in the Seventh Fleet under Krulak and Buell in intelligence on the, uh, the ship. So, um, but Michael, there he was at Little Creek, my husband's best friend. He never invited him over, <coughs> but he saw him. <laughs> so I, I don't know, you can guess what, what that means. Um, but the, uh, the, the teams, the, the biological electronic warfare school that, see, after my husband left FMF Lant, he went to the school, mm -hmm. you know, the special operations school, which ran the whole, the teams, foreigners, and everywhere. Okay, now the, the term Mac SOG, what, do, what does that mean? What is that? It was a kind of a, a code word for, um, going out and sending platoons to kill people in Vietnam. Um, SOG is Special Operations mm -hmm. Group. Um, special Operations, S-O-S-S, O-S-S, uh, Secret Service, S-S, Nazi, Spetsnaz, the, the German 
um, storm troopers. Mm -hmm. They all, if you know anything about the, the German high command, uh, it's the Brotherhood. It's called, they, they are con connected with the Opus Dei, which is an uh, Italian kind of a business group that works within the Vatican. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm told that, and I like the Pope, I think he's a wonderful guy, but I'm told that, that he was involved with that during World War II. Mm -hmm. I've heard that too. And that, um, that the guy who was the Pope before was murdered so that he could get in. Now I'm still curious about the the seals in this murder thing. Uh, Are we still on? Yeah. Okay. Now the um, a seal in order to complete his indoctrination becoming a quote full fledged seal. Part of that includes the fact he has to have killed somebody. Yeah. All right, and it could Seal be... Seal Team 6, right, the, the red team. Red team. Mm -hmm. The ghetto was the captain of that team, and his wife and I had wonderful conversation. And would she confirm this as well? I mean, did she confirm I, this I with you? I guess she would. She's scared. She's frightened. Most of these women are scared to death because they're warned. They, they know what happened to Sue Griggs. Okay, so, they but they know. support you, I mean, yeah. philosophically, in their yeah. hearts at least, oh, if yeah. not with their lips. Oh, yeah. Oh, they yeah. We talk about it. Uh, some of them have to go out of their house. Some of them won't even talk in the office in which they work. Mm -hmm. They've had men come by their houses. They've had their papers stolen. I mean, association with They're, you could be the kiss of death. Yeah. Oh, sure. And they know that. But they, they, we talk anyway. And I, you're talking about some really brave women here. And when I talked to, there are a couple of colonel's wives, and a, some, and before I, I went public, you know, they were talking to me, except for Carolyn Millis was just, she turned just like that. She was the one who, whose house I was in when I told about the go-go dancers in the officers club and me taking the picture. Mm -hmm. and thinking about writing the letter to the wives. And she said, oh, you can't do that. You'll ruin George's career. In other words, Carolyn has really bought into the system, and she's very pretty, and she's very influential with the wives group, group but she'll turn on you in a second. Uh -huh. And she, it really hurt me because I was, um, you know, it, I kind of depended on her and Charlotte Moore, but when I went public, when I started telling people what I knew little bit by little bit just to get my courage, and then when I finally went to visit Sarah McClendon, it was like, you see, mm -hmm. I told you. Uh -huh. I mean, Sarah McClendon called my house, and they told her it was an army base. I mean, it was a military base, and they, that the Griggses didn't live there anymore. Ha, ha, ha see this paper, you know, then I was totally shut off. But until that point, I went in to see Peggy Sheehan. You know, we had tea and food, and, um, and he was the head of NATO, Sackland. And his wife, Peggy, said, just, Kay, uh, this is so strange. She said, just leave a note on your refrigerator. Yeah, for George. Just leave a note on your refrigerator. <laughs> Meaning? I don't know. Just, in other words, he's coming in the house. Uh, they're coming in the house. It'll get to George. This is SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. You know, just get used to it, used to being battered, used to being... Well, she was a worshiper of the security of the position, the money and everything, and uh, just don't rock the boat because uh, this is the way it is. Yeah, yeah. And we don't want it any differently. No. I mean, they could desire it If you it have more. to divorce your husband, if you, then, you know, that's just the way it is. But uh, it's cold calculating and yet so un-American. So un-American. I, mean, I know what Americans like because everybody in my family were, you know, World War II. My brother was a briefer for uh, the Sinclant, Sacklant staff. He went on to be a, a medical doctor, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. th this is not, um, 
course, he got out just as soon as he could. Well, you know, people who love this country and love its history, I mean, are just completely confused. Yeah. From cab drivers to yeah. bartenders. I mean, nobody can figure out what's going on. Why, why is it everything goes the wrong direction? You, you know what I say? When I started this, it was like a, um, maybe a 2,000-piece puzzle. I know enough it's like a puzzle for a two-year-old or a one-year-old with six pieces. It's so easy to see. And everybody who talks to me sees it the same way. And the two-and-a-half-year-old child had shallow ice pick, ten shallow ice pick uh, wounds in her chest in the form of an S. I asked Helena, I said, Helena, what did that S stand for? And she said, Satanism. So this was a shock to me. The McDonald case, this man's in jail. I couldn't understand it. I went on national television, a number of national TV shows. I debated Freddy Kassab, the father-in-law, on CNN. And uh, also a psychiatrist was there. And I talked about this satanic uh, aspect. And I had people calling me from all over the country, telling me the same basic story, from the East Coast, the West Coast, North and South. And I had people that, what you'd call them multi-generation Satanists, that's somebody who was born into it, mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, were involved in Satanism. And uh, adult survivors, that's somebody that gets out, usually has to go into hiding to survive. I had these people call me from all over the country, tell me about the ceremonies and about the, uh, the uh, extent of the Satanic movement in this country today. So I started investigating it myself. I gave a number of lectures on it. I had some national exposure, of course. And the bottom line is it's very easily explained. And it fits into a pattern. And this goes back some 200 years. I'm going to use as a textbook tonight Pawns in the Game. It's a book that was written by William Guy Carr. He's a retired commander in the Canadian uh, Navy, Naval Force, and uh, he had heard about the conspiracy and wanted to delve into it himself. He wrote a very compact book about what's going on with the Illuminati and how this fits into uh, modern day plans, what's going on in the world today. So we're going to use that as a textbook for the first two hours. In the second two hours, uh, we'll have some case studies. I'm sort of an interpreter. I kind of give a lot of the wives hope and the guys too who are already out and scared and you know and they say hey well this little this little woman she's a real feisty you know what and uh, I don't know whether they're gonna kill her what they're gonna do and I and, and they say aren't you afraid and I say yes ah! I mean I've had death threats and I mean it's been hell but truth and light and what these other women are going through, the hell they're going through, being put through hell because their husbands are cowards and bullies. I mean, people who dress up in black, who hide behind trees, who shoot people from behind, who break into houses and steal their papers. This is in the Constitution. You don't break into someone's home. You don't steal their papers. You don't you don't try to destroy the core that God has given them when they're born. Mothers have sons, and their sons are 18 years old, and they're, they were telling them, join the Marine Corps to be a man. It's not a man. It's not a man who does this. It's a pervert. That's why they're not joining up anymore. That's not why they're, that's why they're not signing up they're having problems with retention because the mothers are finding out mcveigh's mothers talked unabomber's mothers and brothers have talked you know McV guys like colonel ron ray is talking who was uh timothy what's his new the new new boy who refused to wear the u.n uniform oh, michael new michael new yeah these are the heroes michael new is the is the macarthur Randy A. Bear is the future Patton. 
These are the leaders. These are the Americans. And there are a lot of them. There are hundreds of thousands of them. And just like in the days of Jesus Christ, these modern day Sadducees and Pharisees are saying, oh, we're going to kill Jesus. We're going to get rid of MacArthur. We're going to get rid of Patton. We're going to get rid of, of uh, uh, you know, New. We're going to get rid of um, Colonel Sabo murdered him. We're going to get rid of these guys. One by, hey, but everyone, this is physics, everyone, like Sue Griggs that's murdered, Sabo who's murdered, the wives who were murdered, Ron Brown, there are a hundred people who spring up and say, uh-uh. Now you got me to worry about. This is why these guys have got little places hidden all over the place. They're training all the, the, you know, the, the guys to just say, oh, well, the American citizens are bad. But the guys they're training are also going to wake up to what's going on. It's Caspar Weinberger. It's Henry Kissinger. I mean, Nicholas Walt Whitman Rostow, uh, Eugene Debs Rostow. The, what's going on here? These guys aren't even born in America. What's happening here? They're training mercenaries now to run, you know, flip around, we'll kill on uh, an order. Not killing because it's, people are breaking into our homes, not killing because they're bad, but just we want to control this country. That's what George told me. It's political. The military, the Marine Corps, is a political arm of a group that wants to, to run everything, control the drugs, uh, sell the weapons, keep the, keep the weapons flow going. And this isn't uh, what, what guys are going to sign up to do. Their heart's not in it. They're not going to even do it for the money. They'd rather die than have hit squads come after them collection groups from uh, Great Lakes. They have a, a group of, of uh, Marines who goes out and collects guys who have gone to their psychiatrist and they're a little bit talking too much. They get rid of them. But they're not told why. They're just told they're enemies or they've done bad things. So they don't, it's kind of like they don't, uh, um, so they won't have any uh, guilt and culpability. They, they make it cold. Just get rid of this guy, okay? Okay, get a promotion, get a new car, get some stock. Uh, after my husband did what he did in Beirut, there, I found these stubs. He got all this stock. You know, AT&T, major stock, just thousands of dollars worth of stock. And it was from a, a, a company that was like a quasi-government company, all on a, a sheet of paper. And, of course, it was, it was big, big-time stock. And that's how he was paid off. Stock. And, and paid off for? For doing criminal activities, selling weapons, going through... Uh, Tel Aviv, the, the bank in Rome, mm -hmm. selling the weapons illegally. The, the Israeli agents are the, are the middlemen. And all the money's going to Israel. A lot of, I mean, it really is the truth. Mm -hmm. The money, not just the money that is given to them free and clear, mm -hmm. but all the criminal, the black budget money that Meyer Lansky's group started back in the 40s has been growing and growing and growing. It's like a pyramid scheme. And the Jesuits, I've been told, are really controlled by this, this group now. I don't, you know. Um, now, surely, Ollie North is a good guy. No, I think he was farmed. You know, he was, uh, but see, Ollie was involved in Vietnam with the Jags, covering up a lot of the stuff that was going on. He was involved with a major case where there was a Marine, um, see, George was, oh, George told me about this. See, George was involved with a lot of the cover-ups of Marines who went crazy. Like, remember this, a few good men, uh, 
was with Jim Goodman. It was a movie about a Marine colonel. They murdered a guy from Jack Nicholson played the colonel in this movie. Oh, you remember? Yeah, he went on trial. Yes. And, and a George good guy was the chief of staff who tried to cover this up. <clears throat> My husband. The true story. The true story. My husband was the guy who was covering this up. They were so arrogant. And it wasn't, it was the, the woman who was the JAG who got this thing going. It was not the, the Navy JAG, because he was going to cover it up. He was just a loose kind of guy. And if he had been the JAG, then it wouldn't have been prosecuted. But it was the woman who was working with him, because she was a woman, who, who, who got these, these other guys off. They were targeting these other guys. I mean, they would have put him in jail just for a little bit and, you know, let him out. But um, the point is, this guy was murdered. And the colonel laughed it off. It was down there in Guantanamo Bay. And George was the chiefest. It was Al Gray. Al Gray. Hmm. That was, I mean, just that one. Just that one alone. And, and Lone Tree, <laughs> they were involved with that. You see, oh, it's, it's, it's just so sick. I mean, they are so easy. Let's break. Okay. I'll tell you. This I is tell quite, you. This has been a tremendous. Um, I'm going to let you take this home and read this letter. Or did you take the letter? You got the letter. the letter. Okay. Take, take this and put the letter in there because you'll see the glasses in there. Oh, That's okay. <laughs> Bless your heart for sitting through all this. You know, I <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't say it on the but I a little bit. Okay, everything is rolling. Is this Yep, the red light's on. Okay, let's say a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for this day and opportunity to do your service. Lord, you said you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's what we're interested in accomplishing here today, in Jesus' name. What we're going to do, we're just going to record a bunch of stuff here, and we can do some more tomorrow. If we forget something today, it doesn't matter. We can put it in. If you think of something in 20 minutes that should have been said right up front, it doesn't matter. Great. We are simply wanting to reduce this down to tape so that it doesn't get lost. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, and the big job lays ahead. That's the editing. Okay? So I want you to completely relax. There is nothing that can't be done, redone, if we sneeze, if we cough, if, you know, anything That's can be That's reassuring. If the, if the ceiling caves <laughs> in, all we do is clean up the mess and keep going. Okay. So, um, everything here is real laid back. You've got a lot of information, mm -hmm. and we want, to, uh, we want to get this down into a storyline, because I think what you've got here is something that is extremely important for people to know about. Yeah, it is. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about you, and, and uh, see now you... Where did you start out your life? You were born and raised in the country? Uh, yeah, the city? I, was, I was raised on a, on a farm. In fact, I live in the same neighborhood in which I grew up. It was my grandfather's um, farm. Part, part of it was divided into thirds. But in 1939, my grandfather was an obstetrician in Norfolk. He was also in the Naval Reserves. He was in charge of military intelligence uh, in, in uh, Norfolk, which is the largest military naval complex in the world. So I was born in the Naval Hospital, which is, was the NATO headquarters, uh -huh. um, and brought home to my grandparents' farm. Um, my father was in the South China Seas on a, on a naval vessel. My uncle was in the Navy. So I come from a long line of, of military civilian uh, folks. They, they were not full-time uh, uh, military individuals. They, they had jobs, and they would go into the war. They would be in reserves, and uh, as my grandfather was, he stayed in mm -hmm. um, and retired uh, a Navy captain. But I live um, in a house that was in part of my grandfather's field. And, Sorry. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. But I'm, I'm being strangled financially uh, by um, the, this army 
intelligence group, JAG group that my husband. Um, Not is JAG, is that J-A-G? JAG, Judge Advocate General. Um, I think American citizens do not realize how many JAGs are in our court system, and they take orders. They are in the chain of command, they're active reserve, and they are in our court system everywhere you look. Not, not just federal, uh, state, local? And local and everywhere, yeah. And they're going to um, meetings once a month, and if there is a case uh, like many of the military intelligence wives, like myself, and we have information that would come out in a, in a divorce hearing or, or whatever, um, they totally control it. It is uh, Judge John Moore, in, in my case, um, in Virginia Beach, is, a, is an Army Ranger. His, um, he is um, active reserve. He's a VMI Army Colonel. He's a graduate of VMI. In Virginia Beach, in the courts, there are at least six judges, and I'm, I'm including commissioners, in that, because in Virginia we have a system where the commissioners do the um, the a uh, lot of the decisions, and all of these in Virginia Beach uh, who take care of military wives mm -hmm. are military judges. No, you, you you mentioned the term VMI. What what is that? Well, VMI is Virginia Military Institute, and it's where uh, General Marshall. The Marshall Plan went went to school. It's a it's a little West Point. Mm -hmm. It's it, there's a lot of tradition there, uh, but it's based on um, the Greek sort of Spartan military concept. And my father went to Washington and Lee, which is also in Lexington. And I know that there is uh, some sort of um, I won't say cult, but there, there probably is some sort of um, club, secret society, uh, okay. and uh, so it's very, very tight click. Um, but what I was trying to say is that the, the judges are military men, and they're not independent. They, they take they orders. They take orders. They're on, there's a chain of command, and in my particular case and the other 11 military wives that, who, whom I have met so far. There are many, many more, but they've all been handled the same way. That's mm -hmm. not, not a normal divorce uh, at all. Yeah, I've, I've heard of these kind of situations before, but never, it's never been put so concisely and so reasonably that there would be a, a connection why some people just no matter what attorney you have, it doesn't matter. Oh, no. The, the divorces and the settlements of assets never go the right way. No, and there's a FISA court, uh, which I know is involved oh. in, in my case. What, what, what kind of court? Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It's a Justice Department secret court that American citizens are not aware of. There have been a couple of articles on it. Um, it, it's a small group of, of men, and I think there's a woman on it. Um, I, I believe there's seven justices. And in reality, the, the article that I read, which was given to me by um, Mike Fuller, and I know he would not mind me using his name, he's a, a government assassin. He was a, um, what, like my husband, a, a government assassin who uh, did... Uh, when you say assassin, you're talking about like character assassination or kill people? No, killing people. Okay. He, he was, he's a mercenary, government mercenary. Okay. Um, he was in Afghanistan and in uh, Rhodesia, South Africa. And I met him uh, and his wife through Sarah McClendon. He's a okay. real wonderful patriot who is speaking out about what the, the NATO community and, and the uh, Army and Marine Corps are, are doing. And Sarah McLennan, she's, uh, she's an old war horse, isn't she? <laughs> Sarah saved my life, literally. Really? Yeah. 
I, uh, I had been having break-ins starting um, Mar the, the night of March the 4th. After I was calling everywhere to see um, if I could find my husband, he would, you know, disappear at times. And I, uh, I, I found my husband's diary, which I have here, which they have been not anxious to have um, get out. Uh-huh. No, uh, they, they meaning? The, well, they, um, General Sheehan, General uh, Krulak, uh, Marine Corps colonels, um, excuse me, generals, um, uh, Al Gray, um, Cook, um, and especially General Joy. Joy. Uh, General Jim Joy. Uh-huh. And General Carl Steiner are, they're evil men. Um, and they are in this diary meeting with my husband almost every day in Beirut. They trained the, the men in black mm -hmm. who, who killed those people in Waco. It was General Joy and General Ste Steiner, Steiner's army. Dirty tricks, special operations. And this is what my husband does for a living, is train mercenaries, young boys from countries like Romania, um, Cuba, I mean, uh, uh, Dominican Republic, Haiti, all these countries. They're training them to be murderers. And the taxpayers' dollars are paying for this. Okay, now they train them just through the normal channels of the military. They, these kids uh, join the Army of the Marine Corps, and then they select these kids based on some criteria to train them? They, they psychologically profile them. The profile, which is similar to my husband's and Lee Harvey Oswald's and McVeigh's and, and some of the others um, who were all part of this program, Daimler, Jeffrey Daimler was profiled and hidden. You know, they, um, what, what most Americans do not know is that all of these men were oh, Jeffrey army. Daimler, he has a mi military background? Of course. They're oh. all army. Oh, okay. They were all picked out because they're perverted or twisted. Oh. Yeah. Sexually perverted. Sexually perverted and therefore, you know. Yeah. Well, now, I, I don't think McVeigh was, was uh, perverted the way Daimler was, but uh -huh. certainly... The, the group that my husband is overseeing are mm -hmm. twisted. So they, part of the criteria, they look for people who have got something in their history that gives them a, a weird bend. Yeah. Uh, like they, they were molested when they were a child, yeah. or they come from dysfunctional families, abuse, whatever. Strong mother, uh, weak father, no father, poor. Because these guys are looking for security, so they will stay in the military and do anything. Okay. for that security. This was my husband's scenario. My husband and Oswald are just two peas in a pod. Huh. Um, exactly the same personality, the same type, in the same elite group, I might add, which was doing work with communists and Russians, with Czechoslovakians and with um, Romanians. I met assassins. I met drug lords. Fahim Kordabawi, um, whose family were the drug lords in the Bekaa Valley. Um, I mean, he, 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 he knows the elite of the elite of the elite. And, and that's why um, I was warned uh, twice not to talk. And you were warned? Uh, I was told that I would be killed. I was told that Your I Your husband warned you about this, or? Oh, my husband warned me. Early on, in it, but he knew that um, he he loved me in the beginning. I'm I'm sure he really did. But he's he's a robot, my husband, except when he's drinking, and I, I think that's why he he drank because the first three years of marriage, he was telling me everything, and I come from a very strong Protestant Southern culture, which. You know, when you're talking about shooting people like ducks, it, 
I, I, the only thing I can relate it to is my brother's going duck hunting, and that's what George would tell me it was like. Uh -huh. Killing is just, you know, it's nothing. There's no emotion involved. You just, it's, you, you just get rid of somebody. And he said he was an existentialist and that these murders were necessary. And, you know, it, very matter of fact, and I'd sort of go, uh-huh, yep, and we'd be, we'd be eating dinner. And I was trying to get him to be, to, to know Christ, you know, to, to sort of understand a little bit about uh. my, my background and America's background. But he, uh, his group are, they are not Christians, they're, they're what he calls existentialist. Uh -huh. And they study uh, German um, Clausewitz and Nietzsche, Sartre, Camus, uh, Montesquieu. And his thesis at Princeton, which was written for him by a very good friend of his named Todeve, who was a French count, um, and his thesis was on this. Hmm. And it was, supposedly it was in French, but my French is better than his. So he could not have written that by himself. I know that. I know it was written for him. But in the intelligence world um, and in the communist world, in the um, world that my husband was in, um, one had to know French because all of the, the terrorist trainers and the, um, the guys who were funding all the guerrillas and everything were in Paris mm. and New Orleans. They, they would go back and forth. Still, the 4th Marines is, is out of New Orleans. And that's been going on a long time, ever since Disraeli, uh, even before, I think. But they had hit squads and... Um, you know, undercover groups in New Orleans. And George would go to New Orleans, all the Marines. I mean, they, this is where they train, do terrorist training, Lake Pontchartrain and places like that. Okay, and then this would be during the 1980s? Um, yeah, 1980s. Okay. From the 19, I think New Orleans has been uh, a school for a place where um, debauchery and murder and cults and flourished. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, there's a New Orleans connection with the the J.F. Kennedy assassination. Well, you see, Oswald, my husband and Oswald were in the same club. General uh, Jim Joy is in that club. General Louis Buell, who is my husband's benefactor or whatever you want to call it, um, is in that club. There is a. Um, in fact, I've got the name of. Um, they're, they're Russians in that club. Yeah, feel free to grab any uh, reference material. Yeah, you've got or what, I, what I want to tell you about General Al Gray, my okay. husband was the chief of staff for um, General Al Gray, who was the commandant of the Marine mm -hmm. Corps. And I probably shouldn't say this on the tape, and you all can uh, mm -hmm. get rid of it, but he's a homosexual. Gray. Gray. Okay. He's a, what they call a cherry marine. Now, I'm not anti, um, I'm trying to find my, um, I hope I've got it. Yeah, here it is. Um, the now this the term Vietnam cherry, War. Cherry Marine, cherry is that Marine. A, that's a common phrase that, <laughs> in the military. <laughs> it's, see, the thing is, I, you know, they're guys and they're girls, and I just came from such a, uh, a real prudish culture. Yeah. You know, That's fine. You came from a normal culture. I, and, and I'm not, not judging them, but they... Um, the Vietnam War, I know a lot about that, about the Max Sog program and the Phoenix program because George was involved with a very important part of that. Not important, really, but he... Um, he and Al Gray and Louis Buell and Michael O'Boyle and um, Ollie Whipple um, were, do you remember the Mangas and the um, Pueblo? Was it the, the... Oh, the seizure of that little ship? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. This was, it's, it's run by the mob. 
then. It was, it was a mob military uh, partnership, joint. It was a joint operation in Korea and in Vietnam. The highest levels of the Marine Corps and the Army in those special operations levels, the, the individuals are actually in the mob. New You're Jersey. talking about the mafia type mob? I'm talking about the Brooklyn, New Jersey mob. My husband, Al Gray, Sheehan, they're all Brooklyn. Cap, Cap Weinberger, um, the Heinz Kissinger, there's the Boston mob, which was shipping weapons back and forth to Northern Ireland. Um, and I don't want to get too deeply involved in that, but it goes, Israel some of the, the Zionists who came over from Germany, according to my husband, were, um, see, he works with those people. The, they do a lot of money laundering in, in the banks, cash transactions for the drugs that they're bringing over mm -hmm. uh, through Latin America, the, the Southern Mafia, the Dixie Mafia, which is, now my husband's involved with in, in Miami. The military are all involved once they retire. They're, um, you know, they go into this drug and secondary weapons sales. And um, before I forget, I want to uh, find the name of this um, Russian who worked with uh, Al Gray, who was my husband's boss, and I'm trying to see where I where I wrote it. Um, I may have to look and find that another. It's no trouble at all. How are we doing over there, guys? Sound good? We're, how much time is uh, rolled on the clock? On your clock? You can speak. So. Twenty minutes. Twenty. Okay. Good. I, I can't find it right now. I'll find it. Right. Um, the uh, Vietnam was really important uh, because a lot of experiments were done on boys who went over there. Mm -hmm. I had since my husband disappeared and since I they have been um, psychologically um, trying to destroy me, financially trying to destroy me. Uh, because I'm telling the truth, the, his first wife, I know, was murdered. Okay. She was, um, according to a psychiatrist whose name I probably won't give because he's an honorable man, um, I was given permission before I went public mm -hmm. with Sarah McClendon at the press club anonymously, but they knew who I was on, on the uh, 3rd of July, 1996, was when I came out with a s small group of people. Um, but before that time, they, they were trying to handle me, to try and uh, get me to be quiet. They tried threatening me and so forth. Um, and I'm trying to remember where, where I was what I was going to, the point I was going to make. Um, I can't remember now what I was going to, ah. okay. it was something important. Oh, yeah, General Jim Joy. Yeah. Um, I called General Jim Joy on the phone. I was trying to find where my husband was because I didn't know whether I'd have any money to, you know, food to eat or what. He just walked away and I knew that the Marine Corps knew where he was. But I was being handled psychologically. Um, on the 4th of March, my home was broken into. They had elaborate plans to handle me. The 4th of March, 96? 1996. 96. And keep in mind, he had disappeared on the 28th of December. Of 96. Of 90, yeah, 96, 95. Okay, uh-huh. So put yourself in my shoes. Um, I have no idea where he is. He's done this before, but, and each time I was totally traumatized. Um, so I get... Well, what happened during this break-in? 
Well, they were looking for the diary, which I have here. Okay. Um, I don't have the original copy, but th this is the diary. Okay. Can you lift it up? So yeah, can sure. Yeah, just... This is, this is it. It's his Beirut diary. Kind of hold those. So yeah. Mm -hmm. this, this is it. Okay. And it's in his handwriting. Um, the Beirut diary tells how the um, intelligence community, the um, Army and Marine Corps assassins, snipers, are uh, how, how they operate in a city during a crisis. My husband was the, the liaison between the White House and President Jamal. So he, my husband is a friend of Scrocoff, McFarland's a Marine. All of these men are personal friends of George's. Colby, I spoke with personally on the phone. Two weeks later, he was murdered. Um, he went to Princeton. My husband knew him. He knew my husband. Um, he told me, uh, Colby told me that... Now this is General Colby? No, this is William Colby, who was head of the CIA. Oh, okay, yeah. Who was murdered in a... Uh, So-called building I, accident. I know exactly how that happened because, you see, the SEAL teams, SEAL Team 6, mm -hmm. uh, 4, 6, and 8, are on the East Coast, and then the odd numbers are on the West Coast. And some of the people who are affiliated with the SEALs mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say that. I'm not going to say it. But well, I, I should, it, it wouldn't be hard for a SEAL to, to come from underwater and tip the boat over and make sure the man's dead, that sort of thing? The Israelis train with the SEALs. They do a lot of wet ops murders okay. over here because of some sort of arrangement. The, the young boys, I met um, three young assassins on a bus going up back and forth to Sarah as I went on the bus mm -hmm. because they were sabotaging my car so often. So I uh, sat next to two young assassins, one from Romania, one from Haiti. And I let them know that I understand, you know, how it is. And this little boy cried. The, the, I, wouldn't, I won't mention which, which one it was because it may get back to him. But he told me it was the same scenario. His mother, he lives on $850 a month. Now, these are mercenaries working. The taxpayers are paying mercenaries. The taxpayers are paying young men who are not citizens of the United mm -hmm. States to kill innocent people, women and children. They get on a flight from Norfolk and Oceana. Mm -hmm. They fly to Stuttgart. And I was told this, this is, this is what they do. Then they go by a special helicopter to countries like uh, Turkey, like um, the part of Iraq to uh, uh, um, Algeria to parts of Africa. And they do wet ops. They'll just, you know, murder 5, 10, 20 people. And then they blame it on the Arabs or they blame it on somebody else. But it's actually NATO rogue assassins because there are Men from Australia, uh, South Africa, uh, Britain, that I've been able to determine, and a lot of these other little countries that are, are sort of wanting to get into, um, into NATO, who are, they have little boys that they pick out, and they call them special. They use the word special, meaning elite, irregular, in order to entice these boys because they don't have much ego. Mm -hmm. So if you call being a criminal, in other words, they are protected. They know that they are above the law. That's what mm -hmm. they, my husband's above the law. Judge John Moore is above the law. Colonel Barry Cantor, my husband's JAG colonel lawyer, is above the law. Um, 
Grover Wright, Marine Corps, all of these, a lot of these guys who were judges had their wives gotten rid of. Judge John Moore had his first wife uh, thrown into a mental institution before he became a judge. He battered her. He, and, and I spoke with a, a man who has a purple heart, who, two people who knew Hannah very well. And Hannah Moore was deeply in love with her husband. He got back from Vietnam. He was an army ranger. He battered her. He physically and psychologically abused her. And she started screaming, you know, doing what I, because I was battered and bruised. <coughs> A lot of wives are by these, these Vietnam vets. But if they're a colonel or if they're a rising star, the wife has got to be crazy because you, they've got too much invested mm -hmm. in these men. And it's a very small cult. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, I have heard the things that they do when they're colonels. It's some of the same things that they do in cap and gown, which is the Princeton version of Skull and Bones. My husband went to Princeton after he went to the Hun School for four years. Okay, now we should probably um, clarify a little bit about, you mentioned Skull and Bones, and many of the people wouldn't be familiar with that, and the cap and gown. So what, what are, these, uh, are these clubs that these young inductees are pulled into, secret societies? Secret societies. And, um, and again, is this to make them feel super special? Yes. And also put a control on them yes. so that you never tell these secrets? Yes. Uh -huh. That's it. You have got it. You know, I've, I've heard um, a lot of child molesters. I mean, people yes. who are not connected with the military, just plain old child molesters, will molest a child and then tell them, now, if you ever tell, you know, they'll take a cat and strangle it and kill it or something. This is what I'm going to do to your mother. This is yes. what I'll do to you. Yes. Bad things will happen if you ever tell. That's right. And children grow up uh, believing that I must never, ever tell. And they don't, generally. That's right. Unless someone comes along to help them see the light come out. Yes. And what happens is that you have the cover-up. There are so many stories where the story of this Satanism and this child abuse starts to come to light, and immediately the lid goes on because the system controls the various aspects that can keep the lid on. This is just one example. It's endless numbers around the world. The Franklin cover-up. It was an investigation by this guy, John W. DeCamp, who was former state senator in Nebraska. And he started investigating this guy, Lawrence King, a major Republican who sang the um, American National Anthem in um, 1984 and 1988, I think it was, at the uh, Republican convention. And it, he was investigating him for financial fraud through a, a, an organization called the Franklin Savings and Loans. But then he discovered that he's running a pedophile ring and, and, and providing children for the biggest names in America. And he wrote this book, The Franklin Cover-Up, Child Abuse, Satanism, again, they go together all the time, and murder in Nebraska. And what happened? Some of it got into this Washington uh, Times, a mainstream newspaper, the connection to the Reagan-Bush administration, but most of it was totally covered up. I've been writing in my books now since... 1998, that Father George Bush is a notorious pedophile, child torturer, child killer, and serial killer of adults as well. Said it on American radio, still waiting for a response. And, and, and this, this is one example, a, a lady who became a friend of mine, Kathy O'Brien, who was in the American government mind control project since she was a kid, and uh, met, met her many times. She still corresponds with me now and again. And I've met a daughter that she was talking about. Lovely, lovely girl. Totally shattered by these people. And that's one example of millions and millions that are going on around the world. And this is what she said in a book, Transformation of America. Kelly's bleeding rectum was but one of many physical indicators of George Bush's pedophile perversions. I have overheard him speak blatantly of his sexual abuse of her on many occasions. He used this and threats to her life to pull my strings and control me. The psychological ramifications of being raped by a pedophile president are mind-shattering enough. 
but reportedly Bush further reinforced the traumas to Kelly's mind with sophisticated NASA electronic and drug mind control devices. Bush also instilled the who you're gonna call and I'll be watching you binds on Kelly, further reinforcing her state of helplessness. The systematic tortures and trauma that I um, endured as a child now seem trite by comparison. They're not, I know what she went through. Uh, to the brutal physical and psychological devastation that George Bush inflicted on my daughter. And that's just one of these people on, uh, uh, involving one of the victims of this. It's incredible, the scale of it, and it's going on in this country. And what happens? The wall goes up. This is what De Camp found. Suddenly, ranks uh, are pulled in, and the media won't touch it, the uh, uh, social services won't touch it, the police won't touch it, politicians won't touch it. It's the blueprint. It's how it works. And uh, the Discovery Channel program, produced by Yorkshire Television, was about to go to air um, exposing that Franklin cover-up and the, the, the pedophile connections, bingo, it was censored and pulled just before it was going to air. Never to see the light of day, although you can get it on the internet, because one copy survived. Okay, that tells you a little bit about the cults and the satanic cults and the preschools. By the way, um, Dr. Roland Summit, psychiatrist at UCLA, has told me that he's also involved in these issues that he has intelligence information and otherwise that there are more than 50 preschools around the country where they claim that there's been sexual ritual abuse and tunnels are located under the schools, over more than 50 of them. The uh, McMartin family traveled all over the world because they were experts in putting preschools together, organizing them, showing them how to build the schools and so forth. There were more than 5,500 children went through this McMartin School from the time it was built in 1966 until 1983 when this uh, incident was alleged to have taken place. Um, <clears throat> the cults use these two, three, and four-year-old children for two, several purposes. Number one, they use them for pornography, pornographic films. There's a lot of money, ten billion dollars a year uh, pornographic business in this country. They use them in their initiation they consider them initiated into the cult, even though their parents don't know about it. And uh, they, uh, they use them uh, as, um, uh, as um, part of their ceremonies. In other words, they need children in certain ceremonies. Um, now, in, I've, been, I've been asked, I've been told, well, now, don't tell me the kids, if they witnessed a human sacrifice or the sacrifice of a baby, that they wouldn't go home and tell their parents about it. But I'll tell you what a little girl in the McMartin case told me. And she, actually she told her mother and her mother told me. She told her mother that <clears throat> she witnessed these sacrifices and that on one occasion after her mother dropped her off in the morning and before the mother picked her up at night, she was taken to her bedroom, back to her home. They went into the house. They sexually molested her in the home, in the bedroom. They left a little token there. They took her little baby kitten took the kitten into the school and had a ceremony and sacrificed the kitten in front of her. Then they told the little girl, they said, if you talk to your mother or your father, we're going to do this to your mother, your father, and your little brother. Now don't tell me that a kid's going to talk under those conditions. They're petrified. They also talked about men coming in and sexually molesting them dressed in uh, police uniforms, dressed as Santa Claus, and so forth. I'm sorry to say that the Bureau has changed. There's no question about it. The FBI today, in 1996, is being used by the politicians to further their gains and their goals. So there are a few things that have happened to me, some major matters that have happened to me since my retirement. And most recently, I was giving a lecture in Las Vegas, and I sat at the head table next to a gentleman. And this gentleman in his day had been in naval intelligence, and he was telling me that on December the 4th, 1941, three days before Pearl Harbor, he was in the communications room in Washington, D.C., a naval intelligence officer, and we received, the U.S. government received a communication, an intercept of Japanese uh, uh, message that had been sent, or, and we had broken the Japanese code, 
And this message stated that we were going to bomb Pearl Harbor on December the 7th. He was very elated to have received this. He passed it up to his superior. His superior passed it on. After the war was over, he came back to Washington, D.C. and was told he was going to have to testify. They had a congressional hearing on this. He was given a subpoena. His boss called him in and said, even though you have a subpoena, you're not going to testify. And he said, well, I don't understand this. He says, look, you don't understand now, someday you will. You're not going to testify. And he didn't testify. Now, it's been documented, and I've heard it on a number of occasions, that we knew about Pearl Harbor in advance. This is the first time I've had information directly from a person who was aware of this. I also received some information recently in my tours and lectures and what have you. I did a TV show in Long Beach, California. One of the gentlemen involved in the show was in the U.S. Army at one time. He told me that in the spring of 1973, we had bombed all of the North Vietnamese uh, supply lines. We had mined their harbors. They were cut off. And one of his associates was in the communication room in Saigon. And this is, of course, a classified job. And when he was in this room, he received this message from the North Vietnamese. We surrender unconditionally. He passed it on to his superiors, and all Army personnel were immediately ushered out and replaced by State Department personnel. It was shortly thereafter that Kissinger met uh, with the North Vietnamese officials in Paris, France. Why do these things happen? Why did we not take advantage of the advance notice of Pearl Harbor? And why is it necessary for us to uh, be a subservient to North Vietnam when we obviously have won? I think at the end of this lecture, you may have the answer. In fact, I'm sure you'll have the answer. I think you'll understand much better than you do and have in recent years. And you see, my husband is frightened to death. I believe that his brother was murdered to keep him in because he had gone through four years of this mind control. And the, the man who did it, I'll, I'll, you can see this on the video, his name was Charles Caddock and another man named Alexander Robinson. Okay, Charles Caddock. Caddock. And the other one? Alexander Robinson. Alexander Robinson was a Marine, very well-connected uh, Presbyterian family, mm -hmm. <clears throat> whose um, family member was the influential one who brought over the Saudis. The original Saudi head of Saudi Arabia was very, George told me all this um, about um, Mohammed Faisal, Khalid Faisal, and Saud Faisal, and there were something like 32 brothers of, of the, the then in the, in the mid-50s, the, the ordained you know, whoever was head of Saudi Arabia. It was actually the United States who chose that person because the United States, through Charles Caddock and that group, murdered the, the good one, the one who was, who, whom everybody liked, who was well-educated, and who was normal. In, I believe it was 1952, 1953, 1954, in Paris, the universal Saudi, the well-educated Saudi, was poisoned. And what was his name? Charles Caddock. Um, I don't suppose it's all that important, but anyway. I'm trying to remember. I think it was um, Fahim or I... Uh, he, he died in Paris, and so his brother, his half-brother or whatever, who was the father of all these 32 boys, and the three oldest now were snuck into the United States. I'm, I have a degree in history, Virginia history, undergraduate degree, and master's in Scottish history, and being a Southerner, we always look at, you know, past his prologue, and um, and I jumped into the Saudi Arabian books to try and find out something about the Hun School, which is in Princeton, started by a physicist connected with Einstein and that group. So I was looking for the Hun School because I knew they went there. 
and they're in all the brochures. They're very proud to say, you know, we have the Saudi royals win here. President Cheeseborough brags about going over there and being wined and dined, and you know. So I, uh, I only found one reference, but it was a reference that said something like they went to a, a prep school in the United States, is all they said. Well, it was the Hun School, and my husband was one of the playmates. Um, Charles Caddock was the bodyguard, quote unquote, teacher mm -hmm. for these guys. So they would go out and play in the woods, and they were doing homosexual things with them. You know, I mean, they were, there was a lot of money, they bought a big house. Yeah. And so. Okay, now, I, I, I was momentarily distracted. Okay. Uh, explain to me a little bit about this, um, the whole sexual event here. Well, George, for the first three years of our marriage, was drinking entirely too much. And he, he was trying to let me know about his world. And I'm not judging him. He's, he's a bisexual, Okay, And he, need, he needed help. He needed help, he needed still love, does. he needed Christ. He yeah. still does. Mm -hmm. He really needs help. And the handlers knew that I was changing him. I was taking him away t from this crazy mm -hmm. cult right. that he'd been in all these years. And I mean, we were going to church. He even walked down the aisle one time when Tony Evans preached at Scope. I mean, he was overwhelmed. And at Scope? No, at what is Scope in Norfolk. It's a big auditorium. Okay. And so, um, but he was a little boy when he was, it, it's mind control. Uh, uh, MK Ultra, somebody said. They had a group of men, psychiatrists in New Jersey. I don't know where this place was, but they would go, and his, even his roommates in Princeton told me about it. George never, in, intentionally, he never introduced me to any of his friends. So I had to cold call all these people. I got their names and addresses, telephone numbers. I called all these roommates at the Hun School and at Princeton. Mm -hmm. They told me things about George and, you know, holding hands with, you know, with Caddock and other people about being a cheerleader and going off and, and so forth. Now, a cheerleader, this is a kind of a, a, a trade name, right? No, he was a, he was a cheerleader for the... Um, the at Princeton? At Princeton. Okay. And he traveled with the football team. Okay. And here is a guy like that. They put him in the Marine Corps. I don't think that was very nice. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. It was hard for him. But But it was part of the part of the, the, the long term vision. Absolutely. They wanted him long term. And it's because of the Saudis. This is what I believe and what his roommate believes. Um, he had a roommate uh, at Princeton who was also at the Hun, who's a dear, dear, wonderful uh, his, his mother, his mother is, is an Anglican. His father was a Jewish doctor from Brooklyn. And um, Jack is a deer. And we, we talk to each other a lot on the phone. Um, George sort of, you know, dismissed him because George was getting in with a, another crowd. George got into cap and gown, which is the same kind of fraternity. I mean, it's a, an eating club at Princeton uh -huh. uh, for intelligence officers. It's, it's cap and gown. Would they have anybody <coughs> involved that wasn't intelligence oriented? Uh, football players and so forth. But I have a feeling that um, cap and gown has a lot of intelligence officers and uh, boys who may have been raped. Of course, they'd never talk about it. Right. But um, I know that the initiation is they get very drunk. And even in the Marine Corps, they do that. It's called dining in. They had the shellback um, ceremony. They, they do a lot of um, homosexual 
enticement. The boys are, when they, when they come in, when they're new recruits, they strip them nude, they violate their personal parts. Um, there's a lot of that is going on, even now. What about uh, now. Uh, tail hook? Yeah. Is there a connection? Yeah, sure, because this, the, the cream of the crop is, is doing this. They're having group sex parties. And that was a that was a Navy operation too, wasn't it? Yeah, and the, but the Navy and the Marine Corps. Of course not. Maybe we had maybe we had a for those <laughs> that's that, another that, that tail hook. They don't know anything about the tail hook. Was uh, refresh our memories. Well, tail tail hook. In fact, I I when I was single in Norfolk, um, I I know one of the people who was deeply involved with Tailhook, who is, was the captain of the Saratoga, was very much involved with this kind of behavior, um, and um, I know a lot about the, see, I never, I never put I never thought about group sex. Th this is so awful for me to contemplate that these orgies are going on all over the Mediterranean, that the captains, lieutenants, the men who rise to the top are the ones who are picked to play the games, the pool parties, the nude pool parties. And they have the secretaries who come in. I've talked to three guys and, of course, my husband. Mm -hmm who who went to these parties but they what they do is and this is general al gray who was the main prime mover mm -hmm. um they would go to a place like esle rose where charles caddock this teacher who inducted uh -huh. got my husband into it he retired in one of these all-male party houses in on the mediterranean i mean that's where he and my husband kept up with him all through the years and, and but I, the, these sex parties and orgies, they're all homosexual in nature, or well, is there some heterosexual? Off, they start off with, with the wild secretaries. It's kind of, you know, my husband did, did those in Indonesia. He did them at a place in, in uh, uh, northern Virginia with his first wife. I did not know any of this. Mm -hmm. I knew absolutely none of this when I married him. He told me he was loyal to his wife. He wanted me to think he was just apple pie because yeah. I'm, I'm just a one man, woman. Right. When I when I took that oath to marry him, right. love, honor, and obey, that's me. Um, but he, um, when he was married to his first wife, was just an, an addict. He was a sexual addict, an alcoholic addict. He loves, you know, terror and. His, his whole little soul was just being sucked away from him, desperately. And he really, he needs Christ. He, he, needed, he needed me day in and day out. He did not need to be, what he's doing now is, is running more of these operations. You know, as you describe this, I, I can't help but think of Bill Clinton. Well, of course he was. He was one of those profile boys. Uh-huh. But the difference between Bill Clinton, and I'm not saying Bill Clinton's better, but Bill Clinton did not go, he didn't know anything about the assassinations. Bill Clinton, when I was living with Sarah McClendon, the senior White House correspondent who saved my life, because she said, Mrs. Griggs, you get up here to Washington right now or you're dead. You're going to be dead. And I still feel as though I probably will be. Um, I'll certainly be financially ruined. Um, they are still doing uh, psychological operations in my home, sabotaging my car, messing with my tel telephone, my radio. Um, you cannot believe what I've been through in, in the last two years. It is, it is horrible. And it's being done to other women and other wives and other men who don't go along with the program. They are murdering Marines. They're murdering sailors. These are the tactics that they use. 
Um, they criticized the government, at least some of these people, that, some of the people that they, they pulled out of the woodwork in order that they would be accepted in uh, patriot circles. And then uh, these people criticized people like me, and they think they can be accepted, and it discredits me. Now, is this COINTEL Pro program and this disinformation program on the internet, has it affected my life? You bet it has. Because I'm not being invited to these big conferences anymore where I could give a lecture in front of three, four, five hundred people. This is exactly what the rogue, covert, criminal government enterprise wants. That's why they do it. So uh, what's, the, uh, what's the reward for me? Now, I want, I'm going to tell you what's happened to me in the last 30 years. And I'm not telling you this because I'm looking for pity or I'm looking for sympathy or anything. These are facts. Okay. <laughs> anyway, what's happened to me, I've had uh, three contracts on my life. Okay. I've had two other probable contracts. And I will give you just a little detail about the contracts that were put on me so that you will understand it's not just talk right off the top of my head. Um, I might mention that in two of these instances, through divine intervention, I did not go home. Uh, I lived in uh, 500 South Kelton in Westwood. This was, uh, uh, this was in the 1980s, or mid-1980s. And I had a, a door, I lived in a triplex, and my door opened up onto the street. The landlady who lived behind me on the, on the second floor came home one morning, 1.30 in the morning, and here's two guys sitting across from my front door in a car. And one of them gets out and walks over to her, do you know where Ted Gunnarsson lives? And I told her, if anybody ever asks about me, you don't know me. And of course she said no, she didn't know him. Well, she told me that the next day. And I made some phone calls and I learned that there was a contract on me. And uh, fortunately, I do have some good sources, and it's kept me alive. But what it really has kept me alive is on that particular night, I didn't go home. I stayed at a friend's house at the last minute. So I say it's through divine intervention that I didn't go home on that particular night. So. One of the, my contacts says, I used to work with, and he gave me his name, who is known as the cocaine king of the West Coast. Let me go talk to him. Let's go talk to him. So there were one, two, three, four of us, and we went to talk to the, quote, cocaine king of the West Coast. And we go in, a fellow comes to the door, lets us in. We had an appointment, it was on a Monday. He escorts us into the parlor, and then he takes us from the parlor into another room, and we sit down, and a little dog comes in about this big, and smelled all of us, and sat down at my feet, and went to sleep. And the, quote, quote king, king of the West Coast comes in, looks at the four of us, my dog likes you, I like you. And I'm saying, well, I'm sure happy about that. <laughs> to myself, of course. So the cocaine of the, of the uh, West Coast um, tells the other three to scat out of the room and sits down with me. And he says, how many children do you have? Well, I know what the message meant. You know, if you screw up, I, you know, your kids' lives are in danger. And I told him, then he pulls this artist's conception. He had a copy of the artist's conception. And he said, who gave this to you? And I said, if you're going to do harm to him, I'm not going to tell you. I'll take the heat myself. And he was kind of miffed about that. He said, I didn't say I was going to do anything. So I said, okay, promise you won't, and I'll tell you. So I told him the story about the accountant and so on and so forth. And uh, he said, okay. He said, let me make a phone call. I'll be right back. So he left the room. And... He came back, he says, you're right. You got a hit on you. I can take care of one of them. I can't take care of the other one. I said, well, I got two hits on me? Yeah. So I said, well, take care of the one and I'll see what I can do about the other one. And uh, 
So he left and came back again. He said, okay, I made a phone call. Uh, don't go home or to your office until Friday. This was Monday. So I lived in a hotel room that whole week with a gun under my pillow. And I didn't move. I paid cash for the room. That was before you had to furnish identification. And it's kind of interesting because every time somebody walked down the hall in the middle of the night, I would wake up. And it was after that that I, uh, by the way, that hit was taken off, uh, thanks to him. He called me later and asked me to do a favor uh, about six months later, and uh, I won't need to go into that. But the point of this story is divine intervention. I didn't go home that night. A friend of mine said, stay with me th this night and, uh, you know, we'll go from there. And so in the, anyway, I ended up uh, driving to, I had some friends drive me to Dallas. I remember I slept in the back of the car, in the back seat of the car, for like 21 hours a whole, that's how long it took to drive to Dallas, because I hadn't had any sleep in a week. And then while I was over there, I'm saying to myself, I gotta get rid of this other head. This is all New World Order stuff. This is all Illuminati, okay? They put hits out on people all the time. Don't bat an eye. So I'm over there and I get a call from a fellow in Los Angeles. Come over, I wanna to talk to you. And this particular person um, had some pretty good contacts because he knew about my situation. He knew I had two hits put on me at the same time. And uh, long story short, this particular person was able to take the second hit off of me. That was just one. Another occasion, 1986, um, I said to myself, you know, I've had enough cops and robbers in my life. I'm getting out and I'm gonna go in business for myself. Divine intervention, again. The good Lord wasn't gonna let me get out of this work that I'm doing. And I invested every dime I had and I lost it all. And so I had to go back in to private investigation work. I didn't have to because I had a pretty good retirement check. Um, so, this fellow, I was living with uh, my business partner and his wife and kid. My business partner went overseas, went to Argentina, I think it was. And uh, I was, uh, he was gone for a while. And then my daughter had a road trip and I house sat for her. And on that particular night, uh, an individual, and I found out later his name was Bill Menser, known as Charles Manson II, came into the house about 11 o'clock she was on the third floor, it was a tri-level, and heard him coming in, and uh, the dog went bananas, she closed the door, went to the telephone to make a phone call, didn't work because the phone down in the kitchen had been taken off the hook, and uh, she sat there and waited it out, got her gun out, he didn't come upstairs. Again, I made some phone calls, and I didn't go home that night because when my daughter came back from her road trip, I was staying at her house and we decided to watch a movie at the last minute. So, divine intervention. Absolutely no question about it. And the other two probables are, I don't need to go into them, but uh, there was a, a fellow who was hanging around my P.O. box for quite a while and I'd have to send somebody else in to pick up my mail. This is all, this is all New World Order, as I said a few moments ago. This is all what they do. They kill people. And Kucinich, not Kucinich, but, um, I forget, his, uh, the, the congressman, huh? Ron Paul? No, there's a congressman from Ohio, that, I think it's Kucinich. Well, so. well, yeah, he uh, has asked for an inquiry into the CIA hit teams that are operating in this country today. Okay, he's asked for an inquiry, but nobody's paying any attention to him. Uh, that's just one. I had, uh, I can't tell you how many illegal burglaries, illegal entries I've had into my home. It's like Grand Central Station. They're in and out of there, uh, and it's unbelievable. Um, I took a trip when I was in Nebraska. I was gone for about three weeks. I came back, and I had uh, my research, 500 boxes of research over a period of years, stored in the third bedroom. They helped themselves to 200 boxes of my research. Okay, uh, they're in and out of my car. 
on a regular basis. I can, right here in LA, I parked down, up from her parking down, downtown, and I came back and uh, they turn, they do this all the time, turn the direction signal on. I, get, I, start, I start the car up and the direction signal's on. I had my car stolen twice. Um, I had my brake lines cut. Uh, I have had two windows shot out when I was standing nearby. Uh, they were intimidating me. They weren't real bullets, fortunately. Uh, they were air bullets. And uh, that's what they're trying to do, they're trying to intimidate me. I've been poisoned in Las Vegas, I was poisoned. And what they did there, they had, the only way they could have poisoned me is they had the condominium next to me and they were pumping uh, poison in through the air ducts. Um, I had my, let's see, my right front tire come off between, I was driving between uh, Omaha and Lincoln, 60 miles, 75 miles an hour, the right front tire came off. Highway Patrol came, looked at it, it was John DeCamp's uh, pickup truck, by the way. I had gone from Lincoln to Omaha to talk to a source. And the only way they would know that was by t uh, tapping John's telephones. And uh, I found out, the highway patrolman looked at it, he says, hey, your lug nuts have been loosened. And they tried to loosen the lug nuts on the left front tire, but somebody must have interrupted them uh, because uh, they weren't successful there. They wanted both tires to come off at the same time. My mail's been opened, diverted, and intercepted. My phone was cut off once. And I called the phone company, I said, hey, you discontinued my phone. Uh, why? And they said, well, we sent you a bill. You didn't pay it. I said, well, where'd you send it? They sent it to a fictitious address in Florida. Never heard of it. Um, I've had mail disappear. People write and written to me, and uh, I've never received it. Um, surveillances, are, huh? surveillances are almost a daily occurrence. And what I do is I, get a U, I do U-turns on them and get around behind them and chase them. And it, it, they, I, they try to intimidate me. Look, I've been... I was in a gun battle in Memphis, Tennessee at the airport. If they're going to intimidate me, they're not going to intimidate me. I'm not afraid of them. I've dealt with terrorists when I was in the FBI. And uh, I have a, uh, I remember when they, back in the, about 90 or 91, they put a, 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 a dirt bag out, just parked across the street, maybe four or five cars up. And I would see them there and I'd put on my gun go out and get in my car, drive by three miles an hour, stare them down, do a U-turn, three miles an hour, stare them down. Then I'd park in behind them. And they couldn't get out of there fast enough. One of them ran a red light. Then I chased another one and cornered him on, a, on the street, blocked him, and I reached under my front seat like I was going for a piece, and his eyes got big as saucers. And I was on a, a street where they went up to hill and down, it was one way, I went up and down and parked at the bottom of the hill, and then he started coming up and I was watching the rear view mirror. I could see the top of the car, and when he saw me, he stopped and backed up the wrong way in a one-way street. By the way, I've got some pretty good license numbers, a lot of license numbers that I'm saving. Um, my business has been sabotaged, Virginia McCullough. I've had telephone taps, I sued GTE, uh, back in the 80s, got an out-of-court settlement. I've had threatening phone calls. I came back from a trip once, uh, and I got up in the morning. I was looking for a file on a desk, and I had a phone call, 827. The voice said, male voice said, did you find your file? Click. They had a hidden camera in my house. I was gassed on the free, attempted gas on the freeway. They gassed my uh, webmaster. Clarence Fal Malcolm. Uh, I've interrupted two attempts to steal my car. I've had flat tires. In one instance, I had three nails in the same tire. That's a little more than a coincidence, I think. I've had my gun stolen. I had four guns stolen out of my house in Nebraska. Uh, I uh, sleep with a gun under my pillow. I got a third combat magnum. And one day, this is a couple of years ago. I check it regularly. I checked it and somebody had come in and taken the bullets out of it. So if they came in on me, I was going to have to throw the gun at them, I guess. Um, cameras, they'd taken pictures of me. 
Um, I've been, uh, my webmaster was hit with uranium-235. I know for a fact I've had a trash cover on me. Uh, the, uh, my computer has been sabotaged. I've been expelled from the Ex-Aden Society. Uh, I've had, I've talked about my plans, the disinformation program, McCullough, Horowitz, and so forth. Those are just the life of a person who dares to take them on. Also, I might mention that uh, in the early 1980s, I had four investigations on me, I know, because I applied through the Freedom of Information Act. And one of the reports came, they, they sent me back. It wasn't anything significant, a couple of pages on a report. And they said, in the interest of, quote, national security, we can't give you the full file. But it's kind of interesting because one of the reports at the end has said that I, they consider me armed and dangerous. Okay, well, I am armed and dangerous with knowledge, right? Um, thanks. Thank you, sir. Pam Fawcett. They put a girl on me, Pam Fawcett. Um, DEA and the FBI. I dealt with her on the phone for six months. She was in Modesto. Tried to set me up on a drug deal. And she called me one day and said, I need to talk to you. She came down, I met her. At, at, at the time, I think it was Hughes Market or Ralph's Market across from the, uh, uh, this place on Ventura Boulevard, the Sportsman's Lodge. And she told me that, uh, the whole story about how they had tried to set me up through her and drugs through her. And I said, Pam, why, why are you coming over to my side now? She, I, I had the names of the FBI agent and the DEA agents who dealt with her. She said, uh, and I was trying to help her on the phone. I tried to help her with her 14-year-old kid. He got in trouble down in Florida. And uh, she said, I woke up the other morning, and I realized you're the only honest son of a bitch I've talked to in six months. Those were her exact words. <laughs> Pam took a polygraph, passed it, and uh, last time I talked to her, she said there was a hit on her. Oh, here's Kucinich, Dennis Kucinich, that was it. This is in American Free Press, April the 6th, 2009. Dennis calls for a probe of U.S. hit team. So, what do we have? Well, we have the NSA and the FBI have teamed up with AT&T and Verizon to spy on U.S. citizens. This is all documented. President Bush reauthorized a secret program more than 30 times to spy on Americans since September 11, 2001. U.S. government and NSA has tapped its entire internet system. FBI can hear everything you say even when cell phones are off. The code word for this program is Quantico. All pay phones at Grand Central Station in New York are tapped. The Bush administration began spying on Americans seven months prior to 911. The president authorized our intelligence agencies to uh, database every citizen in the U.S. seven months prior to September uh, 11. Uh, Project Endgame, the rounding up of 775,000 Americans by the shadow government began on February 24, 2009. Two of my very closest friends, very frankly, have disappeared. I don't know what's happened to them. We have thousands of guillotines that were shipped in here from Japan um, in Atlanta, Georgia. We have 500,000 caskets that hold 40, 40 bodies in each casket. We have 1,000 internment camps around the country. We have censors on the major highways every quarter of a mile. I talked to one of the installers. You're right here in California. Censures. But that keeps track of your car. Censures, yeah. Did I pronounce it right or wrong? That's right? Okay. Yeah. I went to school in Nebraska, so I have an excuse sometimes, okay? You have the Patriot we have the Patriot Act. I don't tell you about the Patriot Act. I mean I'm sure you're aware of that. Okay? The Constitution violations and the, the amendments that they've done away with through the Patriot Act are, you got them here someplace, all of them, <laughs> probably all of them. Um, yeah, here they are, the Sixth Amendment, right to a speedy trial, Eighth Amendment, uh, no cruel and unusual punishment, 13th Amendment, punishment without conviction. 
It took 262 Republicans and 77 Democrats to kill the Bill of Rights. This is all part, as I said earlier, of the terrorist movement. I told you about the guillotines, the caskets. We have U.S. troops in the United States, Holloman Air Force Base, Air Force, German Air Force. A girl, a lady came up to me back in the 90s and said that she was from New Mexico. She deliberately dated a German airman from Holloman to find out what they were doing here. He said, when the revolution starts, we're going to strafe the cities. Beatrice, Nebraska, where I lived for a short period, uh, town of 12,500. They have an air, uh, uh, on, the, on the base there, they have an airport. The airport is more, the runway is more than a mile long. Uh, there's no commercial airplanes come in there, it's all private. They are extending, ex expanding the length of the airport. Why? So a bigger plane's gonna land there, I guess. But there's no commercial planes coming in, over a mile long now. The chemtrails, one of my sources told me that uh, the planes in the north, midwest, are, plant chemtrails are uh, out of the Air National Guard, Lincoln, Nebraska. I made a trip to the airport and I found four giant airplanes with no markings on them on the runway at the Air National Guard. Another informant told me Fort Sill, Oklahoma is what they're using in the southern southwest of the United States. Uh, okay, that kind of gives you, I think I laid the foundation pretty well, didn't I? Yeah, okay, that just tell you what they're after, okay. I'm not the only victim. There's thousands of Americans out there. By the way, I've been shot with a laser beam twice in my back. Fortunately, they're not very good aims. And my, uh, my webmaster, Cl uh, Clarence Malcolm, has been shot also. Of course, one of the best ways for you to stay alive is yes. to do what you're doing. Really? Reduce this, oh, absolutely. Reduce this to video. Get this scattered all over the country. They won't touch you because if you're dead, that validates everything you're saying, see. So, well, they poison people. Publicity is the best thing you can yeah, do. Yeah, um, one, one of the things that was happening to me after, oh, I must tell you about General Joy. Um, I found his name all through the diary. And what was really strange was that George had mentioned him earlier, early on in the marriage, but then after a certain incident at um, Camp Lejeune, which I think is very interesting relating to tailhook and something that I did there. I'll, I'll tell you about that if I can remember. Um, I called, it took a lot for me to get General Joy's phone number uh -huh. because the Marine colonels were not going to tell me because they knew I was investigating. Uh -huh. So nobody would tell me about General Joy. I called a person in George's address book who was a general, pretending that, you know, I was updating my Christmas card list. Yeah. And I just wanted to find Jim Joy's telephone number. He said, oh, he's up there. He's running morale, welfare, recreation for the world. You know, a payoff job with uh -huh. the mob. Uh -huh. and, um, and he's uh, living outside of Quantico. And here's his phone number. So I call him up. And keep in mind, my husband is infamous Princeton graduate chief of staff for Al Gray who runs all the dirty tricks for the army you know Linda Tripp worked for Carl Steiner who was a partner of um, you know Jim Joy and Carl Steiner and my husband were the triumvirate in Beirut okay. and Linda Tripp worked for uh, Carl Steiner down there and this would be approximately in the I think in the in the eighties. She she and her husband were both Delta Force duos. They they send them but then they divorce, so that broke up that. Mm. But she she's a she's a dirty tricks person, Linda. Anyway, so I call General Joy and I say, General Joy, um, this is Kay Griggs and um, I'm George Griggs' wife, you know, chief of staff under Al Gray, 
head of half the world, dirty tricks, special operations, wet ops. And he, he goes, uh, no, I don't believe I know your husband. Exactly his words. Huh. And I'm taping it, by the way. Because uh -huh. they, they, they took my tape. They started coming in and doing, putting sticky stuff and running my, you know, just mind, mind jagging me. Putting sticky stuff. On the tapes. And they would put the tapes on different, you know, they would go to a lot of trouble. They would take things that I said on one tape and put it on another. And, it, I mean, it was, they were having fun with me psychologically. Uh -huh. um, but I taped this conversation with, with General Joy. And I said, well, that's, that's really strange, General Joy, that you don't know my husband because um, I'm sitting here uh, on my bed and I'm looking at my husband's diary that he kept the whole time he was in Beirut. And you're, you're in there on, almost on every page. You know, you're in there a lot. And you're going over to Cyprus and Rome and you're, you know, getting money for weapons and you know, and then they're going to Tel Aviv, and they're doing this and that. And, um, and you know, I said, you mean you don't know my husband, George Griggs? And you're a Marine, and he's a colonel? He went, oh, that George Griggs. Because he knew I had the diary. I see. Then he said, uh, oh, Ms. Griggs. Let, let me call you back. Let, let, you, let me call you back. So he had to confer with General Sheehan, General Joy, General Gaiman, General Hartzog, and his little cabal, particularly General Gray and General Krulak. So he called me back, and he was just like a little puppy dog. He said, oh, Ms. Griggs. I'm going to be in Norfolk uh, on the, uh, let's see, the night of the 5th, 6th, and 7th. I'll be at a morale welfare recreation meeting at the Marriott Hotel, and I would like to meet with you when I get there. You know, I'll be getting in around 5 o'clock, and I could meet, take it, we could go to dinner, or you could come and have breakfast the next morning. We could eat, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or 11 o'clock, you know, now mm -hmm. I have to sp speak at this luncheon engagement. You're welcome to, to come to that. Or mm -hmm. we can meet at. He went through every hour of the whole time. He could not have been more insistent about meeting me if he'd, if he'd been my father, you know, my birthday or something. And um, so. So you did meet. I did. But I wasn't, I was afraid of him. Because I knew this he was General an assassin. Joy. General Jim Joy, the one who got Noriega out of Panama. Mm -hmm. He and Sheehan, the one who was behind the whole operation in Panama. This is a powerful guy. He and Carl Steiner. Mm -hmm. Mutt and Jeff. Waco, they trained all the guys in Waco who went and did what they did to David Koresh. They're the ones behind all the black helicopters and Sheehan. They're the ones, you know, doing all the stuff down there mm -hmm. at Kathy McDaniel's down at, um, you know, in Fort Polk, Fort no, Hood. Something new on me. Kathy, Kathy McDonald, Daniels? Kathy McDaniel's had a little talk show. She's a wife of um, the daughter of the mayor down there at Fort Polk. Okay. The little town outside of Port Polk, and there were a lot of unusual things happening. And because she was talking about it, excuse me, they took her her radio show off the air, and um, huh. they tried to. It's a long story, but anyway. So General Joy, I got in contact with the NCIS. That's they, Fort they Polk in Louisiana. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but. I met with the NCIS guy and um, uh, and a Marine that I just met cold call because I was kind of worried about what would happen to me, um, you know, meeting him. So may I may I go to the ladies' room? 
Certainly, may. matter of fact, Steve suggested I've that we break. I've had to sort of go to the late. That's why I've been sort of antsy. Steve <laughs> suggests we break at five after, and, and uh, I think it's a good idea. Let's let's break and um, and we'll pick up right. We're just a little bit of a recap here. All right, a little bit about your background, uh, about the psychological profile that these guys look for. Um, Let's see, we're, we've discussed the, uh, the diary. We've discussed uh, Kadok and uh, Alexander... Um, Robinson. Robinson, couldn't read my writing, thank you. Um, and... Uh, I had a picture of Kadok. Yes, I noted that. We're going to inject that. <laughs> we'll inject. In fact, we should, we should have a little session here where we just go through pictures at the tail end yeah. of this. Yeah. Uh, pictures, picture, 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 picture. Yeah. Um, well, we discussed uh, tail hook and. Uh, uh, you know what tail hook means, don't you? No, what is tail hook? <laughs> uh oh, I got a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it a homosexual reference? Yeah, sure. Really? Sure. Did you sure. know that, Steve? <laughs> Isn't it something? Yeah. And the average person on the street has no idea. No. You know, it's like Watergate. Well, the Watergate Hotel, that makes sense. And tail hook probably is some reference to, uh, you know what I honestly <laughs> thought it was? Um, well, when, see, when you refuel a jet it or is, something. It is, it is. But you, look, see, the, the planes look like this. Because, see, I was told this by, by Jerry Unruh. And Jerry Unruh was a captain when I met him. We were just partying. You know, I had a group of gals, and we were mm -hmm. all school friends. And everybody hung around this place called Poppy's in Virginia Beach. It was the place. In the, in the mid 80s when uh -huh. I was at the Virginia Center for World Trade. Well, he, Jerry was in there. Um, he's an intelligence operative with uh, Scrocoff, Crow, you know, this whole McFarlane, Ed Wilson, who's a really good friend of my husband's, who's a really bad guy. Anyway, they're all doing, some of them are doing this Rush River Lodge thing, you know, which Angleton was doing, where Woodward would go these big orgy parties, uh -huh. and George went to a few of those. But this, you see, is the, the plane, and it kind of looks like that. Okay. And yeah. it refuels. Uh -huh. See, that's what the hook is for. That's refueling. called the tail hook. Yes. Uh -huh. But it has a double meaning. A double entendre, sure. Because the and I went to the preceding show two weeks ago, and they had the tail hook booth, and I have some stuff. I don't think I have it with me, but tail hook souvenirs, because they are really trying to promote uh -huh. that, you know, the charitable function of that organization. Yes, of course. Yeah. Now, the fact that that cover got blown on those tail hook uh, things, that Paula was a Coggin. major snafu, right? Uh, she had to try very hard to get that out. That was at Camp Lejeune? No, it, I think it was um, in Las Vegas. Okay. But, oh, my thing went on in Camp Lejeune before Tailhook, and this is why I got flagged. Oh. Because I stopped all the go-go dancers in the offices clubs, and they got very mad with me. Ooh. I can tell you that story. It's true. Yeah, but why, um, you didn't realize what you were doing at the no, time? No, I was just incensed, you know, that they would allow topless um, women, young girls, in the officer's club dining room while I was trying to eat late one night. And George says, well, you know, you just have to get used to it. If you think this is anything, you ought, you ought to see what goes on in Okinawa. Well, this was, this was uh, 91, 90, it was before Tailhook. And the Lord is always with me. Sometimes I don't know where he is, but this particular night, it was about 9 o'clock, and I was starving. And I was really mad because his reaction wasn't, um, I'm sorry, this, you know, this is offensive. Do you want to go in town to eat or something? He didn't do that. He attacked me. It was a chance to educate me the way they were educated. I see. Get yeah. used to it, bitch. You know, yeah. excuse my French. Yes, sir. But that's really what he was trying to do. Well, they were all young married officers. Now, I worked at the chamber, and this is taxpayer money. This looks bad. They had, you know, wedding bands on. And, and one of the guys, two of the guys goes out 
with one of the girls. So I'm going, after having said, don't you see anything wrong with this picture, uh -huh. and getting no background, I thought, oh, boy, I've got a camera in my pocketbook. I am going to see Marty and Oogie, my old roommate from St. Mary's, little Episcopal Junior College in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I said, whoa, little Lucille Ball comes out. And I just kind of grab that little camera with the flash, and I get me three little flashes of scattering people. So Just light. because the camera's going off. Yes. So that said to me, it proved to him, God, truth is light, light is truth. You know, hey, this isn't. I mean, God proved it. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it. I didn't argue. I just took pictures. They scattered. Then what happened? What happened to the pictures? Well, he, I, he tried to grab my camera. He? My husband. Right. But there were still some men in there, you see, and two of the girls. And they were looking at me like, you are, the girls were probably thinking, oh, you know, but the guys, they, they, they saw older colonel, chief of staff here, wife. It was bad from the perspective of me being a wife, witnessing this, being ordered to, to shut up. Uh -huh. So I took the camera when he wanted to grab it from me, and I went like this. I mean, it was real battle time, major. My brother was a championship wrestler, you know, and I don't know anything about holes, but I knew this was self-preservation time. And I just said, well, I'm going to the ladies' room, huh? Yeah. So I went to the ladies' room, and I hid the darn thing. And um, he wanted to know where it was. We had a major battle. But... The, the end thing that happened was I wrote a nice letter, found out the name of the manager of the club, because I knew protocol. I knew you can't go and just really mess everybody up. And I sent a letter saying, is this normal mm -hmm. to, to have it, to the club manager? But I sent copies of the pictures and the letter to the wife of the general commander of the base and the wife of the commandant. Oh, man. You wanted to get in trouble. With the pictures. Uh-huh. No, I mean, I... Oh, you thought you were... Gonna... Helping the wives. Yeah. The See? wives, at this point, no doubt, are privy to all this stuff, right? Yeah. See, I thought, in the real world, this is what you do. Somebody... Uh -huh. But what happened was I went home, and the wives were meeting there, and I, I told them what I had done, and Carol and Millis said, Oh! <gasps> You didn't do that, did you? George won't get promoted. You know, he was trying to make general. Uh -huh. But Louis Buell had already died. He wouldn't have made general anyway because of Sue. I already found out about that. But I didn't know that at the time. Uh -huh. so, but Charlotte Moore, whose family are better educated, and she's kind of the leader of the pack because she's, she's more rational than the rest of the wives. She said, Kay, thank you very much. We appreciate what you did for us. And then all the rest of them kind of, you know, they're like little puppets too. But then I found out from Brooks West that I was, I was flagged. That General Gray had me marked as a troublemaker. Gotcha. So after that, no more stories while he's drinking, you know, it, it, uh, it was a very, he was having to balance them and me, you know, he was, um, I think he was challenged by me because he, you know, he knew that I was a free spirit, he didn't understand Christ, he didn't understand what, what my boundaries are, but he, because he was a little bit intimidated by my, my sense of freedom and my, you know, openness, mm -hmm. which comes from a, a complete understanding of where Christ is in my life, you know. Mm -hmm. And I do, I follow in his footsteps. And, but I'm, I'm a free spirit because I'm created independently, as we all are. And um, he never had, my husband never had that ability to... Um, to be free from well, the time because, he was a teenager. Because early on, he was made captive to these other yes. uh, matters. Yes. Homosexual 
counters and the, the shame that that brings and the control. So he was a, a bent twig That's early it. on. Yeah. And he had the, the Saudis uh, were beginning to pile into Russell House at the Hun School in Princeton which is the school that my husband was, was in for four years on scholarship. He never saw his parents in eight years. Now think about this. His parents were shipped to California, I believe strategically so that they could control his mind. Okay. Um, he was too poor to fly out there. I think he did go one time when he was ROTC on a flight that took him forever and a day to get out there. Um, but he, um, he had a, uh, an uncle later on who bought a, a house in Princeton when he was in college. So he had a little bit of, of nurturing. And this uncle became his father. Okay. And this uncle's two sons and the next door neighbor, the next door neighbor became his wife. He knew he had to marry because of what he had gone through and it was, I think, so shameful and so hard on him that he, he married um, right at graduation day practically from Princeton uh -huh. University where he had four years in ROTC and he was in the cap and gown club which, uh, as I mentioned before, is an intelligence sort of uh, football kind of scholarship club. But what's interesting is my uncle, who was in intelligence, Ben Delaney, went through exactly the same hoops. I was thinking, you know, when I met my husband, this is, and it probably was God in, in many ways, but I thought, isn't it amazing that Uncle Ben, who was the football quarterback star for Princeton, the one year they won the whole national thing, he was, um, he went to the Hun School, his father and mother were both killed or something happened to them, and I think they were a fairly well-to-do prominent family. He was handsome, wonderful, just, just a neat man. So he went on scholarship to the Hun. And then, and he went in with crew and all these other things. He was in cap and gown. He was, uh, he played on the football team. He wasn't a cheerleader. My husband was, was a cheerleader. But they were, ex they were in exactly the same pattern. ROTC scholarship. They went left ROTC. They were dependent on the government, on the intelligence community, you know, selling mm -hmm. weapons to whatever country. I know the country, but in other words, they were doing um, work for the joint under the table all these years. Okay, and directly under whose, uh, whose instructions to sell these weapons? Do you know that? Yeah. Okay, who would that be? Well, uh, it's, it's the Israeli uh, Zionist group in New York. Uh, Mossad? No. Well, what were yeah, they but everybody thinks Mossad like they think CIA is just a bogus sort of thing. Um, it's really army intelligence that does just about everything. They, they run this, a lot of the psychological profiling, it, which is done at Quantico with the FBI. It's, it's all a very small group, Harvard, professors connected with, you know, the Tavistock and Dar es Salaam and there's a uh, sexual perversion group in Vienna and one in, in Colorado. I think that little girl was part of that experiment, you know, who uh, was John Bene Ramsey? Yeah, yeah, because I had some... Well, you know, that raises an interesting point because here's a high-profile murder that goes nowhere. No investigation. She's nobody's pinned. It just goes on and on and on. The parents are involved in that program. But somebody higher up level. is protecting them. Absolutely. And the same thing that you're describing about the military. Sure. If you're in the clique, you can get away with murder. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Murder, literally murder. 
Uh-huh. Um, and I had a, a group of visitors. I, I used to be set up by the State Department, my husband, who had power in the State Department through, um, through both Casper Weinberger and, um, well, his whole crowd. They, I mean, Casper Weinberger, George Bush, Colby, Casey. My husband was in that clique. He was mm -hmm. in, the, in the Princeton uh, Marine Corps clique. Rob, Warner, you know. You're talking all, Senator Rob. Yeah, they're all Warner. Marines. Mm -hmm. Pat Robertson, all fourth Marines. I mean, they're all involved in this. They know, it, they're running everything. Now, you mentioned Pat Robertson. You're talking about the 700 Club, uh -huh. Pat Robertson. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, there's a power thing there. And it's all male, it's all white, and they're, they do, they know the murders are going on. They're surgical, they're strategic, they're political. But um, uh, what I was going to tell you is I was used because I was the most gullible in high school. And I'm very, very um, spiritual, and uh, I love people. So, and I, I was driven to meet all these people from all over the world for some reason. Um, so they would feed me people because they knew I would react. It's kind of like Monica and Bill. I think they put Monica in there to have something on Bill. That's my own feeling. Mm -hmm. Sarah McClendon feels the same way. Uh -huh. Because and Linda Tripp was there to guide the situation. Absolutely, of course. Linda Tripp was Delta Force. Linda Tripp was trained by Carl Steiner, who's in the diary with my husband. Carl Steiner is called a snake, and he tried to trip up a uh, Schwarzkopf. I mean, he was trying to take to take the whole Iraqi thing over because they had been baiting, you know, using their the Israeli rogues in. Um, Turkey, they were having little zigzag wars. It's all to sell weapons. It's, it's, all, it's all about weapon sales. It's all about drugs. It's all about funny money. Making money. Of course. Mm -hmm. And the, the head, Krulak, who is the Commandant of the Marine Corps, his father, Victor Krulak, worked with this Russian, uh, Czechoslovakian double agent, who was uh, worked with um, Al Gray, who was enlisted at that time, rose right up to the top because they were involved with Butcher and this whole crowd um, that was um, trying to pick fights. Mm -hmm. and, and they were not, they were Army and Navy together, mm -hmm. joint. And um, George kept saying, George calls them the members of the firm. He calls them the members of the firm. I've heard the Brotherhood. Um, they're very close. And it's, it's a small group, and it's very hierarchical. I had Casper Weinberger's bodyguard farm me when I was at Sarah McClendon's. Now, farm you. Yeah, that's Beams a term that, that they use. Where they cultivate? They cult well, not cultivate, but just want to find out kind of. They're doing profiling on me. Women are hard to profile because we're, we're very easy. We, we're very easy if you understand women. And I think they need more women in human intelligence because um, we'd solve a lot of these problems like overpopulation or whatever it is very quickly. Because we, 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 we're the ones who teach the men how to talk, how to communicate. We think on 20 levels at once. You know, we're very spiritual. We're very practical all at the same time. And they make mistakes by pegging women as crazy when really they're very anxious to solve problems. They're just very frustrated to see a lot of wacko things going on that don't need to be going on, but the guys don't see it. So... With, with my husband um, uh, and so forth, I was used, um, they profiled me, they knew I loved international people because I'd already demonstrated that. And there was a group of sexual um, psychologists, psychiatrists from Vienna who came over. I have pictures of them. I was their escort. George was already gone. 
and I was intrigued that they were still sending me people. Okay, now you referred to them as sexual psychologists? Yeah, there's a whole, whole range of, of psychiatrists who study perversion, okay. sexual perversion. Harvard, um, Yale, Johns Hopkins, and this Colorado group, Dar es Salaam, uh, where they train the African, the black African uh, terrorists. Um, they train them in inter interrogation. They train the JAGs in interrogation methods and so forth. And a lot of these guys got their experience in, v in Vietnam. Intentionally, they took these little boys. That's what they're doing in Bosnia right now. They're training future um, leaders in, in perversion. Um, they have a school. They have a, the British have a school that George was working with in Indonesia for a year. My husband was setting up a, the, there, there was already a program on East Timor, a little place there in the mountains that had been set up by the Australians during World War II. It was involved, I think, with Burma and, you know, some of the, the killings that were going on in China and so forth. Mm -hmm. That Parker Host, T. Parker Host, this man who now controls my husband with, with Bob Edwards, um, T. Parker Host, this is how they got together. T. Parker Host, I knew when I was the assistant director of the Virginia Center for World Trade. I was the first woman on the board of the Foreign Commerce Club. I was uh, very involved politically, and I was having a ball. Um, and I met um, T. Parker Host through someone else. I was the chairman of a board of um, all these international shippers and brokers. I was just a, you know, sort of a glorified secretary public relations person. Now, T. Parker Host was the Finnish consul and the, um, he, at one time he'd been the Norwegian consul, the Icelandic consul. I thought he was a really nice guy because he was outgoing, he seemed Virginian. I didn't know that much about him. But it turns out he, he has one shipping agency when I meet him in 85. He knows my husband's profession instantly because he brags about being with the mobs. He, the mob runs the port of Norfolk. The, the, I, I mean, it's terrible to say, the bankers and then that. Then they have the, this is not, I can't say that. You can't say what? No. It's, the, the ports are run by, it's a homosexual hierarchy. Okay, it makes sense. That's, that's not you know, objection. Well, okay. And in Norfolk, it's Walter Chrysler, Phil Hornthal. You know, they have the rich ones, and then the, they get the little ones in by introducing them to the, to the big guys. It's like George met Einstein. Einstein was in that little, little ring that the Saudis were in. It was a very elite. No, Camus. you're saying Einstein? Albert Einstein okay. was, was in that little Princeton ring before he died. And okay. George, they, they partied mm -hmm. together. Um, anyway... So the Norfolk um, crowd runs the port. It's very organized and so forth. Um, and I knew the person who was running the Maritime Association Shipping Agency, very nice man who was that way. Um, but I didn't know it, you know. I, I went out with him. I like him very much. I mean, he's a very nice person. But I, you know, and I... And completely homosexual. Completely. But... But he liked me, and I thought he was wonderful. Many homosexuals are very yeah, he's engaging a very, people. very nice guy. Well, um, his best friend was T. Parker Host. Park, he lived with him for a while. Well, I didn't think anything about Parker because, you know, he'd been married and had a couple of sons, and I thought, well, you know, this is just a guy who's moved away from Newport News for some reason and settled in Norfolk. I thought it was unusual. He didn't have any friends. You know, I didn't know. And, but it wasn't because of that. It was because Parker um, had some questionable um, associations 
with mob figures, with um, assassins. He was in the Burma Special Operations Command. He, he liked being living a dangerous life, and he bragged about it mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband and he gra gravitated to one another. And um, I thought it was wonderful because my husband didn't seem to have any friends. So I sort of fixed him up with Parker. <laughs> well, Parker's the one who did me in, <laughs> you know. Uh, <coughs> Parker plotted, and it's a long story, but basically, and this sounds petty, but I wouldn't go out with him. And, and I'm not saying I did anything that was, it's just that he wasn't my type. Mm -hmm. Obviously. You know, well, I mean, not, but he just was, he's boorish, he's loud, he's uh -huh. kind of rude. So you're saying even just in a social context. Yeah. Just so what happened was, because my husband is so close to Bush and McFarlane and Scrocoft and all mm -hmm. these guys, Parker starts getting in with my husband's friends and cultivating them. And he goes from having one shipping agency to dot it all over the place. He goes from being a Democrat in petty little Virginia politics and being the Icelandic Finnish consul to having big shipping deals going through Iceland and Finland and Norway. And my husband's setting up deals in Moss, Norway, which I was the president of the Sister City Association. I was being used while my husband, while they were setting up, you know, shipment places, transshipment places. I mean, I was wit witnessing all of this, and it all came back to, to me, just boom, like that. But Parker, it was so interesting. We had a hearing. I had a hearing with my husband. That very day, George Bush was in town. My husband was in town. My home was broken into while I was in court. Very strategically, I was called by a Marine colonel named Jack, who is very involved with the maritime shipping business, and he knew that I know a lot about that. He called me and invited me as a guest of his to attend the George Bush um, huge banquet with John Warner while my house was being robbed. My car was sabotaged that day. And guess who introduced George Bush? T. Parker Host. Now he made it to the big time. You know, Alexander Haig is another one. You can help yourself to any coffee Thank or anything you. about that. Um, yeah, he's a friend. Alexander he's Haig, he, he rose from nothing to top dog just overnight. That's because he's in the club. Oh, of course uh, he's in the club. Now, how he's in the club, you see. Now, all these guys. Henry Kissinger, Heinz Kissinger. Oh, I have a story. This. Well, oh, we all suspect Henry's a queer. Oh, but yeah, I have a, a first, I have a first-hand story from Bob, who was there in Cambodia with Heinz. Okay, you call him Heinz. Henry. Yeah, okay. Heinz. His real name is Heinz Kissinger. Okay. We'll straighten up. We got a light that fell down, boys. Did you notice that? Um, we we got to be alert to notice all these little things. Um, and that's very hot, by see, the way. See, Hag, Hag was an just, army. Just a second. Let's, let's get this straight here because right. that, that is a hot light, and uh, you'll burn your fingers if you don't touch it. Uh, by the way, as long as we're kind of in an unofficial break here, um, did you have to read my note while I was writing it? See, just part of it. When, when I was writing it? Or only when I held it up? When you held it up over here. Okay. Well, I was starting to write, I, I wrote, widen her a bit, mm -hmm. and then I looked up, well, lo and behold, he's done it. So I thought, well, he maybe could read this over my shoulder, that's cool. And then, oh, oh you saw it and interpreted. I've seen you. Good. You could read it from here? Oh, that's yeah. cute. This is, oh, y'all are wonderful. What a team. And, and the, and what a that's team you are. You, you could, that. thank you. Yeah, yeah okay. Right. Actually, all you got to do, if you write it, just tip up a little bit, I'll... Okay, because the thing of it, when, when she's illustrating something and using her hands, well then seize on that and open it up so that we don't lose the lower part of her hands. You know, not far enough down to where, um, you know, strategically we, we get out of focus, but just, uh, that's cool. All right, uh, we're back, and uh, this is good. Uh, let's go back to, um, 
See, uh, we want to talk about Henry uh, Kissinger, but uh, also I, I introduced the, the idea about uh, George Bush. Um, three, two, one. Now, so George Bush, I mean, all these people r rise up through the ranks, uh, the same club. Right. No wonder, you know, I saw a little TV clip one time where a reporter was asking George Bush and others about the, uh, the Order of the Skull and Bones. All these guys were shocked that somebody even mentioned the term, and they, uh, uh, they just would not discuss it at all. Right. And the reporter said, I understand that, that uh, as part of the oath, you, you don't discuss it. And George just flat out said, it's just not to be discussed. And that was the end of the yeah. subject. Now, that's because, I mean, if this really got out, that these guys are all inducted because they've got some kind of homosexual right. thing on them. Indoctrination. I mean, yeah. or induction. They yeah. have to do that. Yeah. They do that. Uh-huh. Yeah. In if a coffin. And, and it's even now coming into the military totally. The chiefs do that. They put them in the coffin. They do the bowling ball trick. Okay, you're going to explain this. What happens when you get in the coffin? Why do you get in a coffin? Oh, they, they get... When, when you get your eagles, that's uh -huh. a German thing. Okay. You know, it's what the German high command did, and most of them you know, had the boyfriends and stuff, mm -hmm. the croups and, and all of that. It is a German thing that they say goes back to Greece, and it's all the male marine-looking men that they, they do it with. Uh -huh. see? So now the chiefs have to do that. What they do is they get, George said, it's like a zoo. They... <laughs> They get everybody really drunk, and they sometimes call it dining in. Um, uh, shellback is another time that they do it. Not everybody does it, but the ones who do it, if they're young, they, they get right up to the top. It's a... Uh, okay, well, what actually do they do? They've got a coffin, they get anal inside Anal sex. Oh, oh, that. They, they do, they put them in the coffin, and they do things. Okay, they perform things yeah, on each other. Yeah, while they're all around there going drunk. And, and I see. So there, there's a guy in the coffin. Yeah, and he's the one who is... is the recipient of all the acts. Right, uh, right. Yeah. Probably say to conclude these are oral sex acts on this guy or something like yeah, that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Oral and anal, whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but, what, but what's the significance of the coffin? I don't know. I mean, it's the mystique but, about the skull and bones and What's interesting death. is the... Now, the young... SEALs, uh, Delta Force, um, the ones who go from Army to BUDS, the BUDS training SEALs, um, Bud, all BUDS, are, BUDS, BUDS is, is um, the emerging SEAL group. Oh, I see. They're budding SEALs. Budding SEALs. I see. And they have to break into houses. They, their training exercise is to break into civilians' houses. For practice. For practice. They, they broke into my house. When, when George and I were first married, um, I had many, many, many underwear. You know, this is terrible to say, but lingerie. I had lots of, you know, I didn't buy much, but it all disappeared. And then when the psyching was beginning, uh -huh. I had white blouses, but they would all have black dots on them. I'd say, George, here's another blouse with a black dot. It was just a little message. This is somebody's message, you know. Or I would, um, after George left, uh, it was batteries in a drawer. You know, you can't tell the police. I opened up a drawer <laughs> where I had six batteries, and now I've got 50 batteries. They're going to say, <laughs> well, of course you're crazy, you know. And uh, I started my little sob with a screwdriver. And, you know, I was always looking around for screwdrivers. Well, one day I come home. And there are about 12 screwdrivers on the table, you know, neatly placed. Well, you can't call the police and say, I've got 12 screwdrivers, you know. Um, you can't tell people that you've got black dots on all your, all your white blouses. <laughs> you know, your shoes are disappearing. And then, this is, this is really, I called the police the first break-in, which was the night of March the 4th, the night before I went to see General Joy at the Marriott. Yeah. Well, I had already called the police when I was battered because I, I was just bruises. I made O.J.'s wife look like Marilyn Monroe. I mean, you, you talk about. 
And I was doing this because I thought it would help him, you know, have 45s put to my head, and he's laughing. He'd strangle me and put his finger on my juggler vein, and he'd just say, now don't you dare move, you know, I mean, or I'd be lying in bed and he'd do a jap where he'd just push me off the bed. You, you can't believe what horror I went through to try and get this man to understand what Christ's love is about. You know, people say, oh, well, you should have left. Well, I took my marriage vow seriously. Mm -hmm. I knew he was injured psychologically by the war, by whatever he was made to do. So, I mean, I'm fine. I just sacrificed a lot. I was in a big wrestling match with a crazy guy, you know. But I still uh, love the little boy within. He's very troubled. But anyway, I called the police um, after a number of little break-ins. And guess what? Mm. The, uh, the policeman they sent was a little short guy with a short haircut whose name was Shorty Satterwhite. Okay. And Shorty Satterwhite was saying, oh, now, Ms. Griggs, now you're just making this up. Now you know Ms. Griggs. This is just, you're just having, you're just traumatized, your husband's gone, blah, blah, blah. I found out he was a 20-year Marine. Uh-huh. Huh. Okay. And not only that, but some other, there's another part of his life. But that's okay. I mean, he's uh -huh. a nice guy. Um, but he was a Marine. And he, he takes orders. Of course he does. Mm -hmm. He's still reserve. Mm -hmm. So I think, okay, I'll call the FBI. You know, I'll let them know what's going on. I heard about the FISA court and, and that they, you know, because I'm talking about William Colby, maybe they think I'm a threat because I know all these international people. So I'm just going to call them and tell them what's going on. So I called Torrance, who's the head of the FBI, and um, he's, he's too busy, you know, too busy. So he sends this guy, Dan McNally, out. And Dan McNally is a very nice guy, and he has this girl interview me, and I, I type out something about George's history and what I know. Guess who else is a 20-year Marine? Dan McNally. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that Dan McNally's best friend, and, and he's not married either, but that's all right, um, his best friend, who is from North Carolina and never married, is a best friend of Fred Hentz, who's the one who took me to this place, Mahi Maz, where I had the two death threats, who was graduated uh, from college in, the cla in flat 59. He was intelligence. He, his father was a German high... Uh, uh, part of the Kaiser's elite group. Mm -hmm. um, he was NATO colonel, which I thought was pretty neat, and that's why they, they knew the profile. Kay likes NATO people, because she's going to learn a little bit about another culture, you know. <laughs> and, and, his, his, and, and I'm not saying that because his, you know, his family were high command, but he was also a, an existentialist. And the okay, and again, for our, for our viewers that may not know the term existentialist, you mean? An existentialist, according to my husband, which he is one, Fred, hence all of these people are existentialists, they believe in um, doing whatever it takes. It, it doesn't matter what the law says. Mm -hmm. They will do anything necessary to get what they want politically okay. and economically and and whatever. In other words, um, killing a leader, killing five people, killing 20 people, according to, to George, is a lot better than war. This is the way they rationalize it. The, it you didn't used to kill women and children in war when, when the, you know, the British Army, when they were pure kind of, you know, you didn't go out and kill. Um, I think Dresden, they, they did do some of that, but that was... Um, that was Walt Whitman Rostow and his crowd. And he's a very dangerous man. 
because Walt Whitman Rostow is a communist. Okay, and in what capacity is he? Oh, he was one of the wise men in Kennedy's administration. I think he was probably responsible for the movement that got Kennedy murdered. I believe it was an Israeli group which did it with some of these rogues. Okay, now when you meant mentioned wise men. Is this an insider term? Wise too? men, yeah. Kennedy's wise men were guys like, um, uh, you know, the Harvard crowd. And he was trying to bring them in to change things around a lot. Uh -huh. Walt Whitman Rostow was the one who got us into the Vietnam War because he wanted to sell the weapons and stuff. He was he and Victor Krulak, who is the present commandant's father, Krulak was his lackey. Walt Whitman Rostow's lackey. Walt Whitman Rostow went with Taylor, General Taylor, and wrote the report that got us into the Vietnam War. And all the time that the Pentagon was saying, no, 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 he was a cheerleader for the weapon sales. He and Henry Kissinger. Mm -hmm. Heinz. He and Henry. Walt Whitman Rostow, Eugene Debs Rostow, these were communists, mm -hmm. named for communists. Eugene Debs Rostow and his, it's either his son or his other brother, runs the, the big Boston mob, the port there. His name is um, Nicholas Rostow with the Weld, you know, with William Weld. They've done all that drug business in Mexico for years. Um, they had that Russian, um, um, you know, the one who was murdered by the uh, assassin, um, Ramon. You know, he was a competitor, Stalin's competitor, and he escaped. Uh, very famous Tolstoy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tolstoy became a Christian at the end, and you can't become a Christian. That's a death warrant. So they they killed Tolstoy because <coughs> he was becoming too. I think now I don't maybe I don't know the whole story. There there's probably a lot more to it, and and I just maybe I see completely the wrong picture there. But but Tolstoy was murdered by this same Parisian Spanish. Um, Czechoslovakian, Georgian-Russian group, okay. which are all part of the former Abwehr. All right. We forgot to stop. Tolstoy is not the correct name. I know who you're talking about, but I can't think of it. Tolstoy is a writer. A what? He's a writer. He's a Russian writer. <clears throat> but the guy you're thinking of was murdered in Mexico. Yeah. It's not Tolstoy. Okay. What was his name? Good. Mm -hmm. It's a good point to bring this up because if we can correct that name and uh, don't go that wide. When I talk about going wide, I'm not talking about going anywhere near that wide because we got all this junk over here. We don't want the picture. Are you sure it that wasn't Tolstoy? I think it was. That is plenty for. That's just plenty for. I know he's a writer. Sorry about that. Okay. I know. It's okay. You're, you're learning. Right hand man of, uh, of uh, Lenin, and he defected and went to Mexico. Right. Went to Mexico and murdered him. I think it was Tolstoy. Could, it could be two Tolstoy, no, Tolstoys. Tolstoy is a very famous author. You don't think of Trotsky. Oh, yes, you're right. Hey, hey. <laughs> oh, got it, got it. Let's correct huh? that. Oh, thank you, thank you. Bravo. We're getting close. Bravo. You were, you were doing close. so well, and I thought we can't use this because it's the wrong name, and it's going to destroy the whole story. Good, and I'm sorry okay. good. Okay. All right, Trotsky. well, let's, uh, let's back up. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have five minutes to go. Okay. We can easily do that. Uh, and that is on this tape. What, we have more time minutes. than this, but on this, this tape. tape. And in the next five minutes, tell us what Max Sog means, because you mentioned it earlier. Okay. But I still don't know what it means. Let, but let's, let's get Trotsky in this piece right now while we're thinking about this, okay? So uh, let, let's pick this up with, um, you were saying about, uh, we were talking about the Wiseman. We were talking about uh, uh, the Rostos and William Weld and Mexico and the involvement of the 
Mexican government, and it's not Tolstoy, it's Trotsky. Okay, hold on a second. I won't even men necessarily mention that because that will be completely clipped and edited. So just go ahead and tell the whole story, but use the name Trotsky. All right. Okay, so yeah. go ahead. The, uh, Here we go. This uh, group, um, which is run, was run out of Paris, is still being run out of Paris, this revolutionary terrorist group, which is controlling these Marines and Army Steiner's group, they all operate together. Um, the, the man who started all of this program um, during Vietnam um, used communists who were in the Spanish um, communist movement. They actually promoted communists in the OSS, which was started by this William, um, anyway, Donovan. Okay. So they were promoting and using communists who were actually wanting to get rid of our form of government as a stepping stone to world domination. So this group now in the Army and in the Marine Corps um, has communists at the very top who are really, you know, existentialist, which means they, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in Christ, they live for the moment, they believe in sort of one world which has no religions in it. Right. Um, they're the ones who put Napoleon in power. They're the ones who put Oliver Cromwell in power. They're the ones probably who actually got, were behind the Roman Empire and maybe the Egyptian Empire. They put puppet people in power and they actually run it from behind the scenes. Uh -huh. um, now, uh, Trotsky as I understand it, was um, escaped from Russia. He had become a Christian, I understand, um, and was working with agents in the United States, uh, Israel. And he was considered a, um, a threat. So he had to be silenced, killed. Um, there's an excellent book which I have called The Mind of an assassin, which is about the background of Trotsky's assassin, a man, a young man named Ramon, who was trained, he was um, Soviet paid, I think he had experience in Spain, um, they organized it in, in um, Paris, I believe. And, of course, up to the present time, there have been assassins operating out of Rome, Milan in particular, um, Naples, and Paris. And these are all anarchists, um, all mob-related. They use mob funding. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, um, drug money to pay for the weapons, mm -hmm. which are brand new weapons. This, the Bosnia Bazaar, this is the reason we had the war in Bosnia. The war in Bosnia is simply a stage to train um, assassins to, to be a market for brand new weapons, to be a, a, a marketplace so that the drug money can be used. And the army runs the whole show. It's, it's totally run by the army. CIA is, is a bogus thing, you know, it's, it's training and doctrine command, it's NATO, it's SHAPE. Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, started by Eisenhower. It's a totally independent corporation. Its main function is to um, sell weapons and launder money. You talking about CIA? No, no I'm talking no. about SHAPE. SHAPE. Okay. CIA is kind of bogus. I mean, it's That's it's just there. a trade name for the, the media oh, it's to, to use. to confuse us. It's just to get us off the track. Uh -huh. It's all being done by Army people who are now joint, because the word joint comes from the, the group that brought over a lot, and a lot of good people came over, but they came over illegally um, from to kind of escape uh, 
Nazi Germany and stuff. I don't know that much about it, but I do know that the, the funding organization, one of the funding organizations was out of New York, and it was called The Joint. And Meyer Lansky, see, our mob, the organized crime, the Jewish Kabbalist group who don't believe in God, really. Well, they do. They look at God as a Kabbalah kind of thing, and the opposite of good is bad, and uh -huh. they have to get rid of all the, all the good people and kill them. And then, the, you know, I mean, they really do this. They're mm -hmm. killing people who are good on purpose, and they get brownie points in, with their little cult. But um, the, this funding um, group in New York, they would pay for passports which were illegal, and they, in fact, my grandfather was involved with that. That's how I know so much about it, because my grandfather was told to keep silent and um, not to tell anybody, but of course he told my grandmother, and my grandmother told me, and I've told my children. Everybody knows they, they brought in probably more than 200,000 Nazi soldiers and SS and, you know, wacko scientists and psychologists and, and all of them, most of them, had the German disease, you know, because it was their culture. The German disease? Yeah, the German disease is, is what the Pink Triangle boys were. Colonel Ron Ray writes about this. He's a Marine colonel who's a, a Christian who's writing about the, the Cherry Marines, the homosexuality in the group sex orgies mm -hmm. and so forth, um, which brought down the German government because Naples, which is where all of the Navy is doing their playing, I mean, today in Naples, these orgies are going on. It was where Krupp, the weapons manufacturer, used to take the German high command and they would go into the Isle, on the Isle of Capri, into the Blue Grotto. And they would have big orchestras and they'd bring in little boys, little Italian boys, mm -hmm. who would be raped. They'd give them trinkets. And, of course, the mothers gradually found out. And just like me, um, it was one thing when there was just one of me. Now there are a lot more of, of us wives who are talking and telling truth. And it took those, Ital those Italian women went to newspapers, in Italy, they wouldn't listen. But when they went to the wives of these guys in Germany, it brought it all out. It brought the German government down because they were duplicitous in it, you know. Um, but what they were doing was pedophilia. They were raping, bringing in little boys. They involved the Catholic priests, you know, who were bringing in all. Anyway, so, um, but what happened was this whole group came over to the United States. And they, um, it's, a, it's an old culture, but it is the reason there are a lot of things going on with children these days. Mm -hmm. And it explains why it's all being covered up, because if you've got police officers who are playing these games and they're going in the woods like to, uh, what is this place they where, I mean, even Eisenhower played these games. Even Mike Kemp out in, um, it's called the Hermitage. The Hermitage. Yeah. In California, where they all run, they get drunk and they run around nude in the woods and stuff. Bohemian Grove kind of That's thing. That's it, Bohemian Grove. Okay, Bohemian. rather than Hermitage, it's the, it's the Bohemian, Bohemian Grove. Bohemian Grove, That's the name of it. Uh-huh. My brain's tired. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and the one in, uh, there was a, a big one in Washington called Rush River Lodge, where they used to all go, and there are lots of places now. But the, the problem, as I see it, is that I think they're trying to destroy um, America and the basic Protestant Christian culture, because um, where you have a militaristic society, which is where the rules are only for those people. Um, and keep in mind that Meyer Lansky and, and Luciano, Lucky Luciano and the other man, they chose to go to Italy 
uh, Luciano went to Milan. He didn't, he wasn't banished mm -hmm. to Naples and Milan. The two top mob families went there because of the weapons industry. They're selling weapons. I mean, that's what the military is doing. It's, it's totally controlled by the mob. Look, look at this. Weinberger was General Douglas MacArthur's. He spied on MacArthur in Korea. Who was MacArthur's um, nemesis? Albatross. It was none other than little old intelligence. I'm going to tell every move you make, Weinberger. Young, but he did it. He brought down MacArthur. Every move MacArthur was going to make, he broadcast it through the chaplain, or his little intelligence network. And he got brownie points with the group because he brought down the big lion. When you get rid of a big lion like that, you get, you get a big job. You've done, you've done good work. And they needed to get rid of MacArthur because he didn't, he didn't want to keep the wars going. He wanted it over and, you know, um, it's like General Trefay, who took over after the Vietnam War was over. And he was on C-SPAN in uh, August of 96 with um, former Ambassador Whitehead and uh, a few of the other, Viet, uh, you know, the State Department Vietnam people. And General Trefay, he, was, he had been holding this in for years. <laughs> he was on C-SPAN. This man let it all out. He said, I took over at the end of the Vietnam War. I was in control, right? Big general, charge. So I say, cut off the shipment of weapons. So I tell the Pentagon, cut off the ship shipment of weapons. He said, I got a phone call from Henry Kissinger saying, the weapons are going to continue at the wartime rate. Sure. Now, that's when all this stuff with China started. It, well, it started before then, because already the communist agents, the New York, Brooklyn, New Jersey mob, were already training Mao. Mao was trained in, in uh, Paris. So was... Um, you know, the one in uh, Cambodia, what's his name? Um, I can't think of his name. The one who was Paul Pot. Yeah. They were homosexually, bless their little hearts, by priests. They were wonderful little boys sent there, you know, turned, which is the word, you know, when they believe their mothers and then all of a sudden the world's horrible and then they have these wonderful friends who are going to make them leaders. Yeah. They're turned psychologically and... It's a pattern, and so this is why um, it's so important to know what they are doing to innocent little boys in the Army and the Marine Corps today. Why? Why are they having them go together in groups and, and, and strip nude when they're brand new inductees? Uh -huh. Why do they do certain things in uh -huh. public in front of the group? And well, they why? even do that at, during the pre-induction physics? Yes. I mean, and they also had the doctor. That's why I didn't want to go in the Army. I knew there was something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they also turned around the other way uh -huh. after doing that. The other way, and they're upside down. And they do this anally. Uh -huh. Now, why do they do that in public? Why are the urinals all out in public, you know, without separate stalls? Yeah. If they're not promoting this. And then why is it that the ones who are this way rise up faster than the ones who don't? Because there's someone there noticing. Yeah, sure. Those sure. who are vulnerable. Vulnerable. I was going to say rising, but that wouldn't be quite appropriate. They're called rising stars. Rising stars. Rising. That's the word the State Department uses for those who are controlled. And when I was volunteering with the State Department as a, an escort in Virginia. I had this group called, I, I thought it up myself, 
Viva, Virginia International Visitors Association. And I tried so hard to get to be a part of the State Department family. But you know, I'm a Christian, see, I'm a Protestant Christian, and they don't want Christians in there. My goodness. You know, I would have guests and, and, and I would let them know I was a Christian and that I love them and Virginia's a wonderful place. And, yeah. But we, I couldn't be a part of that. Yeah. We, they sent me people, but you know, I never uh, was a part of it, even though I, I had lots and lots of dignitaries. Did you, ever any, did you ever have any uh, contact with uh, uh, Madeline um, uh, Albright? No, I, I lived with Sarah McClendon for about six months. Mm -hmm. And um, Sarah is a Democrat. See, I was a Republican all these years. I was married uh, for 21 years to a Democratic governor's grandson. It was an arranged marriage, and um, so I knew a lot of the high-level Democrats mm -hmm. um, who were really sort of conservative. It's hard, you know, in Virginia, they're very conservative. So uh, when I stayed with Sarah McClendon, I had become a Republican, you know. Uh -huh. And Sarah told me a lot of the things that were going on in the White House from her insider perspective, mm -hmm. which totally challenged my perspective on everything. You know, Ron Brown was murdered, for example. Sure. Vince Foster was murdered. Um, Forstall okay. was murdered. Tell you what, we're going we're gonna to break right here. Okay. Because we're just about out of tape, I think, on, on this in here. This would be a good place to pick up, though, uh, Ron Brown. Um, Vince Foster. I think Foster had a uh, Marine Corps background. Is that possible? I think so. He may have. I bet he did. Um, I, that would fit right in. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That would fit right in. Because yeah. Nussbaum's office was right across the hall. Okay, we can pop these tapes out, actually. Okay. And we're, gonna, we're fresh with brand new tapes, uh, the number two ones. Let's take a nice little break. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, your husband would get into these drunken stupors and yeah. he would start running his mouth and yeah. tell you everything he knew. Yeah. Um, what did you find was uh, some of the most stunning revelations that, uh, that came? Um, I, besides the, the fact that he admitted he couldn't be a Christian and was an existentialist and explaining what existentialism meant to him, which was startling to me. Um, the, the other uh, parts of some of the things he told me, which, which really startled me and frightened me, was his attitude towards murder, which he said was not murder, because he said uh, emotions are not involved. Mm. Um, his his cold, calculating view of the destruction of, of innocent human beings meaning nothing to him, having mm -hmm. absolutely no, um, no feelings about ordering others to do that. Now, did he ever carry out some of these murders himself, do you think? Oh, of course, yeah. Um, in fact, he told me about Malcolm Kerr's murder. Malcolm Kerr, who's that? Malcolm Kerr was a British double agent who was who worked in California. He was uh, one of these joint, uh, these intelligence operatives who worked for both sides. Okay. And he had been in California, but he was um, doing intelligence work in Beirut undercover. He was the head of the American University of Beirut, AUB, which is in um, Lebanon. Okay. Now, my husband was the liaison between the White House and President Jamal, the, the second, the brother of the first president who was murdered. Mm -hmm. um, my husband was involved with assassinations and operations. Okay. 
he was very upset with Malcolm Kerr because Malcolm Kerr refused, although they were already there, the Marine snipers, the assassins, who were under my husband and General Joy, and uh, Al Gray, of course, were hiding in the, in the dormitory at this university. And, of course, General Gray, General Krulak, General Wilhelm, now Charlie Wilhelm was there. He is now my husband's special boss. And they were undercover there. And they had Malcolm Kerr murdered simply because Malcolm Kerr would not allow the Marines to stay in the dormitory. Had I been Malcolm Kerr, I wouldn't have wanted uh, rowdy Marine assassins living in a dormitory with um, children, essentially, adolescent young children having set, you know, with their perversion and some of their, their behaviors. So he was, he was put away for that very reason, George told me. The, then there was um, did you, did Dale Did he give you Dorman. any uh, details about how he was killed? Um, no, he, he told me that he had to be gotten rid of because of that. He then said that, and oh, this is interesting. Mary Clark Yost Halab is, my husband is handled by her. She is a, an American double agent who was put on my husband's case because she could handle him. They had an affair, well, of course, while my husband was first married. Um, I found out about it because she called the house after we were married and wanted to talk to him. And I found in his papers a photograph of her and her bio, and all kinds of information on her, and her address in his address book. And I have, I want you all to see that on, in this movie. I, okay. I have a photograph of her. They had a long-term affair um, the whole time he was in Beirut while she was married to an Arab intelligence double agent who was underneath Malcolm Kerr. Okay. And who took over when Malcolm Kerr was murdered by them. So what you have here is a favor essentially done to Yost. She was Yost. She's from Louisiana. She, Baton Rouge, uh, New Orleans. How did she enter the intelligence picture? She recruited well, from school? She, yeah, she was at... Um, um, trying to think. I, I have her bio. Um, okay. English major, uh, written books on British literature, um, Phi Beta Kappa. Um, she went to the American University in Beirut. She married a, an administrator there who became, because of her position, you know, they love the mixed marriages. Um, he was mixed second. marriage in the sense of for the double agents. If you marry, if an agent marries an agent of from another, another country, yeah, right. they they love that. The uh, intelligence community love that. The State Department loves that. And I was mentioning um, earlier that about the State Department uh, when I was living with Sarah McClendon, helping her um, in in 1986. I went everywhere she went because she's the senior national uh, White House correspondent. And I went to the State Department one day because I was curious about why there isn't peace in the Middle East. And I wanted to go to what I thought was the Middle East Department. Well, I, there was a group of students and I got a, a press pass ostensibly to go in and mm -hmm. interview them. So I left them and f meandered up to the uh, Near East section. Mm -hmm. And I had quite a few hours. I thought they were going to, you know, say, what are you doing here? Because mm -hmm. all the doors were open. They had these little um, 
buttons on each door, you know, that they could have closed and you could have had to have known somebody to get in, which I think is terrible. To have the American people not know and not be allowed into the State Department without a special Sarah McClendon. If I hadn't had been living with the senior White House correspondent, I as a citizen would not be welcome at the State Department. Now, if they're interested in peace, and they're interested in, in that kind of thing, they're certainly not showing it by the closed door policy. Mm -hmm. So I went in, there were about oh, eight or 10 offices. I went in every single one. I was looking to find out who the um, leaders were. I knew about Aaron David Miller. I knew about um, David Satterfield, who really wasn't David Satterfield. His family were uh, Zionists who changed their name to David Satterfield, who was a Virginian uh, senator mm -hmm. back in the 30s, who had a wonderful name. It's like Jonathan Pollard. He took the name Pollard, which wasn't his name because of Governor Pollard. I was married to Governor Pollard's grandson for 21 years. They, they take the names of honorable people, and then they're not honorable. And, and what was his name previous to Senator Hoyt? He lived, um, uh, now Aaron David Miller, I think that is, possibly his name, it might have been Mule. And I'm not saying that just mm -hmm. because they changed the name, they're bad. Right. Um, but what I am saying that there is this idea that go ahead and change it and be somebody else, kind of a snake, you know, uh -huh. changing colors for the moment, not being honorable and truthful, um, saying my family is Rosinski. Heck, I'd be Rosinski, you know. I'm, I'm the eighth Catherine in a row from Scotland. It's ridiculous. <laughs> But my daughter's Catherine and my granddaughter is Catherine. We're just, you know, it's a family tradition, weird, mm -hmm. but we're happy with that. Um, so um, David Satterfield, the reason I went there was because in the spring I went to an, uh, a dinner. It was either a dinner or a luncheon that the um, World Affairs Council had in, in Norfolk. And he was speaking. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in peace, because as a Christian, sure. I want it. I know it's possible if people are reasonable. And this talk that, that uh, David Satterfield gave, there were probably 20 mentions of Israel to one of the Palestinians. He was extremely biased, arrogant. The arrogance is what bothers me, because you can't have peace, you can't have justice, where there's imbalance. Um, and even that comes from the Greek furies, you know, the, the, the female who holds the, the, the justice. Women understand balance and justice. And women know, mothers know, if you show favoritism towards one child, the, house is, that child, the other child's not going to be normal the rest mm -hmm. of its life. So a wise mother is, is fair and tries to be balanced, as most families do that are, that are balanced. Well, after having heard the bias and so forth, and then seen other people who were involved at the State Department in Norway when I was there, when my husband was doing some weapons deals with, with um, um, uh, Newt Igum and some of the State Department people under the table when we were supposedly going to Moss for the mayor and her husband and George were doing some deals. He's, a, he's sort of a pilot and, you know, there's a lot going on between Norfolk, Virginia Beach and Norway and weapons deals and so forth now because of what they set up in the spring of 95. So I went into the State Department um, Near East section and found there was not one single Palestinian, not one single um, Muslim, religious, uh, Saudi, you know, Jordanian, not one Christian Protestant, hmm. not one Roman Catholic, not one plain old American, whatever, from Corn Pump. Every single 
person in all of those offices were either Zionist, Israelis, whatever, and they had pictures all over the wall of Israel, Israel, Israel. They had magazines, Israel Today. You know, I was given a copy of one. Um, and there were yarmulkes, you know, mm -hmm. and in the uh, uh, Israeli writing. In other words, and I, I asked one of the women after having gone through about, you know, four or five of these offices, I said, because I was pretending like I really, you know, wanted, I was just kind of wanting to know where, where the Palestinian office was, you know. She said, well, we handle all of that. We handle all of that. And this so, is the State Department, the... Near East. The, the part that handles Israel, Jordan, okay. all of these. Egypt. Yeah, yeah. the Near East section. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was just totally dominated by... Totally. Israeli. Totally. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the spokesman, I can't remember his name, he was a, a Zionist the spokesman for the whole State Department. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that, and I'm not saying that Ma uh, Madeleine Albright is doing a bad job because I feel as though being a woman that she is definitely a lot more balanced <coughs> than Weinberger when he was there, Eagleburger, uh, Schultz, or any of them. Uh, because I feel as if she's trying to do it, but she's not strong enough. There needs to be a um, fairness in the State Department, mm -hmm. because all the weapons sales under the table are going to the State Department. That's why Ron Brown was murdered. Ron Brown tried for the first time to take away the unfair st uh, State Department monopoly on illegal weapons and drugs, drug deals. Because the weapons, the, the drug money is paying for the weapons. The, the brand new weapons are sold by agents of, of Israel or this. this now, is, this, is this a conclusion you've drawn based on your knowledge of this? Yeah. Gorbachar, Gorbachar, whatever the guy's name is. Bonifar. Um, Gor, yeah. Gorbanifar. Yeah. Gorbanifar. And one of the, it was either he, him, or um, my husband worked with him. Um, my husband was the one who uh, was chief of staff under Al Gray when North was moved from the Atlantic Command to the National Security Council. Ollie North. Ollie North. And when you work in the White House, you work under the Army. They, the Marines have no overlord as such. They are, um, they can float they can be truck drivers and still be 4th Marine, but they're run out of New Orleans, just like Oswald was. See, Oswald was homosexually recruited by Clay Shaw, David Ferry, that whole, you know, the New Orleans, Meyer Lansky, I don't mean, My, well, Meyer Lansky's guy, uh, Jack Rubenstein, who was Jack Ruby. Um, see, all of the funding for these operations go through the joint, the mob. And Oswald's mother had moved to New York and he had gotten under this Zionist psychiatrist. I can't remember his name. But they, he came down to, to check on him. He was brilliant, but he wasn't motivated. He wasn't told he was special. He, his dad died or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, his father was, was, was a... Uh, you know, I believe uh, a German soldier. But the, the point is, Oswald was a loner, brilliant, and a perfect candidate. He and my husband's profile are just, a, in fact, they almost look alike. Hmm. And um, You so mean their profile in terms of their background? Psychological Not profile. their physical profiles. Yeah, even, even their, they look a lot alike. Hmm. Yeah. And what's interesting is... They always that allege that uh, he had a double. Well, Couldn't you have see, been your this husband. is interesting. My husband, when I saw him in June, after his having lived with me that fall, he was different, a different facial, everything 
than the man I married. The man I married and the man I saw in June were one and the same. Had a fuller face, mm -hmm. um, the, the mouth, you know, the, the, the mouth was fine. But the, the man that I was with, and it, 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 I know that it, I felt it was not the same person. Now, I don't think he could have gained that much weight in just a few months. Um, because he was very thin and, you know, it, now I, I could be just, um, but, but women sense things. I, I don't know how to explain it. And I talked to a good friend of Marina Oswald's who, um, knows that her husband was a patsy. Um, and I talked to another woman in El Paso who was in the book, The Widows, whose husband was a, a German, or rather a Czechoslovakian, whose father and two brothers had come over here as mercenaries, like all of these young men are still doing mm -hmm. today. And the father sent for the little boy and his sister, leaving the mother back in Czechoslovakia. Evidently, she had had an affair or something, but she was banished. I think they do this on purpose, though, because I'm finding that the boys identify with their mothers. They don't bond so much with the fathers, and they are their mother's keeper in that country. Mm -hmm. Now, I've talked to an Indian who had this situation, a, a little boy from um, Haiti, and a young boy from Romania. Each and every scenario was the same. The mothers were back there. They were given five years to become an American citizen as they were mercenaries. They had to do things that made one of them cry on the bus. And he told me what, mm. what was done when they did a hit. They did, there was one man who did things that were just horrible and he said, I want to get out but I can't. And this is horrible to put young men who are strict Roman Catholics, you know, they've got that, that background, and mm -hmm. bring them over here and make assassins of them, or in other words, to, to turn them in a five-year period, and for the taxpayers to pay for this. These young men are training with SEALs. They may have a, a mother who's an American and a father who's French. Um, so they can go both ways. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're not under the, the laws of the United States, so they can go do the actual um, murders or whatever. And Oswald, in Oswald's case, um, if you remember, he was, uh, he didn't have any problem getting into the Soviet Union. Right. And he went into the State Department on a Saturday. The man who saw him was, was a Zionist. He didn't even meet anybody else. Special, elite. Then he went to this town where um, there were a lot of, um, you know, sort of a, a, an intellig Zionist intelligence elite group. The, the Georgian Russians had, um, because most of the intelligence people for a long time were Zionist. Mm -hmm. in, in the Soviet Union and in, in Germany and, and uh, I don't know, but I know that they recruited a lot of boys at Eton and places like that um, homosexually in England um, and then a lot of them went to the Soviet Union uh, after the doctor's plot or something that I think Stalin thought that the Jewish doctors were after him or something. so. In 1952, a lot of them had to go away, and uh, they had some sort of a, a change or whatever. But what's interesting is that a lot of this played into Georgia's, tied into my husband, because he was in the place, the Mecca, for the Jewish intelligence um, or the Zionist intelligence mm -hmm. people in Princeton. 
all of the movie actors, you know, the uh, movie moguls or whatever, mm -hmm. they started out in Princeton. <coughs> the psychological uh, operations crowd from the Nazi, the um, whatever, they came to Princeton. And, you know, of course, they, some of them went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. and, and they spread out from there, Oppenheimer. And, uh, I mean, you know, it's very interesting. That's where a lot of them were in Princeton. And he was there, uh, of course, um, well, I mean, he was born in 37. He lived in, born in Atlantic City, then they moved to Lawrenceville. But his grandparents lived outside of Princeton. So he had a tie with um, his grandparents. But then his grandparents wound up moving out to California, so he was really abandoned from the time he was 13. And of course, being under the influence of, of um, Charles Caddock, who was the bodyguard for the Saudis, a la teacher. And he controlled the power in the school. The Cheeseboro, Headmaster Cheeseboro, of course, gave Charles Caddock carte blanche. Why? Because the Saudis bought a big mansion called Russell House. Caddock was there with the Saudis all alone. And my husband was there. Part of the time, they would go on outings using Saudi money. I mean, my husband was taught to fly a plane. He was taught to shoot. They went on these, they, they would get nude and run in the woods kind of thing. Um, um, even at Princeton, his um, roommates told me that he would go out with these men. And when his first roommate said, because he was, he really likes George, and George is a really handsome, I think, a little older now, but in, in those days he was very handsome. And uh, his roommate f of the first two years and who had been at the Hun said that um, he had a relationship with a French teacher who was um, a count or whatever from Paris, who was kind of a teacher's aide, who helped him write his paper, and who knew uh, Camus. In other words, there was a group, this young French teacher, who liked my husband a lot and helped him with, with his thesis, mm -hmm. was also a friend of an older French teacher who was a very good friend of Camus. And Camus was coming over to see him Camus. when he was ma married. Camus is? Albert Camus is uh, an existentialist writer who believed in murder and, you know, um, sabotage and... The end that justifies any means. Yeah, and he was also an Arabist. They were, you see, Lawrence of Arabia, this group stuff was started by this small group of Kabbalists who were trying to take over the oil, so what they would do would be to find these sheiks and, and find whichever one would, would go along with whatever. Well, the Brits were more interested in um, finding somebody who was fair, you know, not necessarily like that. You know, they, but then there was a guy named Moose who was in the American State Department who tried to, they, they wound up, um, the Americans wound up poisoning this Caddock, got in with the the Saudi royal family, the, the older, the other brother, who wound up getting it. They had a, a house in Switzerland. Uh, the Saudi royals had a big, you know, big mansions on the, uh, as La Rose is the place where Charles Caddock died, I mm -hmm. understand. And my husband, according to the roommates, one in particular, who said, George never lost track, he always kept up with Charles Caddock. Well, Charles Caddock only died in, what, 1995, 1994. I only heard of him as a teacher in the first three years of marriage. But when was he writing Charles Caddock? He was writing him, you know, Charles Caddock and, and, and uh, Robinson, um, um, 
Robinson. I can't think of his name now. Um, you probably will tomorrow. Alexander Robinson. Alexander Robinson. Was a Marine, very handsome, young, went to the Hun School, and was in Saudi Arabia, in these places, came fresh from there to the Hun School. Columbia, went to Columbia University as a history major, which is a, a, an intelligence school. Columbia is a, a school where, um, you know, for example, Nussbaum went, who, who was across the hall from Vince Foster. Um, I believe Ezra Pound went there, but in other words, Ezra Pound knew too much, so they just put him in St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Right. And it was a wonderful Virginian who got him out. You know, in the movie uh, JFK, yeah. there's a scene where it shows uh, this homosexual. You've seen the movie JFK? Mm -mm. Oh, okay, well, I, I presume yeah. too much. But there was a scene involving uh, uh, Ferry and uh, who's the other guy in New Orleans? That, uh, David Ferry and, and um, Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw was OSS. He was also in intelligence, and he was homosexual. Yeah. And, uh, they did he, dress up. They were in that movie, yeah, in complete drag and a real weird of course. thing. And um, I'm sure that struck a lot of people as it's very odd that these people would be homosexual like that. But that actually the movie very. Um, I'll have to see that. Evidently, very frankly, brought that across. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what's interesting to me is this book, The Widows. Um, has four spies, double agents, who work for the United States and Soviet satellites or whatever who um, were murdered. And they work for the sort of the Navy and the Army. And one of them was a man who was murdered outside of um, the, the Army's uh, intelligence headquarters outside of mm -hmm. Washington and in a Holiday Inn, I think it was. And just before he was murdered, he called his wife back in El Paso and said, the Army is going to kill me. They're going to kill me. Well, he was murdered, and the Army did kill him. Now, this is a fictional account, or this no, really happened? No, it actually happened. Oh, I, I was saying the book The Widows is not fiction, then. Oh, no. It's, it's all... Golitsyn, the spy Golitsyn was in there. Um, there were there were a couple of others. Uh, Paisley, who was murdered almost like this other man, in a he, Paisley was murdered like William Colby. Paisley was also hanging around with homosexuals. He went to the Rush River Lodge. He that is the one. So did Bob Woodward. Bob Woodward, you know. The reporter. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Henry Kissinger was a well-known, um, totally a homosexual, not even both ways. Um, and so it, his wife is a marriage of uh, Oh, it's just a convenience. convenience. Yeah, and he might, you know, maybe he's discovered women in his late, late age, I don't know. But, um, no, I, I heard through the, the, a very well-grounded German that, that Henry's best friend's father told Henry to stay away from him, and that's why Henry left. The family were embarrassed, and Henry, Henry went to Britain where they did this, and then changed his name from Heinz to Henry. Um, and I interviewed um, a man named Bob, who's uh, an Army enlisted person who uh, told me about Henry in Cambodia. So he up through um, Cambodia, he was, he was actually raping young men. And of course, it, that experience destroyed the lives of, of these five young men, according to the source. Mm. I mean, he, he said he was crying, and this man is, was a perfectly wonderful, functioning, young married man who worked for a newspaper on the Eastern Shore and had three young children, went to, to Vietnam as an enlisted man, was put in Cambodia, which he said he was 
it was a lie living there, and then ran into Henry Kissinger, or Henry Kissinger ran into him and did certain things to him, invited him into his tent with some other men. It was horrible, but it was, you know, he said it's wartime and um, so forth. But he said, you know, it, I could have taken it mentally if it had been a bunkmate or something. But he said, when it's someone like Henry Kissinger who does it to you, you're ruined. He said, I could never, he said he came back home, oh, and this is interesting, and I really believe that, that Bob's right. He said, Kissinger said to him, if you ever tell anybody, if you ever mention a soul, this is the, it's the end of you. Don't you ever tell anybody. Well, when he got back, when Bob got back, um, he went to a special hospital, and they were going to keep him locked up forever. Bob. Bob. A lot of the other boys just, you know, I, my feeling is that that he was flagged the way I was flagged when General Gray and, you know, Wilhelm had me flagged because I broke up the go-go dancing mm -hmm. in the officers club. I was labeled a troublemaker because I thought it was wrong for married men to be going out with, with topless go-go dancers in the officers club dining room and I took pictures of it and my husband you know got really mad and so forth and these pictures today are still with you or they're missing oh no my husband what happened I had the pictures um, I risked my life because he tried to grab the camera from me I hid it in the women's bathroom and uh, he tried to get it from me we had a terrible fight that night he wanted the pictures and um, I mean I prevailed I developed the pictures wrote a very nice southern letter sent a, the letter wrote the letter to the uh, club manager saying I didn't think it was proper sent the had had three sets actually four sets the of the of the three photographs I took made and um, I sent a, a copy of the letter and the photographs to the base commander's wife and to the commandant's wife, and it stopped. But I, I was flagged, so <laughs> I know. And but this was before tail hook, and yet instead of being congratulated for helping family values, for standing up for the wives, for showing the Marine Corps the proper place to have nudity and debauchery is not in the dining room of Camp Lejeune, and my husband said, well. If you, this is nothing compared to Okinawa. You just have to get used to it, he told me. Now, I was a colonel's wife. These were young majors, and they were seeing me being talked down to. What do you think it did to them? It demoralized them. The Marine Corps was demoralized. The wives were demoralized, and I did, I did what was right, what Jesus Christ would have done. How can they call themselves Christians and condone how can Al Gray and, and Wilhelm and Cook and, and my husband condone this kind of behavior and flag me as a weirdo. Mm -hmm. So there's something, and I, that's where I'm standing. I'm standing on, on what I know Jesus Christ would have done. And if they want to, uh, you know, continue to hound me because I'm telling truth, well, that's, that's just the way it is, because I'm not going to lie and, and develop a different kind of personality just to please them. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, that, that, that happened. Well, certainly honorable. Now the, so then the, uh, the book, The Widows, yeah. uh, continues with... Yes. Uh, yes, and I contacted this woman. There was a detective who had to be hired she knew he'd been murdered. The Army covered everything up. She uh, had an independent investigator. And the interesting thing which happened was that she worked in a toy shop. This isn't in the book. She mm -hmm. told me this over the phone. This is Mrs. Yeah. Uh, his n it's like Klein. Well, at any rate. So yeah. Um, 
anyway. He's he's a. I'll, I'll think of it in a minute, okay. hopefully. But she worked in a toy shop, and they were scoping her out. And the this was just after the. Um, no, no, it was before he was murdered. It was before he was murdered because she said she told her husband about this. George Bush and his wife came into her shop and oh. were looking at her. Oh my. Now, I don't know what that means, but they don't live in El Paso. Why? And he was doing all of the Russian, Mexican, Trotsky kind of work for George Bush. George Bush. No, no, this guy. This guy was. Yeah. And this is while Weapon George sales. was CIA director? Right. I believe he, yes, I believe he was CIA director then. But the interesting thing to me was that why would he scope the wife? Why would he bring Barbara in? You know, did Barbara know? Was he just using Barbara as a, you know? But she was being observed. Hmm. And it was shortly before he was murdered. And, and I know that Parker Host, my husband's friend, has dealings with George Bush. So, um, I don't know. I know there's a lot to do with oil and Aramco and, um, you know, Texas and, and all of that. Um, I know it's very complex, but where I draw the line is, is murder and assassination and corruption and lies and deception and cruelty to innocent women and children and families just because they're not elite. Mm -hmm. Just because, now, Mrs. Bush is in the Colonial Dames. So is my mother. Colonial but Dames? What colonial is that? Dames. It's a, uh, Colonial Dames is a very elite group of uh, women, they, they think they are, who are descendants of George Washington's aides. Oh. And they have, they own George Washington's ancestral home, uh, Saulgrave Manor in Great Britain. They run, um, Wil they have Wilton in Richmond, which is an old house where Lafayette visited. I know there's a connection with Lafayette and the Masons. And I know there's a big Mason contingent in the warfare selling group, because the head admiral in Norway, um, Igum, no, I think it's, no, 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 not Igum, because he, he was, he's in charge of the prisons which have the drug lord. He's running the drug lord out of his prison, and he's a friend of Georgia's, Newt Igum. They were talking about this, as though I, I would know about it, you know. Um, and and he, lived, he has a house or a cottage right outside of, Kolsas, Norway, which is where they have their underground, one of their underground bunkers. Hmm. They have one in Narvik, and um, they do a lot of the cold weather training NATO does up there. But um, I know they're doing weapon shipments out of Norway. Okay, we'll call this a wrap for. I'm tired. <laughs> you have done a stellar job. Well, wow. you have done a stellar job. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, now we're on the clock. Um, who have we got here in this picture? All right. Let me just, just put this here. Uh, this individual here is, his, his name now is, is Rockland Williams. He's a South African uh, quote-unquote general who was uh, with the army of the, the White Army in South Africa, who was actually a double agent uh, for, the, for Mandela's forces. He's an assassin, a murderer, and... Uh, Did Jasmine tell you of any murders that he committed? Any people or any situations? He, he stayed um, there with us. Uh, he was a guest of the State Department, and my husband arranged... This is my husband here. This is... Um, a gal in our church, Carla, whom I thought would be interested in going along with us that day, um, 
because of the South African connection and Mandela and so forth. She's, she's a, another battered um, military wife um, who lost a child. And um, anyway, she uh, is a very bright lady. And uh, we... What this guy's name again is? Rockland Williams. He studied in Great Britain after this. Does he have any Got a doctorate. Name? Yeah. He uh, is very interested in Ireland. I think he's basically um, sort of part of that IRA kind of underground. Um, but his father, interestingly enough, um, came over to North Carolina as one of the um, sort of underground trainers, trainees, or during World War II, they had a, a number of training bases um, for uh, communists okay. in, in this country. And his father trained and lived in North Carolina, but was not from America, which is interesting. All right, now we're on the picture in the right, uh, an individual laying down. That's your husband? Yeah, uh, my husband was a a rageaholic. Uh, during Vietnam, he had to kill a number of people and lots and lots of people, and he was suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. And the interesting thing to me is that he cannot control himself when he is drinking or e either at odd times he goes into what's called a berserk state. Okay, so this is one of his cast out stages? Yeah, yeah. And yet he was chief of staff of the... Uh, yeah, this picture is um, of, of me and Sarah McClendon and General um, Carl Mundy, who became the Commandant of the Marine Corps after Al Gray, for whom my husband was Chief of Staff. Um, this was at a party at 8th and I Street at the Marine Corps. Uh, Commandant's house. It was a garden party for the Secretary of Defense. He's a good guy or a bad guy? Oh, bad guy. I mean, he knows what's going on and doing nothing about it. Ordering hits and... Um, and where was this taken again? It was in Washington, D.C. at the Marine Corps Commandant's garden party in August of 1996. It was a garden party for the Secretary of Defense and the Marine Corps Commandant Krulak. Who, who would have taken this picture? Uh, one of the military photographers, but they stole. I had um, at least six pictures of that garden party, uh -huh. and I would, because they were coming in my house and stealing pictures, um, this is the only one I have of, of that, but it's a picture of a picture, because they didn't want uh, me to, to have any proof that I had been there, but I was there. Um, this is a picture of my husband's, uh, supposedly his retirement from the Marine Corps, which he, you never retire, according to my husband, from the Marine Corps. You're always um, a mercenary, and uh, you work under the New Orleans 4th Marines, which are under a different kind of law than, than our country. Uh, Napoleonic law is the law of, of Louisiana. And... Um, my husband was always going down to Louisiana. They have a, a training school for assassins. They kind of hop around from Lake Pontchartrain to here and there. And, uh, this is General Al Gray, who was the commandant of the Marine Corps um, at that time when my husband retired. Uh, my husband was his chief of staff. This is my husband, George Raymond Griggs. Okay, hang on just a second. Let's get... Uh Get a good shot of Gray here. Okay, who's the guy next to Gray? Uh, this is my husband's son. Uh, he's not this quite one? right. Yeah, he's he's kind of a little bit of a. Um, he's not right. And the lady? That's um, the the commandant's wife. He married her very late in life because he needed a third star. Now, who's the commandant? Al Gray, and, and her name is Jan Gray. She, is she a good lady? She worked has for... Has potentials? She has potentials. She worked for him in his... In, see, even when he was general, there, he ran an intelligence uh, operation, which was a contract organization, trying to hook politicians 
and get them. Uh, what is the word? In other words, in out situation. Yes, yes. He has and still had and still has an organization which um, brings in whores, prostitutes, whatever you want to want to say, who will compromise politicians so they can be used. Jan worked for him in that organization, which was not part of the military. She was a hooker. Well, Paul, I don't know. She's, she chain smokes, she sleeps with the dogs and stuff. But when his mother was ill, when he was at FMF Lant, Fleet Marine Force Atlantic, yeah. um, Jan came to stay with his mother because she was on sedation and she may have talked too much mm -hmm. uh, to keep an eye on the mother. And then he, he married her because he, he would not have made, um, gotten his third star or whatever without having been married because he is a homosexual. He's a well-known um, group sex homosexual. Okay. Um, and that's my husband, that's me, and that's my son, Garland, who's now married. And I have two grandchildren. This is a copy of my husband's diploma from the NATO Defense College at Rome. Okay, he was in the 56th course there. Okay, again, this is the... NATO Defense College, which is part of the of, of NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Okay. Um, he also worked for NATO, and I was the head of the... Uh, uh, on the board of the NATO Wives Club. This is just, you know, the Norfolk branch of NATO. Some secret papers that he had in the house, of course, he shouldn't have had. Uh, these were operations that were going on, okay. amphibious operations. These are just some landings in Norway and uh, different brigades and names. Okay. This is an original um, of... Uh, a memorandum from when he was at NATO. And um, <laughs> this is a funny picture. I just uh, heard about Marshenko was going to be at a book signing, and I kind of was curious to know whether he had even known George and so forth, and he did. And he that's a picture of me with, with Richard Marshenko. And his father was, of course, one of these mercenaries who came to work for our country. And... Um, and if you read any of his books, you know that they do everything they want. Uh, there are, there's no right or wrong. And then these guys are churned out. And, um, now this I have um, in here because this is about the royal family of um, Saudi Arabia. And um, my husband was... This is how my husband's gotten his power. Um, because my husband went to a private boys' school on scholarship. He was hooked the same way Oswald was, um, homosexually. Mm -hmm. And the Saudi, the three oldest Saudi boys, were also hooked homosexually. The first one to come over after the uncle had been murdered, because the uncle was a really good guy, and he favored the British. So these uh, saboteurs, these communists, who oh, were in... Now, when you say uncle, you're not making reference like man from uncle, eh? No, the uncle of, of okay. the Saudi royals. I, I just wonder if there's any connection between that uh, television series. And but Mansour was killed. Ma it was Mansour who was, who was poisoned in Paris. Right. Okay. And my husband went to school with him. And now there's one of them involved with the Marine Corps. He's, he's kind of... All right, this is the recruiter for my husband. Um, I'm sorry it's not a better picture, but it was faxed to me, and they took um, the originals. This was a copy of an old one. His name was Charles Caddock, and he was a homosexual. Borland was a homosexual. Okay, I need um, you to hold it up about two inches. There, let's go. Charles Caddock died in the Saudi, um, one of the Saudi mansions in uh, outside of Marseille where you, they used to have the group sex orgies. It's a place called Es Le Rosé. Okay. And um, 
Okay. I think that's... Then, then we get into the diary. What's, what's this here? Oh, yeah, this is um, one of my husband's uh, friends who, whom I talked to about some things that were going on. He was on, on the ship with my husband okay, at Townley. Did you mention any of these during our interviews? No, no I, don't, I didn't mention okay. it at so he's not. Right. Let me see if there's anything here. Um, yeah. Uh, when I was going through, they've taken so many of the originals, um, I met with Ollie Whipple. Now, Ollie Whipple is another marine intelligence person who um, told me about Dale Dorman. Okay, do we have any pictures? No. All we need to reduce on this tape here is pictures. Okay. Or documents that are significant to anything we might have discussed. Inglehart, uh, my, my husband's getting mail. Major for an Engelhart. And uh, I know that there's a connection. He's just money's being laundered. Um, this is um, a uh, presidential citation copy of one for my husband. Okay. Oh, and this number is important because this is not his social security number. And you can find out a lot by that number. I think it's it's either 077. Uh, 170 or but that number you can find out a lot about my husband from that oh here it is 077670 oh president these are certificates of what when he rises in rank oh I see from one, one rank to the Major. other we, we went from Colonel all the way back. I see. He was, uh, let's see. So next up after Colonel is... Uh, general. General. He didn't make General because of his wife's mishap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. That you, kind you, of put him back a little bit. You missed him, huh? Uh, now... No, I mean his first wife. Oh. Her, her death, yeah. which was not... Here, um, he was with the U.S. Defense Liaison Group in Indonesia, okay. where they were training assassins on um, t Timor. They have a, a little factory for assassins and terrorists that was started by Mountbatten. Okay. Okay. This is NATO headquarters. Um, oh. These are, these are notes by his, his a Marine Corps friend of his from Princeton um, who uh, was in his class and who helped me a little bit to understand what was going on. But this is interesting in his handwriting because it says, Robertson says Kay has spoken of abuses, George spending up to the limit, 33000 on credit cards. He says an intervention often uh, might, you know, might be good. Uh, J.R., Jim Robertson, is disturbed by Kay's stories, and this is J.R.'s number. Well, who is Jim Robertson now at the head of the Justice Department Criminal Division? And this is in, you know, in his handwriting. They've taken the originals. Um, Mike Kimmel he was mentioned to me by uh, Jim Proctor, who has written this, Mike Kimmel is the son of the famous admiral who was the head of Pearl Harbor at the Pearl Harbor bombing. And my theory is that um, these guys take the sons of generals and then they, they suck them into to their, their little thing. Jack Herman, uh, in the dark. Jack Herman is, was my husband's uh, roommate from Brooklyn, whose father was Barbara Streisand's um, doctor and who is really literally kind of a basket case since he graduated from Princeton. Siegel is the president of the class. Right. John Wilhelm, I think he's related to Charlie Wilhelm, whom my husband's now working for. He's in intelligence. We have a picture of him in the uh, reading. Yeah, we do have a picture of John Wilhelm. Murdered or something happens to me. He's, and I'm really scared when I talk about 
Yes, all right. The, the more you talk about it, the more you talk about it, and the more people know, the more safe you are. This guy, his name is V.W. Wooten. He was a, um, and his son Wallace, he said it was his son. This is the license number, ZYF3977, Chrysler Baron Maroon. The time, uh, it was 5.30.96, 2 o'clock, from about 2 until 4.30 in the afternoon. They were parked there, and on his clipboard, he had personal data. He, he had a book entitled Religions of the World. He was obviously studying Islamic religions, because that was, you know, what the thing. Two army pea green coats, his curriculum vita, and he had 21 years of service with the Air Force. Among the top, I couldn't read the rest of that. Experience, 1992 to present. Chief of Security, K.I. Sawyer. Commander of 350 persons, provides protection, top secret security, education, master's degree, bachelor's degree, squadron officer, Air Force Staff College, fundamentals of total, probably total quality, I don't know, awards, air training command, member of the Marquette, he's a fraternal order of police member. But this is interesting, 1991 to 1992, Provost Marshal at Keflavik, Iceland, which is where all of this, the drug smuggling and stuff goes through that, that air, airport. Mm -hmm. Staff Supervisor, 500 people, brief U.S. Ambassador during the visit of the Pope John. He, he okay. was guarding... And this guy again is who? Was uh, guarding my neighborhood. V.W. Wooten? Wooten. All right, this is just a letter from Jim Proctor to Mike Kimmel, who was the son of the famous uh, Admiral, head of um, um, Admiral Kimmel, World War II's, um, you know, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And it says, it seems George has recently disappeared from home for short periods. Um, Kay's trying to talk to everyone she believes who knew George better than average, both in reference to where he might be and in perhaps a more important sense, what makes him tick. Apparently, he, his pattern predates their marriage by quite a lot. She's coming to Washington sometime the week of March the 4th through the 9th, but at a minimum, she would like a call from you. Her number in Virginia Beach is that. I saw your picture in the 35th reunion book. Sailing off Shady Side, blah blah blah, and both of these were Princeton roommates of my husband. Okay. This is um, from uh, the Princeton um, military ROTC book, which has the names of the men who were commissioned in the Marine Corps at the time my husband was. There's George Raymond Griggs, and there's Jim Proctor, who's handwriting in letter to the other guy. Okay. All right. And, and Tom Lewis, I think, is in there. <coughs> this, these are just more notes. Okay. Um, this is a medical complaint. Uh, when, after I was battered and beaten, I tried to get copies of my pictures. They, they wouldn't let me have them. From the medical? Yeah, they, they wouldn't. Um, these are just some little things about... It's not that important. I was just writing down things I remembered. <clears throat> um, I don't think this is really, this is just about some of his background. Um, yeah, no, this is not really, these are just some legal things. Oh, one, yeah. Um, I had so many break-ins in my house, and uh, this was one, and they always had a Marine, 20-year Marine as a police officer, who would interview me and say, oh, well, there's nothing, you know, nothing wrong. You just, you know, you're just imagining things. Well, this particular incident, um, they were SEALs. They were dressed in black. They were amphibious men. My neighborhood is surrounded by water. Mm -hmm. And not only did they break into my house, in my car, they, they were interrupted by a neighbor's dog, a Doberman kind of dog, who chased him, and they left my suitcase in Judge Reed's woods. I guess they were intending to, you know, to get it the next day or something. But the interesting thing is my neighbor, Mrs. Cummings, saw them, and she had been noticing the white van, which I had also been noticing in the neighborhood. 
And she reported it to the police, and they did nothing about it. And the very day that we had a robbery, she, they had tried to break into her house because it looks out over my house during the day, like the day before. And um, she talked to the same police officer, and he didn't even tell her there had been a break-in in my house. And they broke, not only did they break into my car, but they broke into my brother's cars. Oh, you know, there are all these houses around, but only, and they took my brother's, um, some of my brother's um, things. This is just about what she described to me two weeks before the cars were vandalized. Her, anyway, okay. Okay, that's, this is just describing that. Officer Satterwhite. I would send things to Jewel McGee. Um, these are just, I, I, I had a lot of things going on in my house where they were, they were doing things. Oh, yeah, this is um, from the alumni list of Princeton, and I don't have the... the in other words, the Saudi royals are in the alumni class list, but they're not in, in this particular one. But um, if you call the Hun School and you get a list of the alumni, then you um, will find the Saudis are there. Um, now this, the CFR list, this is why I have, have this. This is the CFR, Council of Foreign Relationship Members. And all of these I've... I've heard about or, or met some of them. My husband's mentioned. Um, there's some that are also skull and bones at the same time. It's the Yale leadership crowd. Howard Baker, George Ball. Uh, Steve Bell I know really well. He, he is a friend of my former uh, husband's family. Do we, Tom did we mention him in the interview at all? Steve Bell? No. John Blum we did mention. Um, my son is married to his daughter. John Blum, uh, he's a uh, Brooklyn, uh, Yale-y. He's, um, he's, he's, his best friend is this Rockefeller guy, um, not but, Jay. His son is married to your daughter. No, his daughter is his married son. to my son. His daughter is married to you. And they met. He, his father, they're, they're Jewish, you know, part Jewish. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting to me is that, um, see, I married the governor's grandson, and my son is John Garland Pollard the fourth. I mean, you know, you're talking old Virginia. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was like a brooding mare for, for them. I mean, you know, I was a bird of Virginia. It was kind of like, you know, you marry this, this John Garland Pollard. Well, my son went to Woodbury Forest, which is where George Bush's son went and Oliver North's son went. Okay. My son went there for four years, and he met Alice Blum, who, you know, they have a place in Maine, a place. And um, there's a lot I know about John Blum, but I didn't mention that. I mean, there's so much. Tom Brokaw's name is on Tom Brokaw, um, Califano, Jimmy Carter, Chafee, Bill Clinton, Cisneros, Cheney, so forth. Oh, Hodding. Hodding Carter is a real close personal friend of my husband's and a Princeton graduate. Okay, look this up too. Yeah. There we go. Oh. Hodding Carter. Okay, Hodding And so Carter. is William Crow. And who is he? He's a, a Princeton classmate of my husband's who uh, was um, what does in he do? the Carter administration, intelligence. Okay. All, all mostly intelligence. And they're not intelligent. Michael Dukakis, Andrew Biddle Duke, Larry Eagleburger, he and Henry Kissinger were good friends. Einhorn, oh, no, I didn't mention him, so I won't. Okay. Farstall, he's the son of James Farstall, who was murdered. Okay. Alan Frost, and okay. Firestone, Gelb, David Bergen. Anybody you might have mentioned in the tapes. Let's see, I'll go real quick. I may have mentioned David Hoops, but I don't think so. No. Okay. These are just CFR people. 
Yeah. Henry Kissinger. Miss Haynes, yeah. Oh, another good friend of my husband's is Cord Meyer and Bob McFarlane, really good friend of my husband. Pelletro, real good friend of George's. Uh, the Pincus family. Oh, Consuela Rice, she's a good friend of my husband's. Uh, the Rostos, all, all four of the Rostos. Yeah, these are bad guys, major, major bad guys. David Rockefeller is a friend of my, my son's, um, he, he came to my son's wedding. David Rockefeller? Mm -hmm. In Connecticut, he was in Connecticut. Mm. George Schultz, really good friend of, of George's and, and everybody. He's, he's a big power guy. He's, he knows a lot. He's the one who went to Clinton's and told Clinton not to run, that he, they were going to get him. Yeah. And had a meeting, and Clinton threw something at him and stuff. Paul Sarah McClendon. Sarah was full of that story for a number of days. Harry Train lives at the beach, and he's, um, I know him very well. He's part of the New World Order crowd, former. Strobe Talbot, another good friend of my husband's, really good friend. David Stockman, 